insofar as they are outside uh, as far as they are in uh, occupied Palestinian territories. But it, uh, members of the House will be absolutely clear that sooner or later, and I hope sooner rather than later, there will be a deal. And there will be an understanding that involves land swaps. And uh, as my right honourable friend uh, rightly says, uh, we will have to show some sense when it comes to doing that deal. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm going to give the Foreign Secretary another opportunity to answer the question that the honourable member behind me <laughs> The Israeli civil administration personnel and police arrived at Khan al Amar and they have served 39 stop work orders, including at school. Now, an entire community are about to be forcefully displaced. What representation has he made to his Israeli counterpart regarding this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I refer the honourable lady to the answer I gave a moment ago, but uh, my honourable friend, uh, the minister, will be going to uh, Israel very shortly, and uh, when uh, we've got to the bottom of exactly the complaint that she is making, I'm sure that he'll be raising it. Uh, alongside the concerns about the rearmament of Hamas and the rebuilding of its network of cross-border terror tunnels, does my right honourable friend also share the growing alarm at the new activities of Daesh in the Sinai Desert, together with the activities of Hamas which point to the prospect of further violence in the region and a new wave of terror attacks on innocent Israeli citizens? Uh, my uh, right honourable friend is completely right, and uh, I think uh, what he says underscores the need for a regional solution that brings together uh, all the uh, surrounding states uh, of Israel uh, to do a deal that brings the Palestinians finally uh, to the table and that brings concessions uh, from the Israelis. Winnick. The truth of the matter is that the Israeli authorities at no stage over the years have ever wanted a viable independent Palestinian state. And the inane comments of President Trump has strengthened the ultras in Israel. What encouragement can one give to the Palestinian people in view of what is happening and what uh, is continuing to occur with the destruction of their homes and the settlements being built by the Israelis? Uh, Every Israeli Prime Minister uh, in the last 20 years has supported a a, a two-state solution, and I think that is the right way forward. It is the, it is the, it is the policy of, of, the, of the UK government. And uh, I think uh, that it, is, it remains the policy of the US government. The difficulty will be to get a deal that allows the creation of the state, that, uh, of the Palestinian state, that I think everybody wants to achieve, but which protects the security of the state of Israel. That is the difficulty. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Speaker. Um, But, Foreign Secretary, last week President Trump said very clearly on televisions across the world that he could, and I quote, live with either one of a two-state or a one-state solution. So I'm sure that the Foreign Secretary would agree that it's deeply disappointing that the President could casually disregard so many years of international consensus on a possible peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinian people. Did Mr Netanyahu give any hint at his recent meeting with the Prime Minister that he too was prepared to live with a one-state solution? And if so, what was her response? Let's be absolutely clear. Uh, What what is needed now, and I think what uh, both the President and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, and indeed the Palestinians uh, have all said, is that there needs to be dialogue. And at the moment, I don't think the Palestinians are committing to dialogue in the way that they can, in the way that they should. And uh, it takes two to negotiate in this in this problem. And uh, I, I, am, I am frankly, uh, look at what's happened over the last eight years. We've seen no progress at all. Let's not rule out the possibility of progress today. Number nine, Mr. Speaker. Strongly committed to European security and will remain so after we leave the European Union. NATO remains the cornerstone of our defence and we will continue to play our full part in supporting European security, in particular in Eastern Europe. Uh, I welcome my uh, right honourable friend's uh, commitment to NATO, but does he not find it as depressing as I do that whilst other EU countries are completely obsessed with creating an EU defence identity, they are failing uh, miserably to meet their NATO requirement of spending a minimum of 2% uh, on defence. 
Uh, and uh, is not the, uh, the refusal by Germany, the richest country uh, in Europe, uh, to drag his, their feet and not honour that commitment until 2024 particularly perverse? Continued to make clear that nothing should cut across NATO's role as the cornerstone of European defence, and uh, other parties' contribution, fairly distributed to NATO, would make sure that NATO can remain the force that it needs to be. Emma Reynolds. Speaker, the Foreign Secretary mentioned earlier the sanctions against Russia with regard to their actions in Ukraine. Can the Minister confirm that even when we leave the European Union, it is open to us to democratically agree with the rest of the EU such sanctions in future because it's in our mutual interest? Yes. Well, this is not specifically um, a question about defence policy on the order paper, but I can nonetheless reassure the Honourable Lady that the answer is yes, and some kind of parallel structure for uh, implementing sanctions will be required, and I'm sure that it will be. Jasmine Qureshi. Number 11, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, Burma has made welcome progress towards democracy since embarking on reforms in 2011. It has lifted media censorship, released political prisoners and held legitimate elections in 2015. However, the military remains powerful and the constitution grants it 25% of seats in parliament. Clearly, we want to see a transition to full democracy. Yasmin Qureshi. Mr Speaker, the National League for Democracy, which is in fact in power at the moment, <coughs> continues continues to lock up its own activists who have spoken against the excesses of Burma's military and its treatment of ethnic minorities. Will the minister make it clear to the Burmese government that it cannot be recognised as genuinely democratic if it keeps putting behind bars its critics? Um, Mr Speaker, of course uh, human rights are vitally important and um, we always uh, ask any government to make sure that they are observed. Um, can I just make the point though more broadly, may I just make the point more broadly, which is uh, the real issue right now is stopping violations, securing humanitarian access and delivering accountability in parts of Burma where it does not have it and that is precisely the point that my right honourable friend the Foreign Secretary pressed the Burmese government on and the military when he visited Burma last month. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Burma's Rohingya Muslims were barred from voting in last year's elections and have since been excluded from dialogue between the military and other ethnic minority groups. Endemic violence against the Rohingya has recently been described by UN officials as ethnic cleansing, which may amount to crimes against humanity. Did the Foreign Secretary raise the plight of the Rohingya with Dorsu and the generals on his recent trip to Burma? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, he most certainly did. Order. Topical questions. Rob Maris. One. <laughs> Mr Speaker, by the next time I answer questions in the House, the Government will have invoked Article 50. Yeah. My priority, therefore, for the rest of the year will be to ensure the smoothest and cleanest possible departure from the EU, consistent with maintaining close cooperation with our European friends. I shall also strive uh, which the other side could never achieve, to work alongside the, US, the new US administration as we deal with common challenges posed by Russia and the crises in the Middle East. Yeah. July 2015, the highest court in Colombia decided that Her Majesty's Government had discriminated against its embassy employee, Mr Darwin Ayrton Marino Hurtato, on the basis of his ethnic identity and religious convictions. So the court ordered his immediate reinstatement. Yet Her Majesty's Government stubbornly continues to refuse to obey the court in Colombia. Does the UK Government not take seriously the judicial decisions of courts in Colombia? Or does the UK Government not take seriously its need to cease ethnic and religious discrimination against its employees in Colombia? As the Honourable Member well knows, and I have written to him in detail, it is impossible to reinstate him as the job no longer exists. Ben Howlett. I've got a great local charity called Global Arc, which helps women who are stuck overseas often facing domestic violence. What is my right honourable friend doing to help stuck parents unable to return to their home country with their children? Uh, my my honourable friend uh, will know that uh, we have a, uh, a programme to, uh, to support uh, the return of uh, of, of children whose, uh, whose parents have, have, uh, are stuck in the wrong country, uh, and uh, we do that through uh, our. Uh, what was it? What was the fun called? 
We, 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 do it, we, do it, we do it through our proper process and making use of all our consular services. Liz McKinnis. It is. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I'm sure the whole House will welcome the recent positive political developments in the Gambia. But... Gambian authorities are already investigating allegations that the former President Jammeh smuggled millions of dollars worth of assets out of the country before his departure last month. So what steps is this government taking to help track down any missing assets, including any which may have ended up in the UK, and to make sure that any proceeds of corruption are returned to the Gambia without delay? Uh, we are, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. We are doing uh, everything we can to support the Gambia's uh, judicial system, and uh, the, uh, the Honourable Lady uh, will know that uh, President, the new President Barrow has uh, indicated that he would like the UK to be Ga- the Gambia's principal partner of choice in tackling corruption in that country and putting the Gambia back on an even keel. And I can tell you, uh, Mr Speaker, that uh, when I recently went to the Gambia, there were crowds in the street uh, dancing. Not a, not a, not a uh, I think, because they were necessarily pleased to see me, though perhaps they, they were, but because they were, because they were delighted that the Gambia was being welcomed back into the Commonwealth. And uh, I can tell you that their joy was unconfined. Carl McCartney. Thank you, Speaker. Um, further two comments made last week by my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary. Would he care to um, suggest what the great British public should watch on television rather than the former Prime Minister and member for Sedgefield and his disgraced colleague and guacamole loving uh, former member of Parliament? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very grateful to my honourable friend. I, I really, I, I, I hesitate, I hesitate to advise the British public uh, what to watch on television. Uh, but I, I have to say that I think they will exercise, they will exercise their, their infinite sagacity and wisdom in not heeding. Uh, the siren voices of those who tried to overturn the democratic decision of the people of this country uh, last year to embark on a course that I think uh, will lead us not only to democratic emancipation but to a new course of global prosperity. Kureshi. Speaker, the NGO, an independent organisation, Physicians for Human Rights, published a report recently which found that the Indian authorities recently in the conflict that occurred in the Indian-occupied Kashmir, responded to protesters who were unarmed, killing 87 of them and injuring 9,000 of them. What representation has our government made to the Indian authorities regarding this excessive use? Um, (laughs) Mr Speaker, we, of course, uh, discuss a wide range of issues with the Indian authorities. But can I just say... um, uh, cutting to the point that she was uh, uh, raising, is that earlier uh, the, uh, in, in the year the state government of Jammu and Kashmir ordered the establishment of special investigating teams to look into deaths of civilians and involvement of police personnel during the five-month-long unrest in Indian administered Kashmir. And, of course, we will closely monitor these reports. Adam Afria. Mr Speaker, there are also crowds of people to welcome us when we arrived in Ghana um, a a week or two ago, although um, we couldn't quite work out whether it was for us or whether it was for the Minister for Trade. Nevertheless, it was thoroughly enjoyable. So it seems to me that the greater the number of trading connections we forge, particularly in West Africa, the stronger the foundation on which to build good international relations. Does he agree with me that withdrawal from the European Customs Union gives us a a once-in-a-generation opportunity to boost our diplomatic relations worldwide? I I thank my honourable friend for his uh, work as as trade envoy to Ghana and indeed I I thank all our trade envoys who do a fantastic job uh, around the world and it's thanks to the efforts of of my colleague and others that uh, we are seeing increased trade with countries such as uh, Ghana and I was very proud to see British firms in operation there. I think the largest uh, single private sector employer in Ghana is a firm run by a Brit and I think we should all be proud of the contribution that they are making. The former Prime Minister Blair has acknowledged the people voted to leave the EU but not at any price. 
Does the yeah. Foreign Secretary agree that when the price of Brexit becomes clear, people should be asked to confirm that it is a price yeah, yeah. they wish to pay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this has uh, very clearly mandated by six uh, to one to give the people the uh, decision. Uh, Mr. Speaker, whether or not to stay in uh, the European Union. All sorts of threats and all sorts of blandishments were made to the uh, people of this country uh, to stay in. Uh, those, threats, those threats and those warnings have proved to be fallacious. I think all future such threats will be taken uh, with a pinch of salt. Fraser. Much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, many sectors in my constituency rely on foreign workers, from highly skilled workers in pharma um, to seasonal agricultural workers in agriculture, uh, including 12% of workers at Addenbrooke's, my local hospital. I know the Secretary of State values the importance of foreign workers and EU nationals in this country and their contribution to the economy. <laughs> Does he also acknowledge that it's important to acknowledge um, and give them some certainty as their, to their future as soon as possible. I fully accept, Mr Speaker, that we need to give uh, all the 3.2 million uh, EU nationals in this country the maximum possible certainty, and we should do it as fast as we possibly can. Unfortunately, I don't think it is reasonable to do that in advance of giving certainty to uh, UK nationals uh, in other EU countries. Uh, we would like to do that. We would like to get on with that as fast as possible. It is up to our friends and colleagues abroad uh, to join us. Speaker, um, last week Donald Trump said on securing peace between Palestine and Israel, so I'm looking at two states and one state. I can live with either one. In light of hearing that direct quote, how can the Foreign Secretary say, as he did earlier to my friends from Gordon and from Lanarkshire and East Falkirk, that U US policy hasn't or isn't changing? I, I really must accuse the uh, honourable member of failing to listen to the answer I gave a few moments ago, uh, which, 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 which was that, uh, and I'm, I'm not here, I am not here to, uh, to defend or explain what the American president has said, but he made it very clear. He made it very clear that there should be dialogue. He also made it very clear that he thought that uh, the settlements uh, should no longer continue, that the illegal settlements should no longer continue, and, and the solution. The solution is a deal is to be done between the two parties. Uh, that is what uh, everybody in this House believes and wants. Mr. Speaker, today, uh, once again, the ghastly prospect of famine stalks the world in four countries with which Britain has very close and long standing uh, connections, historic connections Yemen, North East Nigeria, South Sudan, and Somalia. Will the Foreign Secretary ensure, perhaps through the coordinating mechanism of the National Security Council, that every sinew of government is bent to address and combat this unconscionable situation? Uh, I, yes, I can certainly give uh, my right honourable friend that assurance. And as I say, I think that the whole House could be very proud of the work that is being done uh, by uh, the Department for International development, the huge contribution that this country makes uh, through UK aid to all four of the, of the regions that he identifies, and in, uh, in the Yemen in particular, as he will know, uh, and I know that he's recently been uh, to the Yemen, it is a very difficult and intractable uh, problem, but it is the UK who is trying to knock heads together and get a deal. Despite its continued violations of international law, Israel enjoys favoured trade status with the UK and the EU. Does the Minister agree that if the UK Government is serious about peace and justice post-Brexit, we must revisit trade negotiations with Israel whilst it continues denying Palestinians their rights? Well, no, uh, I, I, I certainly... Uh, I, if the, if the Honourable Lady is, is suggesting that we should uh, boycott uh, Israeli goods, uh, then I must say I completely reject her advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rosendale. Uh, will the Foreign Secretary agree that global Britain strategy should include the whole of the global British family, which means the British overseas territories and the Crown dependencies? What guarantees will the Government give that they will be included in any new arrangements post-Brexit. Uh, I'm certain, Mr Speaker, that I can give my honourable friend the 
assurance he's seeking. I know that one prime focus of his thoughts is Gibraltar, and I can assure him that the sovereignty position remains totally unchanged, and Gibraltar is fully involved in the preparations with the process of leaving the European Union. You. Will the government support the UN Special Rapporteur's call for a full UN inquiry into abuses against the Rohingya Muslims by the Burmese army at the UN Human Rights Council this month? A specific question. Um, Mr Speaker, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights has issued a substantive report on the widespread human rights violations and of course the UN Special Rapporteur has also referred to violations in her recent press briefing. A full report is due in March. In light of these two reports, the UK will consider, with international partners, the scope for further enhancing scrutiny of the military's actions in Rakhine. I can confirm I will be attending the Human Rights Council. Sir Hugo Swire. Yeah. Yeah. It provides an opportunity to review the role of the FCO, which has been woefully under-resourced for far too long. Would my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, agree that there should be a moratorium on any asset disposals until such a review is complete, and that such a review should also examine how finally to bring other government departments with overseas representatives under the control of the respective heads of mission? I am delighted for the support from my right honourable friend uh, in, in campaigning for proper funding for our diplomatic missions overseas. Uh, it, we, it is true that we have an absolutely unparalleled uh, network around uh, the world, and it's also true that they will be needed uh, more than ever as we forge a new global future. And I think that is a point that will be heard loud and clear by the uh, current occupant of the Treasury, who was, after all, uh, the previous Foreign Secretary. Mr. Yeah. 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 Last month, um, the APPG for Yemen met with in-country NGOs who raised significant concerns over the safety of aid workers in Yemen, particularly those at checkpoints um, who were at risk of being caught in aerial bombardments. Could the, could the ministers tell me, please, what specifically is the government doing to end aerial bombardment in Yemen so that aid can get through? Yeah. 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 Um, Mr Speaker, she raises a very, very important point. I'll be visiting uh, Riyadh this week and having uh, discussions with President Hardy and indeed Adel al Jabria. And we are concerned that we need to move towards the, the, a political resolution here and we want the, the military uh, component that's been taking place uh, to end. Nadeem Zahawi. The Israeli Prime Minister has recently spoken about coming together with the Gulf Cooperation Councils on security issues. In previous peace processes, countries like Jordan and, of course, Egypt have played a significant role. Does the Foreign Secretary think that the GCC has a significant role to play in the Israeli-Palestinian peace process? Yes, I, 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 I'm grateful to my honourable friend, and he brings a wealth of knowledge to this subject. I do think that the, uh, the GCC and the Arab countries more generally uh, do hold the key, and a variant of the, what used to be called the Arab Peace Plan is indeed where we will end up. And uh, what it takes now is for both sides to see that and to make progress. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Doesn't the announcement by Toshiba last week um, regarding new gen, which will mean new investment, foreign investment is required into the Moorside nuclear development, doesn't that put a new question mark over the decision by the UK to pull out of Eurotom, creating more instability yes, for the... We remain a full member of Eurotom, of course, while we remain part of the European Union, and we intend to make sure that all of our research into nuclear fusion will continue after we leave. Chris Davis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We, we all look forward to the day that we will see a sovereign Palestinian state existing alongside a safe and secure Israel. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that we can only come to this through face-to-face -face negotiations between Palestines and the Israelis? Uh, I, I, I certainly uh, do agree with that, and I think those negotiations should take place as fast as possible and without preconditions. Well, with Iran testing missiles, Russia plotting coups, and North Korea murdering dissidents, does the minister agree that now is the time to renew Western resolve and leadership, which has sometimes been lacking these past eight years? I, 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 com I must say I, I do completely agree, and one of the interesting phenomena of the, uh, of, of the global uh, reaction to the new uh, US presidency is how much at variance it is uh, with some of the commentary I've heard from the other side of uh, the House this morning. And actually, uh, what, uh, what I'm finding when I go around the world is that many people in uh, foreign ministries and other governments are hopeful that they will see American leadership 
again where it has been lacking. And they are particularly encouraged by the role of the United Kingdom in helping uh, to transmit and to uh, improve American policy. Martin Vickers. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Last week I led a delegation to Kosovo. Uh, I can tell my right honourable friend that the President, Prime Minister and others who we met uh, greatly appreciated his recent visit. Um, Could I invite my uh, right honourable friend to uh, reaffirm our continued support for Kosovo and to take part in any future initiatives to help them? Obviously, yes, obviously, yes. Uh, yes uh, we certainly shall, and I'm, I'm, uh, I much enjoyed my time in, in Kosovo. And all those who, who have sprung to the defence of uh, the former Prime Minister this afternoon from the Labour benches uh, should know that at least in, in Kosovo uh, he is memorialised in the form of, I think, uh, no fewer than eight 16 year olds who are christened Tony Blair. <laughs> Tom Break! Um, President Putin may be President Trump's new best buddy, but he certainly isn't ours. Uh, Will the Foreign Secretary be giving his full support to the Magnitsky amendments, which we're going to be debating in a few minutes, which would allow the assets of any Russians involved in the murder of Magnitsky to be seized in the UK? Uh, we will, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We will be looking very carefully at, uh, at that um, debate as, as it unfolds and the arguments that are, that are made. We think we have a good provision in our statute uh, at the moment. We will take account of the debate as it evolves. Mims Davis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recently had a meeting in my constituency surgery with a delegation from Cameroon regarding the lack of uh, democracy in their country. They described uh, fear, brutality, and a lack of education for English speaking Cameroon. What does the Minister see in terms of the role for the FCO of the Complex Stability and Security Fund in supporting democracy in this area? Well, Mr Speaker, can I firstly pay tribute to the diasporas that uh, are, are based in the UK that provide us with an understanding of what is going on, and I pay tribute to the work that she does. And in Cameroon specifically, I absolutely agree with the concerns that she has actually raised, and she is right to point to the conflicts and stability front as to where we can actually provide funds to provide that security, and we'll be doing just that. Mr Andrew Slaughter. Um, a few moments ago, the Secretary of State confirmed uh, what uh, is government policy, what this House resolved uh, without division on the 9th of February, that there should be a halt to the planning and construction of residential settlements in the occupied Palestinian territories. Given that's the case, why is the UK permitted to trade specifically with those illegal settlements? Well, I think it's the policy of the UK and indeed I, I, I believe the policy of our, many of our friends and partners to continue to, uh, to trade uh, on the grounds that that is the best way uh, to support uh, the economy of the region, many of whose uh, workers, after all, come from populations within the occupied Palestinian territories and who are dependent for their livelihoods on that industry. And I think that's a policy that is, that is widely understood and supported, and uh, we will continue with it. I'm grateful to the Foreign Secretary and to colleagues. We must move on. A point of order, Mr James Dudridge. Thank you, Mr Speaker, for for, uh, uh, seeing me and granting a point of order. Uh, Notwithstanding, Mr Speaker, the underwhelming support for my vote of no confidence in you, um, has the Government or indeed the Backbench Business Committee uh, contacted you in any way to allocate time for this unresolved matter to be debated and indeed voted on? The short answer is no, and there is absolutely no reason why they should have done, a point which I can say from my own head and heart, fortified in the knowledge that it is also the sound advice of the experienced clerk of the House, who has been working in the service of the House for 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. A point of order, Tasmina Ahmed Sheikh. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Just while the Foreign Secretary um, is in the Chamber, I wonder, just a point of clarification, if I may. The Foreign Secretary made the point at the dispatch box um, during questions that the uh, Trump travel ban order would not affect uh, UK nationals, UK passport holders. Is the Foreign Secretary aware of the case of the teacher from Swansea who has been... I'm giving... Order. Order. The Foreign Secretary the is opportunity to clarify that he is aware of the matter and it is in hand. Grateful to the Honourable Lady. It is not specifically a matter for the Chair. If the order... If the Foreign Secretary wants to respond, he's free to do so. And if he doesn't on the floor of the House, he's not order. He's not under any obligation to do so. But I get the order, I get the indication there'll be contact. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, if it's the case that I think the Honourable Lady is referring to, I, I have written to her about it. 
A point of order, Mr. Andrew Bridgen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you quite rightly apologised to the Lord Speaker for unilaterally seeking to ban the President of the United States from Westminster Hall. It was quite right to do that. When can we expect an apology in this chamber? Grateful to the honourable gentleman for what he said. I treated of that matter very fully, both on the day in question when I responded to the right the honourable gentleman, the member for Cardiff South and Penarth, and the following day when there were points of order. I can't recall whether the honourable gentleman was in his place at that time, but I responded to points of order. The matter was addressed fully, and we shall leave it there. I'm extremely grateful to the honourable gentleman for his interest. We come now to the 10 minute rule motion, Mr. Chris Stevens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg to move that leave be given to regulate the provision of telecommunications advice lines by all government departments so that call charges to citizens are restricted and, in the case of the most vulnerable, eliminated. The bill I propose today will ask government departments to conduct an assessment for each local authority area of the provision of public computer equipment capable of use by, for example, DWP claimants, and to publish the results. Where that assessment demonstrates that the total number of units of public computer equipment is less than one in 20 claimants, all Secretaries of State must make provision for a dedicated telephone number which can be accessed at a cost of zero and in the case of a public telephone, without having to use coins or cards. Uh I also propose that telephone lines where departments are are unable to take a call within a reasonable period, for example five minutes, the caller should be given a regular updated estimate of the late late waiting time and that immediate callback facilities be offered. This, I believe, Mr Speaker, is an essential courtesy. As MPs, we often encounter examples of unfairness and injustice, where, through no fault of their own, People seem to be punished for finding themselves in need and where rules and regulations actively harm rather than help the average citizen who is simply seeking what they are entitled to. This is a key part of the role of an elected member, to help people navigate their way through the system, but since being elected I have been shocked at the inbuilt unfairness and costs of claiming. Take for example the Department of Working Pensions. Although the initial inquiry to the DWP is free, follow-up inquiries about a claim a query about benefit sanctions, or even reporting that a benefit has not been paid in time, all come with call charges. Constituents have told me that these calls can be very expensive, as much as £9 or £16 a time, and long waiting times to speak to an advisor bump up the costs even further. Other examples of services that charge for access are the Child Maintenance Helpline and the Home Office uh, for inquiries about spousal visas. £1.37 a minute over and above network charges. There can be no justification for the Home Office imposing charges on anyone for a genuine inquiry service. The need to deal with telephone inquiries must be treated as a valid overhead cost, which is covered by the fees levied for the application process itself. Telephone network charges themselves vary and again can be seen to discriminate against the very least well off. All providers include O3 numbers in their inclusive call packages, but these are often presented as if these are only available to those who are well off. This even applies to the pay-as-you-go arrangements that are more likely to be used by low-income households who may be unaware of the bundles that are available to enable calls to be made at no more than 7p per minute, rather than the range of 10p a minute to 55 pence a minute, as suggested on the Government website as updated on the 7th of February. I would like to thank Mr Speaker David Hickson of the Fair Telecoms campaign for the information he has provided me with in preparing this bill. David tells me that the Fair Telecoms campaign fully supports the use of 0800 numbers and, and the consequent bonanza for telephone companies in cases where it is essentially, uh, it's essential that nobody pays for a call. He is however concerned that the greater use of 0800 numbers would do nothing to help constituents who get ripped off when calling friends or their MP or even ordinary numbers. There is therefore a very strong case for all of us pushing the point that it is essential to ensure that everybody chooses the most appropriate telephone call plan for their needs. Those of us who are well off, smart consumers, would do this anyway, but there is is need for greater assistance and guidance to be given to all. Mr Speaker, last July the, the House of Commons Social Security Advisory Committee recommended that all telephone calls to DWP should be free via 0800 numbers. The response from the Government is that this would cost £7 million, which is not a lot in terms of the context of the overall budget. 
The rollout of universal credit threatens to extend call times and cost to claimants due to the very nature of the new benefit, which will require frequent contact from the claimant to the DWP to update them on circumstances. A ministerial written answer last year revealed that the average length of the call to the Universal Credit Helpline is 7 minutes 29 seconds, equivalent to £4.40 at one major phone operator's rates. Universal Credit as a replacement for Job Seekers Allowance Weekly Equivalent is £73.34, so already claimants have less to live on than they are allocated simply for calling a helpline. The push over the edge into poverty should not be administered by the DWP and yeah, other government yeah, yeah. departments through charging for inquiry lines. Absolutely. When the safety net becomes a trap, it is time to ask what sort of government boosts telephone company profits mm -hmm. on the backs of the poor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Far from working to create a society that is fair for all, the government has not responded positively so far to the campaign to remove telephone helpline charges that can cost up to 55 pence a minute. When I have queried the cost of calling, Inevitably, the ministerial response makes mention of the alternative of online access for inquiries and claims. That is fine if you are digitally literate, can afford broadband and live in an area with good connectivity. Not so great otherwise, and is a further inbuilt barrier to stop people accessing the support they are entitled to. Despite some funding being put into public access terminals and digital learning, if all the people who are seeking advice and claims were to switch from phoning, to public internet access terminals, then libraries and community centres would be unable to cope with the demand. When researching this issue, Mr Speaker, I was particularly struck by a DWP spokesperson's response to the telephone tax campaign last year, which was that online access was widely available through the network of job centres. I am just going to pause for a moment whilst we reflect Absolutely. on the proposed DWP estate <laughs> closure <laughs> programme. <laughs> I believe that it should not be too difficult for an audit to be conducted in conjunction with local authorities to identify the availability of free online access terminals available to your constituents or the lack thereof. In fact, I am inclined to conduct one in my constituency of Glasgow South West and compare it to the claimant count, which I strongly suspect would reveal a mismatch. A callback is the other stock ministerial response to inquiries about phone charges for inquirers, but that is rather difficult to do when on hold and if not offered routinely and requires the caller to self-identify as vulnerable. I would suggest that is inbuilt humiliation within the system, yeah, yeah. something which is familiar to those of us who have watched I, Daniel Blake. Yeah, yeah. I am aware that Ministers have promised a review of telephone charges, but would ask the Government to act on the recommendations of the 2016 Social Security Advisory Committee report to Lethany and DWP and HMRC. As part of the review and introduce a more effective callback system, for vulnerable customers and bring in an information system that advises customers of potential wait times. I also believe that this should be adopted across all government services as best practice. The need for reform is pressing with regard to benefit claims, but over-the-top charging for information through a lack of recognition of the limited access the least well-off have to a range of phone packages available and the lack of digital inclusion excludes and discriminates far too many of our citizens yeah, yeah. today. Yeah, yeah. As Mr David Macaulay from the Trustful Trust put it, when incomes are extremely tight, we could see people being forced to choose between phoning to make a claim and buying essential food supplies. Mr Speaker, I am aware that unless you have been in that position or have a caseload in a constituency like mine, it may be difficult for people to understand how disempowering or discriminatory the system can be and that every penny spent on a phone call ramps up the stress and anxiety for those people who simply want to access information, yeah, yeah, yeah. support and the benefits they are entitled to. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I commend this bill to the House. Yeah. Yeah. Order. The question is that the Honourable Member have leave to bring in the bill. As many as have that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Who will prepare and bring in the bill? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mary Black, Jonathan Edwards, Neil Gray. Dr Philippa Whitford, Drew Hendry, Ms Margaret Ritchie, Mr Alistair Conmichael, Ian Blackford, Mr Jim Cunningham, Graeme Morris, Mark Durkin and myself, sir. Chris Stevens.
Government Services Telecommunication Charges Bill. Second reading what day? Friday 24th of March, sir. Friday the 24th of March. Thank you. Order. The clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Criminal Finances Bill as amended in the Public Bill Committee to be considered. Now. Thank you. We begin with Government New Clause 7, with which it will be convenient to consider the new clause and amendments grouped together on the selection paper. To move New Clause 7, I call the Minister, Ben Wallace. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Some time has passed since we last considered this bill. There was, as honourable members recall, a great deal of cross-party consensus on the provisions at both second reading and in committee stage, and I hope that we will be able to continue that in the same spirit of constructive debate and healthy scrutiny during today's proceedings. The first group of amendments that we are considering concern the extremely grave matter of gross human rights abuses or violations. The Government is committed to promoting and strengthening universal rights globally, and I welcome the opportunity to debate this issue. In particular, these amendments have been prompted by the harrowing case of Sergei Magninsky. Magninsky was not a serious criminal. He was a lawyer who tried to blow the whistle on large-scale tax fraud in Russia, and he believed that he would be protected by the law. And Unfortunately, he died in state custody in 2009 after suffering both mistreatment and assault and being denied medical attention. I share the strong feelings of many honourable members about this case, and I want to reassure the House that the Government has expressed both publicly to the Russian Government our serious concerns about Mr Magninsky's death. But of course we must also remember that his case is only one of many atrocious human rights violations committed globally each year. As I am sure honourable members will highlight, the US has legislated to prohibit the entry of certain named individuals to the US and forbid their use of the US banking system. This legislation was extended by the President Obama's administration less than two months ago so that it could be applied to those involved in human rights violations wherever in the world they have taken place. This sends an important signal that perpetrators of gross human rights violations will face consequences. However, we have an entirely different legal system which merits a different approach. I therefore want to pay tribute to those honourable members that have raised the issue by tabling new Clause 1. In particular, my honourable friend, the member for Isha and Walton, the right honourable lady, the member for Barking, the honourable member for Carl Shulton and Wallington, and the honourable member of Ross Sky and Lockover as well. And I'm grateful to honourable members for giving me advance notice of your amendment, and I'm pleased to have had the opportunity to discuss it with many of the signatories. Mr Speaker, it has always been the Government's position that for further legislation to be warranted on this issue, there would need to be a real case that existing powers were insufficient. I hope honourable members will agree that we should avoid doing anything that might impact on the effectiveness of our existing sanctions and civil recovery powers. The National Crime Agency have confirmed that they have considered all the material provided to them in relation to the McNinsky case. They have concluded that the individuals we believe to be connected to the case do not reside in the UK and have identified no assets of value connected to this case in the United Kingdom. On that basis, the additional powers proposed by New Clause 1 would have no obvious material effect if attempts were made to use them against individuals in this case. I thank the Minister for giving way. The, the point about the Magnitsky Act in the US is that it pulls together the visa bans with the no use of American banks, uh, with, with, with the inability to trade. And the problem, and I do appreciate we have a different scenario in this country, but the advantage is it's all pulled together. And so could the Minister please explain how he intends to pull the links together in this country using the different pieces of legislation that exist? Minister. Well, I'm grateful, my honourable friend. I, I will just uh, get into that uh, further into the speech. But I think, I think the thing we have to recognise that's different in the United States from here is that here most of our sanctions regimes are under the European Union umbrella. And, of course, there is a time to discuss those sanctions at a later date and what the United Kingdom's arrangements would be post-Brexit. So, of course, we have slightly different dispersals of authority and power when it comes to sanctions than the United States, who can act often entirely unilaterally and often do uh, in that area. So I think that's uh, one point uh, that I think uh, we should point out. 
Unlike existing sanctions, it contains no derogations. Uh, this is the problem with the current clause as drafted. One of the problems is we think it would be non-compliant with our domestic human rights law because it contains no derogations. It would freeze all the assets of a designated individual so they would not have any funds for living expenses, medical treatment or to pay for legal representation. And the reversal of the burden of a proof to assume that all as assets owned by designated individuals are the proceeds of their unlawful conduct would also be an unprecedented step. This is in Congress to the existing civil recovery regime and could be judged by the courts to be disproportionate. However, we recognise the strength of feeling on this matter and understand the deterrent effect that such an amendment would have on those who may be seeking to profit from gross abuse of violation of human rights overseas. And that is why the Government... Way. He, he is clearly very well informed about this issue because I know he has had uh, meetings on the subject. Can he give us confirmation that if, in fact, assets were identified in the UK, and I know there's a dispute with Bill Browder, he believes they are uh, located in the UK, but uh, assuming in the future they, they, they uh, were identified in the UK, is the Minister confident that either the existing legislation or indeed his new Clause 7 would enable those assets to be frozen? Minister. I'm grateful for the Honourable Member's point. What I can say, and I have to respect the boundaries of our law enforcement agencies, I as a minister cannot direct them uh, to take action. That is an operational freedom and independence that we value so much in this country. But what I can say is they have said to me that should new evidence be presented or actionable evidence, then of course they are free to follow that and to enforce the law. And I would say as the government minister on this that where we see evidence of gross human rights abuse or other criminal offences committed and there is evidence prevented that can be actionable, of course we would like to see action taken. This is not about trying to shelter people who have been involved in this. This is about trying to make sure that the appropriate action is taken when the correct evidence is presented. And I absolutely concur with his point that it is important to understand that we need to, to act on the evidence. And if there is evidence, even without this legislation, uh, we could take action. And I would certainly urge our law enforcement agencies to take action uh, to make sure uh, that these people are held to account for the uh, atrocious murder that they carried out uh, in Russia against uh, Mr Metninsky. And that's why we have tried to come some way to meet many of the concerns of honourable members in this House by tabling new Clause 7 and the consequential amendments 58 and 59. This would widen the definition of unlawful conduct within Part 5 of the Pro Proceeds of Crime Act to include the torture or cruel or inhumane or degrading treatment of those exposing corruption or obtaining, exercising, defending and promoting human rights, including in cases where that conduct was not an offence in the jurisdiction in which it took place. This would allow for any assets held in the UK which were deemed to be the proceeds of such activity to be recovered under the provisions of Part 5. Of course, any... Yes. In the government's right. version, there's no requirement, there's no duty on the government to act at all. Uh, they can simply ignore the provisions. That's one of the key differences between his version and the Honourable Member for Isha's. The Honourable Member, me, member makes a point about duty. There are lots of criminal offences on a statute book that the government doesn't have a duty uh, to act on. We leave it to the interpretation and the freedom of our law enforcement agencies to act on them. Are, are we to say that the duty here is greater than the duty uh, on perhaps the police to act on burglary or the duty of the police to act on a whole range of other criminal offences? I think that's the fundamental issue here, is he wants to put a duty on a government on one specific type of criminal offence, uh, which would, I'm afraid, hinder the freedom of our law enforcement agencies to take the appropriate action uh, when the evidence is presented them to them in order to do that. But there's also no, in, in his version, in his clause, as opposed to the Honourable Member for Issues, there's, there's no ability for third parties to be able to bring a case to the courts um, to allow such seizure. So yet again, it's closing off the options of tackling this problem of money laundering in London and in the UK. I'm afraid it's not. The, the, the National Crime Agency, the Serious Fraud Office, HMRC, are not full of people who don't want to do their job. 
They want to enforce the law. They want to go out and catch the criminals. They want to stop money laundering. I think it's slightly insulting to sort of infer that if we didn't put a duty on them, they wouldn't do it. I think they would do it. And I think the problem with the clause as drafted, it allows for NGOs, it doesn't define whether they're foreign or UK NGOs, individuals, it doesn't define whether they're foreign or UK individuals, to go to the court with limited liability to force the government to take action without a very high level of threshold at all. So, for example, you could find a, I know, a Cuban exile living in Florida who doesn't like uh, the rapprochement with the Cuban government coming to our courts to make an application against the Cuban ambassador's assets in his countries to allege human rights abuse uh, and, and actually confiscate or freeze that asset. It would actually preclude us making peace or moving on with some countries, but it also would allow massive amounts of vexatious claims based on sort of uh, gimmick politics. And I think that's why we have to respect the professionalism and the independence of our law enforcement agencies to make the case based on the evidence presented to them. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to him for his generosity, but that's simply not the case. I mean, we regularly already have applications, vexatious applications, for extradition, for instance, from the Russians, and um, for lots of people who are uh, Russians who are now resident in the United Kingdom. But the court decides. It's not that an individual can decide that, this, uh, that um, somebody's assets must be frozen. It's a court that decides under, under the <coughs> Honourable Member for Isha's clause. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, um, the Honourable Member misses the point. Courts do not like vexatious complaints. They do not like uh, time-wasting applications with, in this case, limited liability for those people that want to come and use the court's time to make a statement. But also, uh, applications for uh, um, uh, 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 expo uh, uh, not exportation, you know, for deportation, is often made by the state. I mean, you know, it, he would say he would open it up to individuals all over the world to come to our courts without liabilities to make the case or to certainly make a gesture in order to freeze assets of, of individuals uh, without any sort of recourse uh, to the state or to evidence necessarily. And I think that would open up a whole can of worms for countries around the world. So there's another example. We've, we have sponsored and supported the, police deal in, the peace deal in Colombia. So should the Colombian government choose at some stage to send somebody uh, from the FARC background to come and maybe represent them or, or be a culture attaché or something in their embassy, and somebody in Colombia doesn't like that, they could come to this court under this as an individual and make a tokenistic application. <laughs> the judiciary might throw it out, but there's cap liability, so the court's time can be wasted writ large by lots of people making statements uh, and causing the courts to be blocked up. <coughs> In this regard, on the specific debate that we're having, mini debate that we're having here, did, had the government considered that any application should firstly go to perhaps the Attorney General before being allowed to go forward, in, in other words, to stop the abuse that, you, uh, that the Honourable Member was suggesting? We, we did consider that, and in consultation with the Attorney General and the Solicitor General's Office, it was felt that that was not the uh, appropriate need, there wasn't the need in it uh, to do that. So we progressed uh, with, as we have drafted the new clause. And I think, you know, let's remember, we're putting on the statute book a new power to take action based on gross human rights abuse, torture, degrading treatment. We haven't done that before. I mean, that's, that's a major step and a major signal to, to countries around the world that you know, that if there is evidence presented, we could interdict with their assets and make sure we send that very powerful message that London, the United Kingdom, is not a base for them to put their assets or ill-gotten gains from such behaviour. I'm very sure that is a substantive point. Uh, the, the, the concern and the worry would be uh, that we would get not just vexatious compl complaints, but complaints designed just for publicity in the almost certain knowledge that the complaint would not be seen through by the court and that there would be virtually no cost to the people making the complaint. This gives the opportunity of actually nabbing uh, the guilty and saying to people that bloodstained dictators have no place in putting their money in this country. My right honourable friend is absolutely right. This does send a message, but it also respects the independence of our law enforcement agencies to apply the law, to take action where they are presented with evidence, to make sure that courts' times aren't wasted, that we actually get successful results in dealing with these individuals, but also it is done in a way that the state 
retains the initiative, the executive retains the initiative to, to, to carry out those processes and make sure that vexatious complaints, and the judges will tell you they don't want their courtrooms to become public relations arenas where people can uh, carry out uh, and make these uh, applications. They want their courts to be able to decide on the basis of evidence. And in, in our amendment, they will be able to do that, but we respect the operational independence of our law enforcement agencies. Um, and that's why we tabled this amendment. This would allow for any of assets that I've said in the, held in the UK where deemed to be the proceeds of such activity to be recovered under the provision in Part 5. Of course, any civil recovery would be subject to all the existing processes and legal safeguards in the Proceeds of Crime Act. The court would need to be satisfied on the balance of probabilities that the property in question was the proceeds of crime or is likely to be used to fund further criminal activity. And law enforcement agencies would, as ever, need to consider which of their powers to utilise on a case-by-case -case basis. But I hope honourable members will agree that this measure would send a clear statement that the UK will not stand by and allow those who have committed gross abuse or violations around the world to launder their money here. And I think, you know, I want to say to honourable members and right honourable friends that as the Minister in, with this bill, when my colleagues table amendments from whatever side of the House, I have said to my officials from the beginning, do they have a point? I said to my officials, I want to ask about the evidence uh, uh, set against uh, Mr. Metninsky's killers and find out if we have actually done the work we say we're doing. I, I make sure I don't just take things at face value, and I think what's really important in this is I am uh, confident that we haven't taken action in this case because we have not had the evidence or yet had the evidence to take action or the assets located in, in the right place to be able to do something about that. And, and I have verified that. I've made sure that I have checked that out. So what I have done, though, is come today to the House with an attempt to put a compromise in the statute uh, uh, that puts, for the first time on record, gross human rights abuse, and hopefully we can send the right message to those regimes around the world and those criminals and individuals, but at the same time respect uh, the law enforcement agencies uh, to make sure that you know, they can carry out their job unhindered by political interference, third party groups or anyone else who may want to uh, uh, use publicity for, rather than uh, actual evidence as, as, as furthering their cause. And I think that is something that's really important. So, Mr Speaker, I'll pause here uh, and wait for other government members and right honourable members uh, in the debate, and I will hopefully respond at the end. Government New Clause 7, unlawful conduct, gross human rights abuses or violations. Thank you. The question is that Government New Clause 7 be read a second time. Mr Richard Arkless. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, by way of introduction, I don't think it's fair to live in a world where criminals are free to generate cash and spend it without fear of repercussion. I think, given what I've learned across the passage of this bill, that all members on all sides of the House would agree with that sentiment. There simply must be a level playing field for the vast majority in society who choose to play by the rules. And until now, the focus of financial crime has been in anti-money laundering regulations and proceeds of crime legislation, which has been specifically geared towards tackling the proceeds of drug traffickers and bank robbers. In many senses, it's worked. It's not as easy in 2017 to launder money as it used to be, although it's not, sadly, impossible. And it used to be the perception of crimi criminals that if they could evade capture and not flash the cash, then they could eventually spend their ill-gotten gains. And in many cases, criminals would look forward to spending the gains when they were released. Thankfully, the world has moved on, and this bill is an attempt to move another step ahead of the criminals so that we, as a society, are fit to face and attack the finances of the criminals in 2017 and beyond. And I don't think fairness, well, I don't think you could agree or buy into the rule of law unless you could agree and buy in to this evolution of regulations surrounding the financial industry that's happened over the years. Today, it's the threat of grand corruption that we face, particularly in relation to politically exposed people, facilitated by the most part, perhaps unwittingly, by the City of London. Earlier this year, or last year, The Guardian revealed through the Panama Papers how a powerful member of Gaddafi's inner circle had built a multi-million pound portfolio of boutique hotels in Scotland and luxury homes in Mayfair, Marleybone and Hampstead in London. He was head of Libya's infrastructure fund for a decade and has been accused by government prosecutors in Tripoli 
of plundering money intended for schools, hospitals and infrastructure projects. Um, Scottish police have confirmed that they are investigating. Libya has made a request for an asset seizure, but it's not, as far as I understand, been implemented. Mr Speaker, with the powers in this bill, we could have dealt with injustices like that so much swifter. So we welcome, in general terms, the provisions within the bill. That said, our issue has been, as I intimated earlier in this process, it's not, our issue is not with what's in the bill, it's what is not in the bill. But that list, list has narrowed as this process has continued. It doesn't satisfactorily, in my view, address corporate economic crime, which we will discuss in the third grouping. It doesn't satisfactorily deal with the issue of Scottish limited partnerships, which my honourable friend from Kirkcaldy and Cowdenbeath has done so much to campaign on. And it doesn't deal with what, in my view, is the real facilitator of criminal finances, which is the profit-seeking, responsibility-sharing, self-serving banking culture that we have in the UK and the wider Western world. And until we challenge the attitude of the banks who house these money, monies, we will never absolutely deal with the criminality. Now, this bill attempts to deal with the symptoms of the criminality, getting at the assets and seizing them, but it does not deal with the facilitators, the banks. And I think that's a great shame, as I will discuss later. The two new clauses um, for discussion in the first group, new clause 7 and new clause 1, have been touched upon um, by the Minister and in interventions, and much of the talk has been about the scope of applicants able to bring um, an application under these provisions. In general terms, both New Clause 1 and New Clause 7 seek to extend the scope of unlawful conduct. Um, makes sense in that a public official or someone acting with the consent or acquiescence of a public official depositing funds in the UK should not be safe on account of that criminality having occurred abroad. And I think most people would agree with that sentiment. It's a sensible and logical step and one which we support in, in principle. We believe in the protection of human rights. We believe it is a profoundly good thing. And we don't believe that violations of human rights should be able to be hid behind international borders. It should be there for the world to see. And I, be, I believe that the consequences should be global consequences. Now, at least with the adoption of either New Clause 1 or New Clause 7, um, the UK will not be a hiding place in this respect, and I think that's worth lauding. New Clause 7 and New Clause 1. So what is the difference? Um, as the Honourable Member has indicated, there is wider scope for more applicants to make applications under New Clause 1. The government say that that would not be necessary as the judiciary would vet these claims. They would decide these claims and it wouldn't be up to the applicant to decide the merits of the claims. It would be for the court to decide the merit of the claims. Um, one other difference between New Clause 7 and New Clause 1, which I would like the Minister to remark upon, is that it seems to me that the amber of New Clause 7 is, sorry, the amber of New Clause 1 in terms of potential respondents is wider in that it includes more connected persons to criminality, whereas New Clause 1 doesn't go to that extent. I would be grateful if the Minister could touch upon the scope of respondents as well as the scope of applicants and the difference between 1 and 7. There's also provision in New Clause 7 which is mirrored in, I think, sections 58 and 59 to increase the limitation period for bringing claims or applications under these provisions on lawful conduct to 20 years. In one sense, we welcome it, um, because without it, presumably the standard limitation periods of five and six years would apply. However, given that we're talking about gross violations of human rights, torture and the like, should a perpetrator ever be free from these crimes? Are we saying that 20 years after you commit gross violations of human rights, then your money is safe? And that given that some of these abuses take years and years and years to come to light, are there unintended consequences that could let some of the criminals off the hook? Other very simple questions I would have for the Minister is that within New Clause 7, is a mere suspicion of the act of gross violation enough? It seems to me that a, a, a conviction in either jurisdiction would not be necessary, but would suspicion be enough and how does he see that playing out. 
Could the Minister explain, if he's not minded to accept this amendment, that being new clause 1, specifically why is, is new clause 7 better, both in terms of the applicant and the potential respondents? And I'm grateful if you could pick up on the point of limitation, but I've got lots more points to make in the two further groups that will come on. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Just, uh, no, Rob. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise to speak to new clause 1, known as the Magnitsky Amendment, and also touch on the Government's new clause 7 in the process. Uh, new clause 1, Mr Speaker, has been tabled uh, by myself, but also with the right honourable member for Barking, um, and in total, 50 honourable members representing eight different political parties right across the House, which I think is testament to the cross-party nature of our ambition here today. Mr Speaker, that ambition was kindled by the tragic murder on the instructions of the Russian state of the young Russian lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky. And in November 2008, Magnitsky was arrested and detained. His crime had been to identify the perpetrators of the biggest tax fraud in Russian history committed by the Russian government against the investment firm that employed uh, Sergei Magnitsky Hermitage Capital, but also against the Russian taxpayer to the tune of a mind-boggling 230 million US dollars. For his courage, Sergei Magnitsky was jailed and tortured for almost a year and then ultimately murdered. The crime was perpetrated by some of the very officials that Magnitsky had himself identified. And whilst these appalling crimes were documented by two domestic Russian investigations, no one has ever been brought to justice in Russia. Perversely, of course, it was Magnitsky who himself was convicted posthumously of fraud. Frankly, a rather sickening snapshot of the corrupt and venal state of the Russian justice system today. Large amounts of the stolen money was subsequently laundered out of Russia and Hermitage Capital submitted detailed evidence to all the relevant UK authorities of 30 million US dollars that was sent to the UK between around 2008 and 2012, including by firms run or owned by the Russian Mafia. Despite receiving this evidence, neither the Metropolitan Police, the Serious Organised Crime Agency, the Serious Fraud Office, Fraud Office, HMRC, nor the National Crime Agency have opened a single investigation. And notwithstanding the comments that the Minister made, uh, the, the, this case, I believe, does shine a light on the weaknesses of our own justice system, which is really what we're here to address today. And we should be clear in this House that Magnitsky has been uh, the standard bearing case for reform, but it is by no means an isolated case. According to the Home Affairs Committee's 2016 report on the proceeds of crime, the UK sees £100 billion laundered through UK banks alone each year. £100 billion, that is a, a, an astonishing sum. And we know from the NCA that it's only around 0.2% of that figure that is currently frozen. Now, Mr Speaker, no one wants Britain to be uh, a competitive global hub that attracts investment that is open to international talent more than I do. Um, but I also want us to be known the world over for our integrity too. I want us to be known the world over for our commitment to the rule of law. I want us to be known for our adherence to the most basic of moral principles. And that means we have to stop turning a blind eye to the blood money of butchers and despots, which frankly flows all too freely through some UK businesses, banks and property. New Clause 1 is designed to address the weaknesses in the current UK asset freezing regime and I ought to pay tribute to Jonathan Fisher QC, who is the expert in this field, who very carefully helped us craft the mechanism. He's one of the leading experts in both public law and, of course, human rights law as well. Now, the clause, uh, new clause one, would enable the Secretary of State, an individual or an NGO, to convince the High Court to make an order to empower the UK authorities to freeze assets, where it can be demonstrated on the balance of probabilities to a senior judge that those assets relate to an individual involved in or profiting from gross human rights abuses. The clause puts a duty on the Secretary of State to pursue such an order where there is sufficient evidence, but also where it is in the public interest to do so. So there is a measure of flexibility. 
and it would also establish a public register of those subject to such an order, all against the backdrop of appropriate safeguards and due process in law. Now, Mr Speaker, the Government has responded with its own proposal, New Clause 7, and I think in fairness it is only right and proper to start by paying tribute to the Security Minister and indeed the Foreign Secretary for engaging so seriously on this issue, and ultimately, in the end, for being willing to act. New Clause 7 would indeed mark a significant <laughs> step forward, principally because it would provide specific statutory grounds for an asset freeing order based on gross human rights abuses and targeting individuals responsible for or profiting from such crimes against whistleblowers and defenders of human rights abroad. Now, my view is that New Clause 7 is not as robust as New Clause 1, mainly because it doesn't impose uh, a duty on UK law enforcement agencies to act, subject to the flexibility I've described, uh, because it omits the third party application procedure and removes the public register. Now, in each of those three cases, I, I, I do understand and recognise the reasons that uh, um, my honourable friend, the, the Minister, has put forward as to why um, that is uh, the position of the Government. Um, I think it's probably to be expected. Um, and I don't want to let the best be the enemy of the good. But I have to say, I retain um, at least a measure of underlying concern, and I think that uh, touches on something which is so often the case with criminal justice legislation, and that is the extent to which the new power will actually be enforced in practice. And it was something the Honourable Member for Rhonda, I think, was touching on, and, and, and it's probably something which we share across all sides of the House. So, Mr Speaker, if I may be so bold, I would uh, like to elicit uh, some further reassurances from the Minister, um, which he may feel free to indicate in the course of my speech or in the wind-ups, uh, which can give us a measure of uh, reassurance on that issue of enforcement. First, can he commit the Government to collecting particular data on the exercise of the new clause, say, annually, so that the House and, indeed, the public can properly scrutinise the extent to which it is being exercised in practice? And I did recognise and understand the point the Minister made uh, in relation to that, that the success of the clause should not just be judged by how many times it's exercised, but also the deterrent effect it would have. But I still think that would be a valuable source of reassurance. I give away. Minister. Uh, I'm delighted to tell my honourable friend that I will commit to both collecting those stats and making sure they're published annually alongside other stats in the areas of proceeds of crime. Well, can I thank the Minister for such an immediate, swift and decisive um, acceptance and provision of that assurance, um, and I think it would be extremely useful. The, the, the only other aspect on which I think it would be useful to have some reassurance is that I understand there is a wider ongoing review of UK-wide asset freezing powers. Now, I can well appreciate why the Government may be reticent about reinventing a bespoke procedural mechanism for one new power given its relationship with those other wider proposals that may be forthcoming in the future. Um, but I hope he will undertake to factor in the proposals that have been made in New Clause 1 to the review process and make sure that in the new proposals on enforcement, whenever they may be forthcoming in the future, we have the most robust, the most rigorous mechanism available under UK law applying to the Government's New Clause 7. And I think if uh, my hon. Friend the Minister is able to give that assurance on top of the um, one he's uh, just given, I have to say for my part I'm inclined to accept New Clause 7 and not to move New Clause 1, heartened by the Government's commitment to strive to make the new power work as effectively as possible in practice. For those of us, Mr Speaker, who have campaigned for change, there remains the further issue of visa bans. That, Mr Speaker, is for another day. Today, the House has the opportunity to lay down some moral red lines in UK foreign policy, to take a lead in denying safe haven to the dirty money of those profiting from the most appalling of international crimes. We have the opportunity to send... I give way. Honourable friend for giving way. Um, he, he says that visa bans are for another day, but of course visa bans already exist as a possibility. Is it not the case that what would be helpful is to know how the existing visa ban uh, uh, system will be complementing this new proposal? He, he's absolutely right, and 
Um, I, I think we'll need a separate legislative vehicle to address the wider question of visa bans, but he makes his point, and he's been tenacious in campaigning for this, in a, in a powerful way, and I do think we'll want to move on to this at the appropriate time. Today really is about the asset freezing side of things, and we have, Mr Speaker, in the last analysis, the opportunity to send a message of solidarity to those fighting for the liberty that we in this country hold so dear. We have the opportunity to nurture the flame of freedom on behalf of those brave souls like Sergei Magnitsky who suffered the very worst crimes standing up for the very highest of principles. Dr Rupa Huck. Mr Speaker, I rise to speak specifically on this grouping. It was going to be new clause 7 and new clause 1, but it looks like new clause 1 is being withdrawn in favour of the government, new clause 7. And the Minister started off by saying that this uh, bill has enjoyed a degree of cross-party consensus up to now in its parliamentary passage. So um, I'd like to say that Her Majesty's loyal op opposition will not stand in the way of new clause 7, or would not have done so to new clause 1 either. Um, so, I mean, I want to welcome the amendment targeting asset seizure for those guilty of human rights abuses outside Britain who seek to use the UK to conceal their wealth. It's become uh, colloquially known as the Magnitsky Amendment, and we've heard some of the tragic details of that case just now. So this bolsters the bill's aim to tackle the growing concern around money laundering, terrorist financing and corruption. And there are figures out there. The estimated annual loss through money laundered globally is between 2 to 5 per cent of global GDP. That's a staggering 800 billion to 2 trillion. Again, we don't know the true figures because this is all hidden crime. It's white collar crime. But these are IMF and World Bank figures. And on our own doorstep, it's estimated that serious and organised crime costs the UK economy 24 billion at least annually a year. And the amount of money laundered uh, every year here is between 36 billion and 90 billion. That's a loss to our exchequer. So it is only right that we tighten up all these things um, in this bill, and this amendment tightens them up even further. Uh, quite simply, those who have blood on their hands for the worst human rights abuses should not be able to funnel their dirty money through our country. And in a recent article in the New York Times, the journalist Ben Judah attests and I quote verbatim, just because there aren't bodies piled up on the streets of London doesn't mean that London isn't abetting those who pile them up elsewhere. The British establishment has long feigned ignorance of the business, but the London laundromat is destroying this country's reputation. I mean, he uses quite colourful language, but under this amendment, the names of individuals who have been involved in or profited from human rights abuses would be published, and then ministers would be obliged to apply for a freezing order of up to two years if they're presented with compelling evidence of abuse, and it is in the public interest to do so. So then this will then make those dictators and despots think twice about using the UK as a safe place to stash their dirty cash. And by creating personal costs for the perpetrators of these human rights abuses, we can protect whistleblowers around the world which would be a fitting tribute to the legacy of Sergei Magnitsky. Magnitsky. Jonathan Ginogli. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I'm pleased to be given the opportunity to speak to the significant legislation, which I think will certainly help the overall objective of stopping the UK being used as a safe harbour for illegal proceeds, as it currently is being used all too frequently. Like Sergei Magnitsky, <coughs> I practised as a corporate lawyer, and I've asked myself, in his situation in Russia, uncovering the largest tax fraud, would I have risked reporting it to the authorities? Would I then have refused to withdraw my statement whilst being imprisoned, beaten and denied medical help? Indeed, whilst being abused by the very same perpetrators of the crime that I had blown the whistle on. And all of this with the backing and connivance of politicians, judges, tax authorities, prosecutors, police, all the people who are meant to be there to keep us, the honest citizens, safe. And I like to think that I would stand up for what is right, but I also appreciate that it's easier for me to say that living here in the UK under the rule of law rather than in the vicious, pernicious kleptocracy that modern Russia has become and that did for Sergei Majnitsky. These amendments, New Clause 1, to which I've added my name, and Government New Clause 7, are dealing with individuals who have directly or indirectly committed gross human rights abuse overseas against whistleblowers or defenders of human rights. 
Of course, these provisions do not stop with Mezhnitsky, nor indeed Russia, and of course not all Russians are bad people. But Russia is as good as an, an example as any to show how these amendments, in different ways, address a glaring omission in our laws, an omission that has for too long allowed the perpetrators of vicious crimes against humanity to then happily base themselves and their ill-gotten gains in the UK as though nothing had happened, on the unwritten law that they do not do anything illegal whilst in the UK. Whilst the proposed clauses deal with individuals' actions, they will almost invariably come from countries where the crimes of the person are mixed up with crimes of the state. Russia operates a repressive, nasty society where human rights are often ignored, media suppressed, or where journalists are killed, democratic opposition ruthlessly suppressed, and even businessmen have a glass ceiling beyond which they are told who to pay and how to toe the line. Russia has an undiversified, oil-reliant, poor economy and a political system controlled by a dictator who, like most dictators, looks to address his failures at home with wins through threats and wars abroad. So Georgia and Ukraine are partially occupied and the West faces espionage and cyber attacks and so on. And all of this coming from a country with an economy smaller than that of Italy. So how does Putin and his gang get away with it? At least with communism there was a belief in ideology, a raison d'etre, however misguided. Now there's no belief in anything except one thing, money. Modern Russia is a kleptocracy, with small numbers of very rich people making the decisions and being bound together through their thieves' honour. However, if the thieves collectively thought that President Putin was not going to let them keep their money overseas, I've heard many experts say that Putin wouldn't last very long. This is one good reason to follow the black money through to when it reaches the UK and sees it. In other words, I'm maintaining that by not acting against the thieves and torturers in the UK, we are indirectly bolstering support for many of the worst regimes in the world. The other point is that thieves rarely steal for the sake of it. They steal because they wish to enjoy the benefits of their ill-gotten gains. But where should they spend it? Or how to keep their money safe until they do spend it is the challenge. The best place, obviously, is somewhere like the UK where the rule of law and property rights are sacrosanct. This is why the Home Affairs Select Committee pointed to £100 billion of black money being laundered here in the UK every year. It's why Russian and other human rights abusers' black money has been pouring into London property, Bond Street shops, country estates and prized British education. I recently went on a parliamentary trip to Hong Kong and heard, I have to say unofficially, that after the recent Beijing corruption crackdown, the Hong Kong couture and jewellery shops had reduced takings of up to 60%. As a result, Hong Kong commercial and residential property prices have also stopped rocketing. Likewise for criminals coming to London, many will be happy to pay top property prices if they feel that their money is, say, 80% less likely to be confiscated in London than in their home countries should they fall out of favour with the powers that be. Even with higher stamp duty and the annual company overseas tax, ARPT, the security of anonymously owning property in London in an offshore company can be worth paying the taxes to the security provided. But do we want this kind of money here is the question. In other words, we as a country have a decision to make here. Do we value the tax revenue and work coming via black money more than the human rights abuses and or illegality that it's connected with? I would suggest not. As we prepare to leave the EU, this issue will only become more relevant as we necessarily attempt to negotiate free trade agreements and cosy up to all sorts of regimes around the world. We need to set a marker, and new clause one is providing the mechanics for action. Moreover, it is making a statement against the rotten values of torturers and other criminals who might see us as an easy drop-off point for their assets. This clause has been initiated by my honourable friend for Isha and Walton and is now also recognised by the Home Secretary's amendment as an important issue, albeit to be addressed in a more narrow way, is highly commendable. And I do want to put on record my congratulations to the Minister and his department for listening to the case and coming forward with a meaningful compromise amendment. But I have to say some further questions arise. The Government New Clause 7 falls, of course, way short of the US Majnitsky Act, which has a specific list of undesirables attached. Furthermore, the government clearly wished to keep for themselves the choice of whom to prosecute an asset seize. 
I'm minded to go along with this, given that many, if not most, seizures would have political implications that I doubt should be left to, for instance, NGOs to prosecute. However, I would only be happy with this if I'm given comfort that the Government intend actually to use these powers once this bill is passed. On the question of a list, I think that we're missing a trick here. One of the strongest aspects of the US Majnitsky list is that hundreds of thousands of people have seen exactly who is blamed and for what. Indeed, I note that the US Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control updated the list only last month. If you search engine the US Majnitsky Act, you see each of the sanctioned individuals and their job titles. Naming and shaming is a huge negative issue for human rights abusers who wish to live in the security of criminal darkness. It is also a strong deterrent to others who might consider such abuse. So could the Minister say if he has considered publishing lists of those who will be prosecuted under these provisions? I'm not sure if this would be included in, the, in a, I think what he called the stats, which he said would, he would be publishing. Um, so a bit of clarification here would be helpful. My reading of New Clause 1 is that it is also more like the US Majnitsky Act, looking not only to seize assets, but also to stop the undesirables travelling to the UK, trading in the UK, using UK banks and buying UK property. Could the Minister say whether these types of issues are dealt with through New Clause 7 or perhaps other legislation that could be used at the same time? Um, perhaps I can uh, inform my honourable friend and also the rest of the House on this visa issue. Uh, we can refuse a visa to a person who does not meet the immigration rules. Evidence that a person has been involved in organised crime or human rights abuse or violations would be taken into account when considering a visa application. We can do already do that. The power is there with the government to do it, and we have exercised it in the past. I'm grateful for the Minister's clarification there, and it would be helpful if he, if he would say that it's the government's position that when a prosecution is taken under these new provisions, that a visa exclusion would be autom should be in there be automatically considered by the court, not as a, a possible uh, add-on. Clearly, if the sanctioned person were to have his or her assets confiscated, but they could then go on to buy more assets or conduct business in the UK, the new Clause 7 provision may lack, uh, lack the, the required teeth. In New Clause 7, subsection 5, it refers to proceedings needing to be brought within 20 years, which seems like a short period in any event. Furthermore, it looks to be 20 years from the commission of the gross human rights abuse. Could I ask why this is not from the end of the abuse? In other words, if someone has been abused for 20 years plus one day, would the right to prosecute the abuser then fail? Could the Minister please advise me whether the court would be required to connect the human rights abuse to the assets being seized? For instance, in the situation where the individual is accused of organising the torture of three people, but only steals from one of the three and then moves the stolen goods into the UK, in such a situation would the seizure have to be tied to the, the only one instance of torture which relates to the stolen goods? And my final question is, after the legislation is put in place, is the government actually intending to act? Many foreign nationals, not least Russians, really want to live here rather than, say, the US. So we have significant influence in setting standards of civilised behaviour that we expect for people to live or stay here. So I ask the Minister, as I think did my honourable friend for Isha Walton, are we now going to say to those that have been merciless in their own countries, who then look to store their ill-gotten gains in the UK, we do not want you here, we do not want your money here, and importantly, if you do come here, we will act. If this is the Minister's position, which I think he has said was the case, but will he clarify, please, then I'm minded to support the Government's new Clause 7 rather than new Clause 1. Chris Bryant. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I, I want to pay tribute, first of all, to two people. First of all, to the Minister, um, not least for bringing forward the bill in the first place, because I think we all accept across all parts of the House that um, the corrupt money that um, swishes around in the British financial system and, for that matter, in our housing market is entirely, it's a, it's a source of crime and corruption across the whole of the world. Um, unfortunately, it also means it, it has a very detrimental effect on the housing market in the UK. It means that large numbers of houses are bought not to live in, but simply as an investment vehicle and a means of uh, laundering money. 
and, and while some of those properties are at the high end of the market and might not affect um, the majority of our constituents, in some cases um, they have been buying property portfolios all the way down the housing market. And anyway, by simply increasing the value of the, those at the top end of the market, you are also having an effect on the whole of the housing market. So if we want to get serious about um, uh, the housing market in this country, we have to tackle this issue um, of corrupt money in the British system coming from overseas. So I welcome uh, the main provisions of the bill and I, and, I, and I applaud the Minister for trying to come some way towards um, a, magnet, a piece of legislation which might be termed the Magnitsky Clause, um, as he's already referred to in his new Clause 7. But I also want to pay tribute to the Honourable Member for Eastern Walton. He and I have been doing, oh, we've had so many conversations on this subject for a long time, we still haven't managed to decide how to say the word Sergei. Um, <laughs> And um, uh, the name Sergei. And, and the truth, I, I think one of the most depressing things in a, to add to the long list of, of what he himself said was um, that um, not only was he prosecuted posthumously, which must be a new low um, in, 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 in sort of putting two fingers up to um, the, the normal standards of criminal prosecution around the world, um, but also. Uh, I am absolutely certain that significant numbers of the people who are prohibited from entering the United States of America under the Magnitsky list have entered the United Kingdom since Sergei Magnitsky's death. And that's why I say to the Minister, I think he really needs to think again about this issue of visa bans. Um, but, um, I, I, and I do, I do look to the, to the United States of America. Several honourable members have referred to this already, uh, the honourable member for Huntington just now, in saying that the United States of America has gone much further than us. Um, the Minister tried to say that they have a very different um, legal system. Well, yes, they do have a different legal system. It is based on the same fundamental principles as ours, and I would have thought on the same values as ours. Um, and, uh, and, and that's why I think that we ought to be going at least as far as the United States of America uh, in this regard. Um, and I, I merely note that when the Commons debated this uh, on the 13th of December 2010, the motion was carried unanimously that we should proceed um, with a Magnitsky Act. And the government minister at the time, who is a thoroughly, thoroughly charming chap, um, he said, well, we had to wait to see what the United States of America would do. Well, I think we've all decided that we're not just going to wait to see what the United States of America does on anything at the moment. Uh, we might choose to set our own path in relation uh, to these matters. But um, I, I do sometimes feel as if the UK is dragging its heels on this issue. And of course, Sergei Magnitsky was killed just before, uh, in fact, when I was uh, Minister for Europe in the, in the Foreign Office, and, and, um, uh, and, uh, and so most of this has happened since 2010. Most of the debate about this has happened since 2010. And, and, and my personal perception was that both David Cameron and President Obama were actually very reluctant um, to show a strong arm to Russia because they thought that by pressing the reset button, that was Obama's view, somehow or other you would manage to get major concessions out of Putin. I have to say that has simply not proved to be an effective strategy. In every single regard, Putin has simply taken that, uh, those moments as a sign of weakness and proceeded to use force in uh, a greater degree. Um, you know, David Cameron, on the first day, became leader of the Conservative Party. The first thing he did was he went to Georgia to stand with the Georgians against Putin's invasion of Georgia. And yet, um, there are still Russian troops in Georgia. And since then, we've had um, the issues in Ukraine. Um, there is now clear evidence of Russian direct corrupt involvement in elections um, in France, uh, in Germany, in the United States of America, and I would argue also in this country. And many believe that some of the highest level decisions affecting security in the United Kingdom, in Germany, in France and in the United States of America are now compromised by Russian infiltration. And the, and the murder of um, Sergei Magnitsky and then his, his posthumously being put on trial, as I said earlier, shows that Russia is in effect a kleptocracy, um, a country that is ruled by people who have stolen from the people and use every means in their power to protect themselves and guard their position with jealousy. It is, in essence, the politics of jealousy writ large. And, and my fear is that it's also infected the United Kingdom, and for that matter, it's also affected one of our closest allies in Europe, Cyprus, where much Russian money is presently stored away and corruptly and laundered illegally. And 
And, and a sign of the problem that we face is actually it is impossible to extradite anybody from Russia because Russia will not allow the extradition in its law, in its constitution, of any Russian national. So we are unable to prosecute um, in many of the cases that we're talking about. Um, I, I must say I am still mystified why, they, um, why the authorities in this country have failed uh, in relation to any of the um, assets uh, belonging to those in this country uh, who were involved in the murder of Sergei Magnitsky and in the corruption that he unveiled. Uh, um, many people have pointed to some £30 million worth of such assets, um, uh, and none of which has yet been seized uh, or frozen, whilst in 11 other countries in the world, £43 million pounds, uh, dollars worth has been seized and frozen. So it feels as if this country is being reluctant or, in, or has inadequate laws to be able to uh, move. It's not only that this um, piece of legislation is necessary in relation to Magnitsky and in, in relation to Russia, though. Um, if you look at um, the situation in Kazakhstan, uh, Rakat Alayev, um, he, is reckoned to he was reckoned to have some £147 million worth of London property. Uh, he was the former secret uh, police chief in Kazakhstan. Uh, he then went on, uh, he had two tours of duty as ambassador to Austria uh, and then to Austria, Macedonia, Serbia and Slovenia. Um, he amassed an enormous fortune during those jobs uh, from banking, oil refinery, telecommunications, e virtually every form of state monopoly that he could manage to peculate from. Uh, he was the son-in-law of the former president, uh, Nazarbayev. And, and he was charged with money laundering through the British Virgin Islands, again another reason why we need to take more concerted action. And, and uh, he was uh, charged in Austria of torture, uh, with the torture of two bodyguards um, and the murder of the opposition leader in Kazakhstan uh, and of a Kazakh uh, journalist. Now, he committed suicide. Um, but up until uh, in, in uh, 2015, but up until that moment, there was still no system in the United Kingdom which would have meant that we would have been able to tackle um, the, uh, his financial assets in the United Kingdom and seek recovery of them. And indeed, there is an issue now about what we should do about those who have inherited um, those substantial assets. Um, and I think that, though, that, that those who have inherited them would certainly not be covered by the government's new clause, but would be covered by the Honourable Member for Isher and Walton's new clause, which is why I still support it, even if he's not going to push it to a vote. Um, the Honourable Member, who speaks for the um, Scottish Nationalists, referred earlier to the issue in Libya. Um, and again, there is a major issue here, because the Libyan transitional government found some $10 billion worth had been peculated from um, the Libyan people, uh, depriving schools, hospitals and the whole of the Libyan uh, uh, um, uh, state infrastructure under Colonel Gaddafi. Um, and um, a, a lot of that money has clearly come to the United Kingdom and indeed the Libyan authorities have been trying to pursue that money here but have found it phenomenally <laughs> difficult to do so. So far, so far as I'm aware, the only asset that has yet been recovered is a £10 million townhouse. Um, now, the Minister said he, he seemed to be suggesting that the threshold in, the, in, the, uh, in New Clause 1 um, was too low and it was just too easy for people to be able to um, bring prosecutions and that, it would be, that this would fall foul of the Human Rights Act. Incidentally, I hope we're keeping the Human Rights Act. Um, but um, the, uh, the, I would argue quite the reverse. In actual fact, as the Honourable Member for Eastern Walton pointed out, um, this has to go to a senior judge in the High Court. It's not a simple, you don't just turn up and say, oh, I want to have this chap's um, assets frozen, please can I have it? You have to make a proper argument. Second, it's on the balance of probabilities, a standard um, evidential basis in, in most civil actions. Um, and, it, and, and his bill places a duty on the Secretary of State, that is true, to, to pursue these matters, um, but only where it is in the public interest so to do. So there are plenty of um, uh, cavils um, and protections against the abuse, um, which is, seemed to be what the Minister was suggesting, that might otherwise um, apply. And there are significant differences between the two um, new clauses, as the, um, the member for Huntingdon uh, mentioned. Uh, um, first of all, uh, it only, the, the government's um, new clause only applies to abuses by public officials. 
Um, the definition of public official in the UK is already established in statute law, and that, that I think, is a significant limitation. Secondly, as I've said already, there's no duty to, uh, for um, the prosecuting authorities or the government to initiate civil recovery proceedings at all. Um, third, parties cannot apply under the government's new clause, um, and um, there will be no public register of abusers. Um, who are subject of uh, human rights abusers who are subject to recovery proceedings. Um, there will be no uh, um, designation orders, uh, which means that it will be quite easy for people who felt they were about to be um, uh, proceeded against to squirrel their assets away um, to another domain fairly quickly because there is no system of freezing them before recovery proceedings can start. Um, and um, it only applies to new degrading treatment or punishment after the incorporation of the Act, rather than to um, uh, events that have already taken place. And also, as, many, as members have already referred to, it does not apply to human rights abuses that, happen, abuses that happened more than 20 years ago. And I hope the Minister will re uh, respond to the point that was made by the Honourable Member for Huntingdon about um, when the 20 years begins and ends. Um, now, in all of this, um, I, 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 it just feels as if the government still has a, a view in its mind which is that you can somehow or other appease um, some of these people around the world and that they want to pussyfoot around the issue. I, I just don't think that that meets the present danger and need and in particular um, the risk that there is to the financial impropriety and reputation of this country around the world because we cannot prosper if we allow bribery and corruption to flourish in this, UK, in this country through the back door. And I think we should be saying that none of these people, uh, whether they're from Russia or from any other country, are welcome in the United, in the United Kingdom. And I've already said to the, um, before that I believe that many of those who were involved in the murder of Sergei Magnitsky and the corruption that he unveiled have, have actually visited the United Kingdom, notwithstanding what the Minister says, which is that a visa can be refused to any of these people. It, that may be the case, but we cannot be certain that they have been excluded. They cannot know that they are being excluded, and that's why I think it would be far more useful to be able to bring these two issues together with a visa ban and a, therefore a proper Magnitsky Act such as they have in the United States of America. And the one final point I'd make, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that um, we are present, as uh, one, I think it was the Minister said earlier, we are presently operating under a, circ uh, under a set of circumstances where we are in the European Union. Um, we rely, on, the Prime Minister has regularly said when she's come back from European Councils, it's been great to be able to get tough sanctions against Russia imposed by the European Union. If we were the only people, country that was arguing in that European Council meeting for such tough sanctions, when we are no longer there, it is going to be much more difficult for us to be able to prosecute the foreign policy that we want, and in particular the policy in relation to Russia. So uh, the, the Honourable Member for Isha has a completely different view from me on this last point. But I, but I hope he would agree, and I hope the whole House would agree, that we will have to find new mechanisms to be able to ensure that we do not become the sink spot for international um, corruption, bribery and human rights abusers who want to abuse the rights and privileges of uh, owning and living in the United Kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. Eric Pickles. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a great uh, pleasure to follow the Honourable Gentleman. As much that I agreed uh, with uh, what he said, and some that I didn't, but we'll put that to one side uh, for a moment. But I do want to uh, congratulate my uh, honourable friend uh, from Isha and Walton, never forgetting Walton in his, uh, in, in his patch, because um, I, I think he's achieved an enormous uh, progress on yeah. this. Um, when he started, I didn't think he had a chance of, of, of getting this through. And uh, it's, this is quite an unusual, I think, concession from the government, if the government minister wouldn't mind me saying so. Usually it's out of panic uh, uh, for defeat. I don't think there was any possibility. This concession has come out of the power of my honourable friend's arguments uh, to, to right a wrong and to include within British law something that I think will make a difference. And I'm sure the House is very grateful uh, for what, uh, yeah, that what he's done. Now, I stand uh, before you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, as the UK Government's champion on anti-corruption. Uh, when I was um, appointed by David Cameron, 
I came out to find that, uh, that he'd described me as the anti-corruption czar. Now, the Daily Mirror shortened that to corruption czar, <laughs> and I felt that was one two step too close to the Romanov, so I'm, I'm happy with champion. Um, and it was in that capacity that I went to a meeting of the Organisation of Security and Cooperation in Europe in Paris. And one of the speakers, bearing in mind this was an, an anti-corruption um, uh, conference, one of the speakers talked about uh, taking a lorry uh, were th full of goods that were time sensitive and the customs asked for a facilitation payment, a private facilitation payment. How many people would make that payment? And to the amazement of myself, but I suspect to the greater amazement of um, the, the person asking the question, a good 60% of the hands went up that they would. And I was proud to say that if that lorry driver had been British, not only would he have committed a crime, but he would have been prosecuted on his return to the UK for uh, doing that, and so would his company. So I think this, um, this amendment, Amendment 7, and the excellent uh, uh, amendment, uh, new clause 1, I beg your pardon, has to be seen within that context, that we have been gradually uh, triangulating this. Now, I'm old enough to remember listening to a minister a Conservative Minister, I'm ashamed to say, say on the radio a number of years ago, I want British companies to bribe. Everybody bribes, and I want Britain to be among those that bribe. It was a ludicrous thing to say, but it was the kind of reaction that we got to the Bribery Act, to say, well, everybody's doing it. All we're doing is putting UK companies at peculiar risk. And that hasn't been the case. Through the Bribery Act, we have seen boardrooms put in due diligence to ensure that they themselves don't face that problem. And this is part of that process of triangulating a crime. And I don't think it's seen any drop off in terms of, of British uh, uh, business. So I am pleased. This has to be seen within the context of the call for, uh, for a consultation on economic crimes and the, the place of the board on economic crimes. It should be seen within the context of, um, uh, of transparency, beneficial ownership of uh, property in this country owned by people who want uh, to uh, trade with, uh, with, uh, with the government. And I'm hoping to see something positive um, uh, coming uh, uh, out of that. So. Given the degree of, uh, of consensus that seems to be breaking out around this particular clause, I'll make a slightly shorter uh, speech than I um, originally intended. But what this will do is it should ensure that bloodstained dictators, that those on the take in kleptocracies around the world, and I do entirely agree, a posthumous conviction for... for um, uh, for, for, for dishonesty, for theft, is as ridiculous as I think occurred in the French Revolution of putting animals out on trials. But we have to kind of understand that there are parts of the world um, that government and private business move hand in hand that would make the Tudor court uh, look like the very, the very epitome of, of Puritan restraint. And it's to those people that we're sending out a very clear uh, message that their assets will be seized, that their lives will be uh, interrupted, and that those who seek uh, to buy expensive flats, expensive jewellery, that they will face a problem. We've dealt with, I think, the worry um, of... Um, of uh, third parties and vexatious claims. Uh, I think I won't go over that point, but I think there's a further point on this that needs to be emphasised, uh, which is this. Often, uh, particularly non-government <coughs> organisations do play an enormous, enormous part in bringing prosecutions together or bringing evidence to the authorities. Now, I, I suspect, like the Minister, have had the privilege of of uh, seeing how the serious uh, fraud office works. A lot of those cases are complex, 
a lot of those cases actually take a lot of time. And I think there would have been a risk were third parties allowed to make these applications that they might actively tip off an ongoing um, uh, investigation. So I think that's another uh, compelling reason why, um, why it should be the state or more particularly the prosecution authorities that, 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 that bring these. But I want to, to end by really um, agreeing with my honourable friend from, from Huntington, who I think makes a powerful point. This is pointless unless there are prosecutions. This is useless unless there are prosecutions. I have the honour to, uh, to talk to various governments around the world, and they often they will um, um, show the marvellous laws that they have and demonstrate that way they're dealing with bribery. But the number of prosecutions that are not seen through, the number of prosecutions are, are, are not made. I was with a, um, a country which I shan't, uh, shan't name, and I was pressing on this, and they managed to produce so uh, that they'd, um, uh, they'd prosecuted a local government official for taking away um, a television areas and making a profit on that. And yet they were dealing, it was a place riddled with prosecution. Unless the people at the top feel their colour felt, then this won't be very effective. But this, I think, along with other, um, uh, with, with other uh, clauses and amendments in, uh, in this bill, should make a, a difference. So I'm very pleased to be supporting the government. And I end again by congratulating my, my honourable friend uh, for seeing this through. Yeah. Tom Brake. Deputy Speaker, I rise just to make a, f a few very brief comments and to, to start really by thanking the member for Isham Walton for really all putting this to together and uh, the Minister for responding positively. I I've been in this House long enough to know that Ministers rarely respond positively uh, to approaches, even cross-party ones, so it's welcome to see that the Minister has uh, uh, taken on board, I think, the spirit of this. Uh, there is someone else that I would like to, to, to pay tribute to, and that is uh, Bill Browder, who many members here will have met, who has uh, really led the charge on this. But I think I'm sure that Bill, what Bill doesn't want, particularly as a tribute, what he wants is to see action on this. And uh, I share some of the reservations that the uh, hon Honourable Member for Rhonda had uh, around the fact that there have been, in other countries, uh, asset seized that uh, were related to the Magnitsky case, but it seems as though London, which I think many members would accept is a, uh, a place that many Russians, uh, sometimes of rather dubious uh, backgrounds, do like to put their assets. And it seems strange that whilst assets have been seized almost around the world uh, in relation to this case, that London is the one place where they haven't. Now, uh, the Minister has uh, reassured us that the prosecuting authorities would, of course, not that he can uh, put pressure on them, but he has confirmed that the prosecuting authorities would uh, indeed uh, prosecute if there was evidence. And uh, I can assure uh, Bill Browder and others that um, I think he would have the support of the House, as expressed by the Minister, that if, um, if this evidence is uh, forthcoming, or if there is more evidence or more detailed evidence, that uh, the Minister, for one, has endorsed the need for very firm action to be taken, which he says uh, could be taken perhaps even under existing legislation, but could be taken even more effectively uh, in relation to the new clause that the Minister has put forward. Now, I understand that um, the reasons why I and others uh, would prefer to see new clause one, but I understand the reasons why the Minister uh, has pr preferred to put forward his, his own new clause, and clearly in the House today, unfortunately, we, do, we would not have the numbers, I suspect, to push uh, and win successfully the cross-party amendment. So I think what we will have to do uh, is uh, follow this matter very closely. I welcome the fact that the Minister is going to uh, publish statistics on it. A number of members have referred to the, the, the Magnitsky Act. If, if members want to see uh, the list of names, then they could just look at uh, my early day motion 1344, where I did indeed name, and a number of members uh, signed that early day motion. I signed, uh, I tabled that. It listed uh, the, uh, the Russian citizens who are subject to the Magnitsky Act in uh, America. And I think it was the, uh, the, the Honourable Member for, for Rhonda who's just reminded me that I probably need to retable it because he says that there have been new names added. Uh, in the American version. So uh, that information is there if people need to refer to it. But um, 
Uh, with that, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I welcome the fact that the Government have moved on this, but the proof will be in the pudding. And if evidence is forthcoming that uh, these assets are here in the way that Bill Browder and others uh, believe is the case, that the Government will uh, ensure that, this is, uh, that the, uh, those uh, who are responsible uh, are prosecuted and brought to justice for the gross human rights violations that they have committed. Andrew Mitchell. Madam Deputy Speaker, I can uh, be extremely brief in my intervention as a signatory of New Clause 1 because uh, my honourable and right honourable friends and indeed those across the House have made the case with such eloquence on the, uh, what is known as the Magnitsky uh, Amendment. Um, and uh, also, it does seem to me, as a signatory of New Clause 1, that the Government has listened. The Minister has quite rightly heard the cross-party voice on these issues um, and brought forward New Clause uh, 7, and I certainly congratulate the Minister on having uh, achieved that. Uh, my honourable friend for Isha, who has done such a good uh, job on this, uh, pointed out uh, that we must not allow the best uh, to be the enemy of the good in, in his acceptance of the government's amendment. And um, the uh, story of his Paris meeting that my right honourable uh, friend, the anti-corruption uh, czar, made, reminds me of just how complex the attack on corruption uh, is, that, of which we must all be a, a part. And I remember being told by a very eminent New York uh, lawyer, an anti-corruption lawyer, um, who ha had been engaged in a, a whole variety of anti-corruption mechanisms that he was once invited to Afghanistan to give a lecture on how to tackle corruption. And a, a vast number in his auditorium of Afghan officials turned up. And to his horror, he suddenly realized halfway through this lecture, as he observed the Rolex watches on the wrists of so many of those officials, that they had not turned up to learn how to tackle corruption but had turned up in order to learn how to evade the tackling of corruption. And uh, corruption is a cancer. It is insidious uh, in a whole variety of different ways. And one of the good things about this, this bill is that it, it is seeking, in this very complex area, to make a number of uh, very clear uh, aspects of progress. In an area where I do think the former Prime Minister and former Chancellor of the Exchequer and others uh, in the uh, government on these benches have made a very big contribution in that fight uh, to tackle uh, corruption. I want just to make two very brief final points. Uh, the first is, and I think the Minister has recognised this, that uh, there has been in the Magnitsky case, and I speak as someone who knows Bill Browder and has been absolutely horrified to hear the uh, tale of the experience which he has undergone, um, uh, I think it's, it's clear that the British uh, law enforcement agencies have shown, um, I put it no greater than this, a degree of confusion, delay and obfuscation in their handling of these matters. And I think there are issues of administrative coordination and effectiveness, and I hope very much that the Minister will ensure that this remains clearly on his agenda, at least tackling this remains on his agenda. And the second and final point, Madam Deputy Speaker, is this. We need in Britain to send a very clear signal about the approach we take to human rights abuses and to money laundering. And the failure to send a very clear signal, which hopefully will be ended by the decision that the House takes this afternoon, damages our international relations. Britain's relations and dealings with Russia are very complex. We need to work with Russia on a number of uh, matters where we have a common interest. But we need to be absolutely clear, too, where we stand on the issues which my honourable friend for Huntington so eloquently set out in his speech, so that there is no misunderstanding of where the British government stands on many of the horrific aspects of Russian governance and Russian conduct uh, which my honourable friend set out. I have been a strong critic in this House of Russian abuses of human rights and indeed commitment of war crimes uh, in Syria. And I do think, given that we have also this other dimension of areas where we must be able to work constructively with Russia, that being clear, absolutely clear, of where we stand on these human rights issues in this House with our government is extremely important. Minister Ben Wallace. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, and I think we've had a very important and well-informed debate, and I am very grateful for the contributions from my honourable colleagues and honourable friends uh, on this issue, and particularly to my honourable friend, the member for Isha and Walton, for his remarks. And I have to say, throughout this process, I have done my best as the Minister to speak to as many colleagues as possible, to listen to their concerns, to go back to the law enforcement agencies, ask some tough questions. I can't say whether predecessors ever did or didn't, but uh, I take it the view that uh, our job as ministers is to go beyond just the briefing papers that we have all received in our boxes in the past, uh, to test their resolve, and to send them a very clear message, I have said, to uh, the agencies that when, hopefully, this bill is passed by Parliament and becomes an Act, we want to see prosecutions, we want to see uh, the powers used. Uh, I will not interfere with how they choose to apply those powers. I will not choose which ones they uh, choose to use to achieve the right effect. But I think the main aim is to make sure that we say loud and clear we don't want money launderers in this country, we don't want organised criminals, we don't want people that abuse people with torture and inhumane treatment coming here. You're not welcome in this country and nor is your dirty money. And if you come to this country, we will try and have you and we will certainly try and have your money. And if we can return that money back to regimes where it's been stolen from, we shall do that. And we have already started uh, that process, returning £27 million to Macau uh, recently and indeed signing a, a memorandum of understanding with Nigeria. And if we can, we shall do that. And I think uh, this amendment, the, both the Government's amendment and new Clause 1, and there's many things I agree with in the spirit of that new clause, says it loud and clear. Uh, and those people that want to uh, exploit uh, laws around the world uh, and immunities or state sponsorship or state umbrella or, or tacit support, uh, it won't be good enough. And I think that our new clause uh, helps uh, achieve that. I have also highlighted to the Honourable Member that uh, we will have annual reporting on the use of this provision. The Government has already agreed in our response to the Public Accounts Committee and Home Affairs Select Committee to publish a set of annual assets recovery statistics, uh, but as I have made clear in committee stage, this will cover the annual use of unexplained wealth orders, and I am also pleased to commit today that this will include the use of this provision uh, to make sure. Um, will the Will that also include the names uh, and titles of people from whom the assets have been taken? Um, I will have to uh, check back with uh, my honourable friend, but certainly uh, a matter of a court action will be a matter of public record. So if someone is uh, prosecuted under Proceeds of Crime Act or indeed their assets frozen, that will become a ma matter of public record uh, and therefore available uh, to all, uh, and I think that is uh, important. And just to, to reiterate, the Government is at present on the sanctions issue, undertaking an assessment of existing sanctions policy post-Brexit to ensure we can continue our proactive approach. It is right that any changes to our sanctions regime are considered in that context, rather than making any changes at this point. We will, of course, continue a dialogue with parliamentary colleagues on this work. Uh, and to say to my, my hon. Friend, the Member for Ether, absolutely I will ensure that the spirit of his new Clause 1 amendment is carried forward into those discussions. Uh, but I think the time to do that is, is not now with this piece of legislation. The time is obviously uh, when that assessment uh, is being made and we come to a place post-Brexit uh, where uh, we will have to look at, obviously, sanctions in the wider picture. And just on the issue about the duty of law enforcement agencies to use these powers, part of the rule of law, part of the strength of our system as opposed to perhaps some other regimes that have been talked about uh, uh, today, is that our law enforcement agencies are operationally independent. That I don't sit as a minister behind a desk and use these agencies to pick on uh, people I don't like or political rivals I don't like. We leave as much as possible the operational independence uh, uh, to these agencies because that is part of the balance and the safeguards in our society. But, but if the prosecuting authorities were for, an, for a, a wrong reason, for a corrupt reason, to choose not to prosecute, then uh, uh, there are powers in the, through the courts to make sure that they have done so. Well, I think, I'm afraid I give 
Our law enforcement agencies a much better view of their their integrity than to say or to even allude that there is some corrupt reason they may not use their powers. Uh, you know, we all have constituents who write to us who say, I made a complaint to the police and they didn't take any action. Sometimes that is valid and sometimes we follow a path to try and get a better result for them. And, and honourable members here today who have obviously met Bill Bowden have brought to this House and to colleagues their evidence and have certainly made presentations to the National Crime Agency and cross-examined cross uh, uh, the National Crime Agency witness during the committee stage. Uh, but we also have uh, I'm afraid constituents who don't like the outcome of their complaints that a crime was not committed and, and you know that is I'm afraid the disappointment they sometimes have to live with and it is our job as members of parliament to tell them that uh, I'm afraid it doesn't constitute a crime or indeed the police have to uh, uh, make that case and sometimes they seek to solve that by changing the law to create a, a crime that may be appropriate or up to date but I think it is important uh, to really respect that operational independence tempting as it may be sometimes to wish to reprioritize their priorities to suit uh, the, the issue of the day. Now, I, I really do have to press on because um, honourable members have made uh, valid queries and considerable amounts and I have a small but short book uh, to go through handed to me uh, from the box. Uh, uh, to the honourable member for Dumfries and Galloway, he raises uh, a number of issues on the retrospective of uh, some of the offences and uh, the unlimited nature. Well, first of all, torture is an offence which the UK applies universal jurisdiction, and on that basis, these provisions are retrospective insofar they relate to torture, even when it, where it occurred prior to the enactment of this bill. However, the Government Amendment also would only cover conduct constituting, constituting cruel, inhumane and degrading treatment where it comes in after coming into force this Act. Now, what we've done already is already a significant legal step to suspend the requirement of dual, for dual recriminality, i.e. that providing for civil recovery uh, to be pursued against property that was not necessarily unlawfully obtained in this country uh, in which the conduct took place means that we, we, we think we are at a place where we're taking a, a suitably proportionate approach. We have already gone further than we do in some other areas because we can take action where the unlawful uh, event took place and it wasn't in this country and I think so we have to uh, balance that. Recovery of proceeds of crime generally are subject to a 20 year limitation period under the Limitation Act 1980. And uh, on the question I think the Honourable Member for Rhonda made uh, and indeed the Member for Dumfries and Galloway about when under POCA uh, generally, can we uh, claim the proceeds? You know, what's the timescale where it starts? Well, under POCA, it starts when the property was obtained uh, through uh, unlawful conduct, whereas under new clause 1, it actually seems to run from the date of the conduct itself and therefore could be a possibly a shorter timescale uh, uh, than uh, the government's uh, new clause. Um, and can I also uh, reassure the member for Dumfries and Galloway that um, new clause 7 does cover conduct linked to torture, uh, uh, such as assisting it, directing it, facilitating it, uh, or profiting from it, even where that linked conduct is not conducted by a public official. So I think it, it does go uh, wider than uh, perhaps some people uh, may fear. I think the other point is what evidence is needed to allow for the assets to be recovered. Well, first of all, any civil recovery would be subject to all existing processes and legal safeguards in the Proceeds of Crime Act. The court would need to be satisfied on the balance of probabilities that the property in question was the proceeds of crime or is likely to be used to fund further criminal activity. And law enforcement's agent would, as ever, need to consider which of their powers to utilise in a case-by-case -case basis. It would also apply to inherited wealth. That would not be uh, excluded. Inherited wealth would be covered uh, uh, by uh, that ability to recover asset. Uh, and so I hopefully can reassure the Honourable Member uh, for Rhonda on that point. Um, to my Honourable Friend, the Member for Isha and Walton, um, I think I reiterate that the spirit that he is trying to achieve is something that the Government agrees with. We want to say loud and clear that you're not welcome, you know, organised criminals, crooks, uh, you know, corrupted uh, individuals are not welcome in this country and nor are their money. And, you know, that's why uh, I was very pleased to be part of the process of the implementation of the Bribery Act, a Bribery Act brought in by uh, the last Labour government. The uh, uh, 
implementation and the statutory guidance that went along in it by this government or the government before, the Conservative government, and I think that's part of the whole package. Along with this, the Criminal Finance Bill goes the Bribery Act and some of the other issues, and I think that is where we're trying to get to. I don't want London and the United Kingdom to be fuelled by dirty money. I don't want people to be profited from it, and I think what people do need to understand is the reason people should want to come to London and the way you make London open for business in the United Kingdom is the rule of law is one of the best ways to make it uh, uh, open for business and I would say a competitive tax base but I think those two things are actually why people should want to come to the United Kingdom not because they can hide their money uh, or, or launder it anywhere else and it doesn't make us a better place uh, for, for hosting uh, these individuals and I hope the new powers not just in this part of the bill but in the whole bill will help us tackle it and I'm very keen uh, to make sure that as soon as this bill hopefully becomes an act that we start uh, making sure we deal with some of these individuals uh, and getting the money back to where it belongs. Um, to my right hon. Friend, friend, member for Huntington, I have to say, not much of a speech I didn't agree with. It was a very well articulated speech. He's absolutely right about sending that message. You know, there are uh, uh, regimes around this, the world who deliberately uh, take advantage of Britain's openness uh, and quality of places to live uh, and indeed uh, uh, what we have to offer uh, and uh, those regimes need to be sent a message that uh, you know, we are serious here uh, and uh, you know, go elsewhere uh, but we would very much like to catch you first and put you in prison to be brutally honest uh, uh, to do that. Uh, to the Honourable Member for Rhonda, I think I've clarified the point for him of uh, inherited wealth uh, and the worries about the London property market, I, it's not just nice townhouses and Knightsbridge being brought up, it is a huge portfolios up and down the country and it doesn't just apply uh, to necessarily over the citizens, the rest of this bill hopefully also deals with uh, drug dealers in, in my part of the world in the North West or, or the North East or Northern Ireland who may be uh, funnelling uh, money into property. As part of our work the government is doing on the implementation of the fourth anti-money laundering directive, the government has consulted on whether estate agents should carry out checks on the buyers of property as well as the sellers. I was, I was probably surprised many colleagues you were to find out that they don't, they only do it on the seller. Uh, um, and we intend to publish the response imminently, is what my note says, so I think we will all uh, look carefully at what that response uh, is. Um, on the member for Rhonda's other question about uh, freezing of orders and, and why people will move the orders, uh, move the money pretty quickly, um, Part 5 of POCA uh, applies, does allow for interim freezing orders that allow for freezing of property while the court considers the case. So hopefully to do that. But I'm, I, I'm also recognised that both the Home Affairs Committee uh, a report on uh, proceeds of crime or recovery of assets did point out some very valid uh, uh, problems in the system and I, I have asked in the department that we set about making sure uh, that we are timely when we make cases for confiscation uh, of funds and assets to make sure that uh, the gaps don't allow uh, criminals and bad people to take the money uh, before we actually do that. It's also, and the Honourable Member for Rhonda, uh, my right honourable friend, uh, uh, the anti-corruption czar, will, will recognise that within government, you know, we always have to satisfy the competing issues within departments. And, and he will know himself as a Foreign Office Minister and a sec former Secretary of State for DCLG that we have competing, obviously, interests within government when it comes to making uh, some pieces of this legislation. And inevitably, uh, amendments like this have to walk a very fine line between a number of challenging diplomatic and political issues, but I trust the House agrees that the Government has taken a constructive approach. I have been determined to listen to my colleagues and produce something that hopefully is a strong message, but also an actual power uh, to allow us uh, to act on people who have abused human rights. And I want to finish by congratulating the sponsor of New Clause 1. Uh, it's important that we've had the opportunity to make this debate. My honourable friend for Isha and Walter is a formidable campaigner, if I have to say, uh, um, and I think he has uh, successfully uh, articulated the case, uh, imbued the spirit of his amendment into our bill, uh, and hopefully uh, I hope that the House will support new clause, government new clause 7, which I beg to move. 
The question is that the Government new Clause 7 be read a second time. As many as are of that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the Government new Clause 7 be added to the Bill. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now come to Government new Clause 8, with which it will be convenient to consider the new clause motion to transfer and amendments grouped together on the selection paper. Minister, to move new clause 8. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. We now come to a group of amendments relating to law enforcement, investigative and recovery powers. It is primarily composed of government amendments, which I hope the House will agree are for the most part technical and uncontroversial. I do not therefore intend to linger on each of them, but will quickly summarise the key amendments for the benefit of honourable members. New Clause 8 and other consequential amendments remove the restriction on HMRC's criminal powers being used for former revenue functions. This ring fence arose following a merger of HM Customs and Excise and the Inland Revenue in 2005. In the interviewing period, legislative changes have brought most major taxes within the scope of HMRC's criminal justice powers. However, there remain some anomalies. For example, investigators cannot use certain powers to fight stamp duty tax fraud. Fraud is a crime regardless of which function of HMRC is committed against. These amendments will ensure necessary powers are available in all such cases. They do not provide HMRC with any new criminal justice powers. Amendments 2 to 15, 70 and 71 relate to the power at Clause 9 of the Bill to allow an extension of the moratorium period in which law enforcement agencies can investigate a suspicious activity report before a transaction is allowed to proceed. These amendments deliver a number of minor and technical improvements to this provision. They allow for an automatic extension to the moratorium period while a court is hearing is awaited to make a decision on an application. They help to ensure that a company does not provide any information to the customer whose transaction is subject to a SAR other than the fact that a suspicious activity report has been made. They allow immigration officers to apply for an extension and they allow for an explicit right of appeal in Northern Ireland. The majority of the remaining amendments in this group, 22 to 24, 26, 27, 29, 38, 46, 47, 49, 57, 60, 69 to 69, 72, clarify the operation of the seizure and forfeiture powers that the Bill adds to the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002 and the Anti-Terrorism, Crime and Security Act 2001. Many of these changes are extremely technical in nature, but I will highlight a few of the most significant. They allow the Director General of the National Crime Agency to designate the level of senior officer that can authorise use of certain powers. Unlike in the police, no such designation currently exists in law. They ensure that an interest accrued on forfeited funds, while in the agency's account, is returned to the owner of the funds if that person successfully appeals against the forfeiture. And they provide that where the National Crime Agency has used the powers and a court determines compensation should be paid, that the National Crime Agency will be responsible for paying, that, for paying that compensation. They introduce a duty on the police and others to consult with the Treasury to ensure that the full range of terrorist asset freezing powers are considered before exercising the related power provided by the Bill, and they, re and they require consultation with the devolved administrations before the provisions of, in Clause 12 relating to the seizure of gaming vouchers and betting slips are commenced. This will ensure that the provisions are implemented effectively in Scotland and Northern Ireland. On the issue of devolved administrations, we hope the Scottish Parliament will approve their legislative consent motion on the Bill shortly. Although the Government asserts that none of the provisions are devolved with respect to Wales, I note that the Assembly has provided a, a, a legislative consent motion. The Government has also extensive discussions with the Northern Ireland Executive about the Bill and plans were in place for a legislative consent motion to be considered in the Assembly. Law enforcement authorities in Northern Ireland are keen to ensure they have access to the powers in the legislation. However, the suspension of the Assembly prior to the election has, of course, prevented the legislative consent motion from being pursued at this time. These are clearly extremely unusual circumstances, but the Government remains committed to the central principles of the Sewell Convention. We will therefore commit not to commence provisions on matters devolved to Northern Ireland without the appropriate consent having been attained. Obtained. It is our intention to pick this up with the Executive following those elections. It may not be possible to resolve this prior to the Bill receiving royal assent. We will most likely make further amendments to the Bill in the House of Lords to put beyond doubt that all the relevant 
provisions can be commenced at separate times for different areas in the United Kingdom. Very grateful, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware that whilst the aspiration would be to see an early return to the Stormont Executive, the likelihood of that happening uh, in the immediate future is somewhat fraught. Uh, so, given that the Bill will inevitably conclude uh, before we see the return uh, to the institutions of Stormont, could he outline what steps there will be to regularise issues uh, once the Assembly has been restored? Well, um to my honourable uh, colleague, I, I would say that, first of all, we are in discussions consistent, uh, ongoing with the Northern Ireland Assembly. We hope that the Northern Ireland Assembly elections are completed and that Stormont takes up the reins again and devolution returns to Northern Ireland. I think that is our start point. That is what we all wish. Uh, and I think you know, there was a good cross-party consensus for these provisions in Northern Ireland before uh, the Assembly. I'm not sure. I can't. I can't remember the date of the actual election. The honourable member may have to remind me, but uh, I, I think the start point is to let's plan for normality in Northern Ireland and make sure we're in a, in a, in a good position. Second of March, Madam Deputy Speaker. But uh, would the minister, uh, if and, and I agree with his aspiration that we should hope to see a return uh, to Stormont Anna as soon as possible, uh, but would the minister uh, believe that there would be merit? And at least corresponding with the leaders of each individual political party to attain affirmation for the measures at this stage uh, for fear that we don't see a return uh, in a reasonable period of time? Uh, I'm grateful to the honourable member. I'll certainly put that suggestion uh, uh, to uh, uh, officials. I, I think my view would be that pre suspension of the Assembly, that's the place we were at. Uh, I'm not sure, while well, there has been a change of a leader, uh, I'm not sure that that has. We have had any signal that, to, that, that that's gone backwards, but the second of March uh, gives me some good hope. The, uh, I've never known the other place move at the speed of light, uh, so I think we have certainly, uh, uh, hopefully, time uh, uh, to make sure this uh, uh, gets through. Um, finally, uh, Madam Deputy, this group includes two amendments concerning the unexplained wealth order, new clause five in the name of. Th number of the officers of the All Parliamentary Parliamentary Group on Anti-Corruption and Responsible Tax and Opposition Amendment uh, 1. I will allow Honourable members the opportunity to speak to these amendments and will respond to them in my closing remarks. Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs Removal of Restrictions. The question is that new clause 8 be read a second time. Carolyn Harris. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We on this side of the House support the spirit of this Bill and we broadly support this group of amendments. We welcome new provisions to prosecute those professionals that fail to prevent tax evasion as well as unexplained wealth orders which, uh, under which assets can be seized if owners are unable to explain how they were funded. We of course support the Government's effort to tighten up state powers against white-collar crime, but we have concerns that this squandering an opportunity that the Bill provides to stamp out everyday corruption of the super-rich, getting a free ride on the expense of the wider society, thereby fueling inequality. A problem is that amid the Government's cuts to public services, this Bill could be very difficult to enforce. Whilst I understand the giving of new powers to HMRC, is the Government not concerned about how they will carry out their new duties, given that the Coalition Government decimated HMRC's budgets by £100 million and they are set to lose 137 of their offices by 2027? There seems little point in creating laws that potentially cannot be enforced, unless it is, of course, to give the impression that the government is doing something, yeah, yeah. Uh, a theme I fear that has sadly run through our proceedings on the bill so far. We on this side of the House put forward the argument that for the agency involved in civil recovery powers, it is crucial that they have sufficient resources to do their job properly. We therefore requested a distinct and clear annual report which details the resources allocated to agencies concerned solely with the task of carrying out these recovery powers. In previous stages of the Bill, the Government objected on the grounds that the Asset Recovery Incentivisation Scheme would allow front-trained agencies to keep 100 per cent of what they recover. But this argument is seriously flawed. In theory, yes, the agencies could retain the total value recovered. 
But as the Committee of Public Accounts made clear in its progress review of confiscation orders, and as did the Home Affairs Select Committee in its review of the Proceeds of Crime Act, these agencies have been typically poor in terms of their recovery rates. Consequently, it seems it remains to be seen as to how these agencies will improve their rate of recovery to benefit from the new incentivisation scheme. Another reason the Government give is that if one wanted to find out this information, you could in theory obtain it by going through a number of different sources, but yet again this is flawed. We previously argued for a detailed reporting of resources specifically for these agencies in the exercise of the powers laid down in the Criminal Finance Bill and the Proceeds of Crime Bill. The Government has already blocked a number of measures that Labour have proposed to make this a meaningful and effective bill. We proposed a corporate probation order. If a company was found to be committed a failure to prevent an offence, it would have been subject to an independent review of its compliance procedures. It would also pay the full cost of such a review. This was coupled with allowing for the removal of directors from companies who failed to ensure that proper procedures were in place to prevent UK and foreign tax evasion offences taking place. But the Government believed this was unnecessary because UK law could already deal with such cases of negligence. And whilst there may be a case that some UK law could be used to a similar effect, it would not be an identical effect. Whilst there is an applied threat to the EU that the Government could change the UK's economic model into one of a tax haven, there is a strong case for legislation to protect both UK and global citizens from around the world. With the potential for a race to the bottom and the destruction of workers' rights and the slashing of corporation tax, it could be argued that a Brexiteer government would foster an environment where tax evasion was implicitly encouraged. As colleagues have said, and will no doubt say again, this bill must do more to tackle the deeply entrenched and extraordinarily costly phenomenon of tax avoidance. Tax avoidance is in effect living to the letter of the law, but not in the spirit of the law. And repeated investigations of companies that sail close to the wind, but know that they have bought the lawyers and accountants to make their tax abuse legal, is both very frustrating and extremely costly. As the UK general anti-abuse rules show, there are ways to minimise the risk of corporate abuse of the tax system, and these should be absorbed into this bill. Spain, Canada and Australia each have one single agency responsible for supervising and enforcing anti-money laundering regulations. Britain has 22. And worse still, according to Transparency International UK, 15 of these 22 supervisors also lobby on behalf of the interests of their sector, creating clear conflicts of interest and a system inefficient to its core. The Government raised this problem in its action plan that preceded the Bill, but were not concerned enough to cover this into proposed legislation. The system needs reform, and the Criminal Finance Bill needs to reflect this. And unless the Government takes all these concerns, and in fact all the changes raised in opposition motion amendments into the Bill, it is likely that this will fail on the intent to clean up on money laundering and tax evasion. Yeah. Yeah. Mills. Speaker, it's a pleasure to speak in this bill and to speak to new clause 5, which, as the Minister said, stands in my name and the name of um, some honourable colleagues from the um, all-party parliamentary group on anti-corruption. The um, reason for moving new clause 5 is a, perhaps just to probe the Government on this issue, just to make sure that we get the full uh, use of the unexplained wealth orders and the interim freezing orders that we envisage in passing this bill. And there is a concern that, um, if we're not careful, what, what might happen is the various authorities that can use them might be a little concerned that the people they want to use them against who 
no doubt will in some cases be very rich, very powerful people who I suspect probably won't go lightly in having their wealth um, frozen or restricted will uh, seek to frustrate those orders and oppose them with every means they have, including incurring hugely significant costs, perhaps well above what could be considered reasonable in that situation, then try and force those onto the taxpayer at a later date if they can successfully resist those attempts to achieve those orders. And while it's absolutely right that if the state tries to impose one of these orders and those orders fail, that the individual concerns should be able to recover their reasonable costs, I think what would be unreasonable is so if those individuals could engage numerous very highly paid barristers and actually end up with costs that are wholly disproportionate in that situation and end up with the taxpayer having to pay them. And the real risk here is that will be quite a deterrent effect on bodies actually trying to use these powers where they do fear that the um, very rich individual that they're uh, seeking to impose them on actually may end up taking large chunks of their budget for a long period. Uh, in so the, the, the whole point of this clause was just to explore whether the existing powers that are there for the courts to restrict the amount of cost that can actually be recovered can be said very clearly to apply to efforts to obtain the orders that are set out in this bill. So that we will all be clear that where the, uh, the various state authorities acting competently and reasonably clearly in trying to get these orders actually can't be unreasonably opposed and end up with overly significant amounts of cost. I think it would be helpful if the Minister could just explain how he thinks these orders would work and how he thinks the interaction uh, with the existing rules the courts can have on capping costs are there. Because it's, it's not entirely a theoretical issue. I mean, we, we have seen previous examples where the Serious Fraud Office have had very significant cost orders against them. Now, I, I wouldn't like to pretend those are are very similar situations to the ones we're talking about here. And it, I think probably the incidents concerned were perhaps not the finest hour of the Serious Fraud Office. But equally, there is clearly some evidence that there is a potential that the sort of people that we're dealing with here will go to try and obtain very significant amounts of costs as a deterrent effect against the use of these orders. So it would just be useful just the Minister could just set out for the House if he thinks the courts can and should use various cost-capping measures to make sure that we're not unreasonably exposed to very high levels of cost. Did Arkless. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I rise very briefly um, to talk about what, if I may admit, is probably my favourite section of the bill, and that's unexplained wealth orders. I think it is um, an excellent provision and ought to drive a Trojan horse right through the assets of criminals who choose to lodge them and deposit them in the UK, and I think it's very welcome. And I think the points made by my honourable friend, the member for Amber Valley, in relation to new Clause 5 are very valid points. And I think indemnity costs, as is described in new clause 5 can be easily translated to mean in layman's term full costs. In other words, every single hour and penny and expense on that file will be charged to the losing party. There's no assessment whether these costs are reasonable. And given that we're talking about politically exposed people, potentially in other jurisdictions, you can imagine the, the amount of flights going back and forth, the, the amount of officials going back and forth, all which will find their way onto a cost sheet and all which will be recoverable to the penny in indemnity costs. Um, we could end up with a situation where we have an inequality of arms, not in favour of the government, but of the respondents in these situations, and I think that's very dangerous. And I think the threat of indemnity costs acts as a major litigation risk for the claimant or pursuer or the applicant in this case. And if they know um, they're likely to be in for a bigger bill, it will make them think twice about making that application. And these are our law enforcement agencies we're speaking about, and I believe that they should be able to pursue these applications with determination, without fear or without favour and without risk of incurring indemnity costs, which seem to me would be deeply <coughs> disproportionate from what they're trying to do. And I think it would be a very bizarre and counterproductive situation to go in. So I thank the member for Amber Valley for making this probing amendment, and I'll be very pleased to hear what the government has to say. But I think it is worth mentioning, as a, a boring pedantic lawyer, that indemnity costs are very rare and arguably it would only arise in proportionate circumstances anyway. However, given that we are talking about politically exposed people with um, potentially limitless funds, then the better you can make your case in court, the more likely it is that you could be awarded indemnity costs if you're successful. I think we should take that risk out of the equation. 
Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, as I have said, unexplained wealth orders I think, are an excellent provision within this bill, and I think it is worth explaining exactly how they would work at this juncture. The bill will enable a court in Scotland, the Court of Session, upon application by Scottish Ministers, to make an unexplained wealth order. The order will require an individual or organisation to explain the origin of their assets if there are reasonable grounds for suspecting that they may have been involved in criminality or they intend to use that wealth for criminality and if the value of the assets exceeds £100,000. The Minister and I have had discussions in previous stages of this bill about the threshold for £100,000 and I would be pleased if he could update me as to his thoughts on that threshold. I would be delighted to go. Um, can I thank the Honourable Member? Just to give him an update on that point, uh, in response to the issue and sensible suggestions he's made, we are looking at options to bring forward in the other place uh, a potentially lower threshold. Uh, we will inform him, obviously, when uh, that has been agreed cross government. Well, it's uh, very congenial and very cooperative from the Minister, and I, I, I very much pr um, appreciate that. Um, Perhaps I don't have the confidence in the other place that he has, but we'll wait with <laughs> bated breath. Um, this order, um, unexplained wealth orders, will be available to the court where assets appear disproportionate to known legitimate income. For example, and as recently reported, um, where a taxi driver, for instance, owns a £1 million fish tank. Um, not to say that it's not a potentially lucrative trade, but certainly that would be disproportionate. Um, failure to provide a response to the order and explain the legitimate source of funds would give rise to a presumption that the property was recoverable, um, which would make any subsequent <coughs> civil recovery action much easier. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, as a lawyer, the notion of reversing the burden of proof is not one that sits automatically very comfortably with me, but, as in other areas, I consider it proportional to the issue at stake. Sound legal principles such as the presumption of innocence and the burden of proof being on the Crown should not inadvertently protect criminals which I suspect may have been the case thus far. Um, the key to this provision is that criminal conviction will no longer be necessary before law enforcement can pierce the criminal's veil that camouflages their wealth. Getting away with the crime itself no longer will protect a criminal's wealth. This bill will allow for this power to be applied to foreign politicians and officials or those associated with them, known as politically exposed people, helping to tackle the issue um, substantively and determinately for the first time. I'd just like to um, corroborate and stress that I agree with some of the comments from the Labour front bench in relation to resources. Um, it, part of the reason that we are bringing forward provisions for unexplained wealth orders is that many law enforcement agencies think there is a raft of these applications ready to be made right now. There are properties and asset groups and accumulations in this country that we don't know where they come from. So, uh, assuming that this, this, this Act receives royal assent, this power will land on the desk of law enforcement agencies that potentially have applications piled up. And I think resources in those circumstances is a very, very viable concern. So I would stress if the Minister could please give us some reassurance, which unfortunately he's not been able to give thus far during the process of this bill, that there will be allocations sufficient enough to make unexplained wealth orders work, because it is probably the best part of this bill and it needs to work. And if it does work, we will make huge strides in making sure that this country cannot be used as a safe haven for dirty money. Ben Wallace. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, this has been obviously a helpful and short part of the proceedings today, uh, and I am pleased that members from all sides of the House agree in principle to the concept of the unexplained wealth order. I think it is going to be an incredibly useful tool. Uh, and indeed, if we think about the first uh, group of amendments we had, in fact, another tool you could use to ask people to explain where their wealth came from, uh, even if you perhaps didn't have the evidence or the intelligence linking them to uh, the new offence that we uh, are seeking to bring in on gross human rights abuse. Because I think it is very clear that uh, using an unexplained wealth order, putting the onus on those individuals to tell us where they have got their wealth from, is going to be a strong and good step in clearing up the United Kingdom uh, from uh, those people that seek to harbour their ill-gotten gains uh, in the UK. But also, we shouldn't forget, it's about criminals within the UK also uh, depositing or washing their wealth uh, and putting it uh, el elsewhere or, or within the community where they can they hide in plain sight sometimes. And I think that is uh, something that I am very, very keen uh, and uh, 
You know, what I'm going to say now is no different than what I have said to the National Crime Agency. I would like to see this used sooner rather than later. Uh, I think the lesson I have learned in my 12 years in Parliament is that if offences, we always get lobbied for new offences, uh, they come along, lots of people come and lobby us, there's always a, uh, 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 either a Home Office Bill or a Ministry of Justice Bill going through this House. Uh, if they're not used sooner rather than later, uh, my experience is a lot of these offences just sit on shelves and I think it's really, really important that the law enforcement agencies hear Parliament today say you know, we're going to hopefully give you these powers. We want them to be used. I, I, th thank you for taking the intervention. I, I know it's very difficult to pin down, but given that we want to start using these orders immediately, then resource is a key issue here. Um, I know it's very difficult to put a price on it, Madam Deputy Speaker, but has there been any assessment made within government about what this is going to cost in the next two to three months after Royal Assent, because there's a lot of applications ready to be made and we need the resources to make them? Well, I... I think what I can reassure the Honourable Member and the Honourable Lady uh, for Swansea East that uh, the one part of the government that has seen uh, either a not significant reduction in its budgets has been in the areas of things like the regional organised crime units, the national crime agencies, the security and intelligence agencies who do assist us in areas of organised crime and money laundering. Uh, um, if I were to say that the uh, national crime agency uh, has a Capital budget 50 million this year with 427 million. They are supported in England by the regional, uh, England and Wales, the regional organised crime units, who have also got 519 million uh, of funding. The SFO is 45 million with 5 million pounds capital uh, this year. And the HMRC is 3.8 billion in resource and 242 million pounds in capital. Uh, of course, uh, we, you know, uh, crime fighting. Uh, is as much as, you know, how long is a piece of string? Yeah. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way. I'm listening intently to what he's saying, and I'm reminded of an Evening Standard report uh, from, hang on, earlier this year, I think, 2017. I, I wonder if he's seen this one. Home Office reveals that new criminal finances bill will target just 20 tycoons a year. And this is based on the Home Office's own impact assessment. It predicts that power will remain, that the these powers will remain unused in the first year as part of a learning curve, quote unquote, and thereafter will only be used in 20 cases a year. And that's because of the resource implications, precisely what the member for Dumfries and Galloway raised. I just wondered if he had any comment on that. Well, I think the impact assessment is not linked to access to funds. I think the, the impact assessment is a judgment about how they would see these being used. Now, Probably like her, I'd like to see them used an awful lot more. Uh, but that is an impact assessment. It doesn't necessarily mean that the NCA doesn't follow the impact assessment. If the evidence is presented or the cases are put before them that allows them to do 100, then they will do 100. It's not a, it's not a, they're not restricted by the impact assessment. And I think I, think I wouldn't uh, be too distracted by the London Evening Standard uh, and the... Uh, uh, impact assessment. I think what I would be focusing on is the fact that we have well resourced our law enforcement agencies to, to tackle this. This bill will give them the power. They have the political support of both sides of the House to exercise that power. And I think, you know, let's see uh, uh, how far we go. But um, I will be delighted to join with her asking in 12 months' time or whenever the bill goes through why we haven't used them more. I will be asking the National Crime Agency and all the other organisations uh, to try and make sure uh, that they have uh, that. And the Honourable Member for Swansea East did make the point about the ARIS funding, the, the recovery of assets, uh, uh, not really being uh, um, worth the paper printed upon, I suppose, which you were trying to say, and, and forgive me for putting words in your mouth. But since 2006, and, and, and it was... Uh, what we have seen, and it was under her, her last government, that arrangement, £764 million has gone into funding uh, those law enforcement agencies, uh, and in the last three years, £257 million. So hopefully with the new arrangement that has, I have said that uh, above the baseline, I think, of £146 million, I'll, I'll, I'll correct it in writing if it's not £146, uh, 100% will be kept. Uh, and uh, we are also... Uh, uh, 
following on from those excellent reports, the Home Affairs Committee report and the PAC report, into uh, why we have not achieved enough of confiscation orders and recovery of assets. Uh, I have told officials I am particularly concerned that in one of those reports the focus seemed to be on small assets. People, you know, the collection rate was higher amongst lower amounts of money, but the millionaires, the collection rate was lower. And I have specifically directed officials that we look at turning the tables. I mean, I want all assets collected that are subject to confiscation. But those reports are a good guideline, uh, and we didn't ignore that report, and we will certainly make sure uh, we build on that and improve on it, because uh, there's money in it for us all, should we, should, should we do it, and I, I am uh, very keen uh, to do that. Uh, as to the two clauses, new clause 5 from my honourable friend for Amber Valley. It obviously, as he said, seeks to prevent the courts from awarding uncapped costs against informers and agencies where they have brought unsuccessful applications for unexplained wealth orders or related interim freezing orders. I appreciate that this is to ensure the law enforcement agencies do not feel constrained in their ability to apply for unexplained wealth order for fear of incurring financial liability. But as law enforcement representatives told the Public Bill Committee in November, this is a natural part of the State wielding its investigative powers, and they are certainly not pressing for the provision uh, of this type. It is well-established principle that the losing party pays the winning party's legal costs. This is an important check and balance on parties bringing spurious claims or the State using its powers erroneously. At the same time, the civil procedure rules do already allow for capping in exceptional circumstances. So law enforcement agencies would be able, as things stand, to apply for a cost capping order in appropriate cases. And I undertake to ensure that this point is included in the code of practice that will support the use of these orders. And I trust that honourable members will agree this is a far more sensible way forward than a blanket rule for all unexplained wealth order cases. It is crucial that the, that the initial cases are thoroughly developed to ensure the orders have the greatest possible impact. We are already actively engaging uh, with law enforcement officers and prosecutors to encourage the use of the new powers being introduced by the Bill, and ultimately will be a, a matter for those authorities to decide when. But we will, no doubt so will Her Majesty's Lord uh, Opposition, we will monitor and review the use of these orders once they have been introduced. This will inform future support or changes that may be needed to ensure that they are being used to maximum effect. The Honourable Member for Swansea East on the front bench explained the objective behind her Amendment 1. However, I explained when the issue arose in committee, politically exposed persons in the United Kingdom and the European Economic Area can, in fact, already be made subject to unexplained wealth order. This is in relation to the, the opposition's Amendment 1. These orders can be made in two situations. First, where an individual is suspected of involvement in serious crime, and second, in relation to non-EEA politically exposed persons. So unexplained wealth order can be made in relation to politicians and senior officials in Europe where they are suspected of being involved in serious criminality. In such an investigation, if evidence exists of links to serious organised crime, it should, be it should be available, obtainable and readily provided, and it would be unreasonable and disproportionate, for example, for members of this House to be made subject to an order without any evidence of criminality. However, the investigation into grand corruption involving countries outside of Europe, including the developing world, that evidence is far less likely to be made available. We think it would be much harder in some of these countries where corruption is endemic to necessarily get the evidence to bring to the court uh, at first uh, about uh, wealth hidden in London. And therefore, that is why we have chosen to have a lower threshold for evidence when it is applied to those countries outside the EEA. Uh, and I think we shouldn't forget that unexplained wealth orders are a process leading to, eventually, should they not be able to satisfy the answers, another action at court to confiscate the assets. So an unexplained wealth order is part of a process, it's not an end in itself. And I, I, when I spoke to uh, the Right Honourable uh, Lady from Hackney when we uh, met about it, I do not want unexplained wealth orders to also produce a whole load of derelict empty buildings sitting around London that's no good for anyone uh, caught up in legal dispute. I want these unexplained wealth orders to be used, to be placed on people that we have links to serious crime to, 
uh, and then should they not be able to fulfil or satisfy the court, that we then go to the next step and recover that asset so that the housing market or the houses are freed up, the money is returned to whoever it's been stolen from, if it's a state or a country or other people, uh, and we can do it. So it is, it is a step on the process. It is not an uh, end in itself. So I hope that I have sufficiently reassured the House on these points and that maybe uh, the Opposition will feel inclined to withdraw their amendment. The question is that Government New Clause 8 be read a second time. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that New Clause 8 be added to the Bill. As many as are of that opinion say aye. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Of the contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. We begin with new clause two, with which it will be convenient to consider the new clauses grouped together on the selection paper. Sir Edward Garnier to move new clause two. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, thank you very much indeed. Um, I can be relatively brief, I think, in introducing uh, this uh, line of amendments and new clauses. Uh, in, <coughs> in moving new clause two, which stands in my name, and of a number of honourable ladies and gentlemen on both sides of the House, uh, which mirror uh, other new clauses, new clause 3, 4, 14 and 15. Uh, I really want to introduce a debate about uh, the future of corporate criminal liability in this jurisdiction. Uh, my Lord, uh, my Lord, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's only a matter of time, I'm sure. Um, in, um, the in, the, first, in the last uh, few years, I have, and I immediately declare an interest, I have been instructed by the Serious Fraud Office in a number of cases which have involved the prosecution <coughs> of uh, large international companies. And uh, one of the problems that I think that prosecutors and, and no doubt investigators uh, generally have found in this jurisdiction when dealing with the modern a corporate landscape, to use that hideous jargon, it is in trying to fix upon a company which is suspected of criminal activity uh, uh, liability for that uh, as a matter of uh, criminal law. It's not difficult uh, to uh, fix criminal liability if the evidence is there on an individual. Uh, the person either did or did not do it and either did or did not have the uh, necessary criminal intent. Uh, but in order under current English law to fix criminal liability on a corporation, one has to make uh, or one has to resort to what is called the identification principle, which means that you have to uh, find someone of sufficient seniority within the corporation uh, who can act as or can be described as the directing mind of the company and through that identified person you, you can then uh, move on to fix criminal liability on the corporation itself. Now that was fine in the Victorian era when most companies had one or two directors. Uh, well, I can use the example of a, of, of a small uh, business in a, in, a, in a market town in the 1860s or 70s or 80s. Two or three uh, men, and it always was men in those days, who owned and directed the company. Uh, a fraud was committed by the company or on behalf of the company it was, and it was perfectly easy to uh, find the directing mind of the company in, those, uh, in that small group of directors. But as the Industrial Revolution and corporate legal development uh, proceeded during the late 19th century and early 20th century, uh, it became clear that companies were getting bigger and uh, international trade was meaning that companies based in this country uh, had uh, offices and directing minds, if you like, in other parts of the world. Now, the United States dealt with this in 1912 when they did away uh, with the directing mind or the identification principle and uh, by uh, case law uh, developed the principle in, in criminal law that uh, a company could be vicariously liable for the criminal acts of its employees uh, on the basis that uh, they were 
conducting criminal activities for the benefit and on behalf of the company. Now, it seems to me, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, that we have reached the stage in this country, and we have reached it a, a long time ago, uh, when uh, we need to reform the way in which we look at corporate criminal liability. I think it is uh, uncontroversial to say that the identification principle, and I, I, I assume, I don't know, my, the Honourable Gentleman from Scotland will, uh, with his Scottish legal experience, will no doubt uh, inform us whether the situation is the same in Scotland as it is in England. But I think the time has come when that Victorian principle uh, is no longer apt to deal with uh, international uh, corporations. I don't pick upon this company I'm about to mention just because uh, I, I think it's committed a, a criminal offence, quite the contrary, but I just want to use it as an example of a large international company. Uh, British Telecom is a huge company. It employs hundreds of thousands of people all around the globe doing uh, various things in the telecom world, all of it entirely legitimate and beneficial both to the company and its shareholders but also to our national economy. But it must surely, as a matter of common sense, be extremely difficult nowadays to fix upon uh, an individual or small group of individuals uh, as representing the directing mind of that company uh, when uh, an offence is suspected to have been committed many miles away, a long way away from the, 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 the main board, long, uh, a long way away from the uh, headquarters of the company in London. Now, uh, as I repeat, I use British Telecom simply as an example of an, a large and international company with operations right the way around the world. Of course, it would be perfectly possible to fix upon an individual, a human being, who has committed a, an offence. And it may well be that that individual committed that offence for the benefit of uh, this international corporation. But it, unless that person is of sufficient seniority within the hierarchy of this great big international company, it's very difficult to fix criminal uh, liability for that person's offence also uh, upon the corporation. Now, as I say, in the United States for over 100 years now, they have uh, got around that by uh, using the principle of vicarious liability, which we are used to dealing with in this country in, in civil law, uh, but not in criminal law. Now, it seems to me that there are two ways we can, we can approach this, and this is the whole point of the uh, set of amendments uh, or set of new clauses that I and others have tabled. Um, first, one can use the American system of vicarious liability, and, the, and there are plenty of good arguments for that. Or secondly, one can, as we have described in our new clauses, uh, at, approach the problem by using the failure to prevent uh, regime, uh, where a company fails to prevent someone or another body associated with it from committing a specified offence, well then uh, the, the company which has failed to prevent that offence is uh, liable uh, for a criminal offence itself. We already have that on the statute book through section 7 of the Bribery Act 2010, and we are about to have it added into the uh, statute book by the existing terms or the existing provisions of, of the Criminal Finances Bill in relation to tax offences. Uh, that followed through David Cameron's uh, speech uh, at the Corruption Summit last summer at Lancaster House. Mm. But what I want to do uh, by pushing forward these new clauses is to invite Parliament, both this House and the other place, and invite the Government uh, and I'm, by that I mean not only the political government but the non-political government, the, the, the officials who uh, run the government day by day and advise on matters of policy, uh, to consider whether uh, extending the failure to prevent regime is not perhaps an easier uh, and better way uh, than uh, turning the whole thing on its head and by going wholesale across to the vicarious liability principle. Uh, there are plenty of arguments, both for and against uh, the extension of the Section 7 uh, failure to prevent bribery model. Uh, I have attended a number of uh, meetings with uh, far more experienced criminal lawyers than I am, and I see one 
sitting just two benches ahead of me, uh, uh, behind the minister. Uh, and she will know, and uh, I have come to learn over the last few years since I've taken uh, uh, an interest in uh, corporate criminal crime, that uh, there are a, a number of difficulties which are, are created by the failure to prevent model. Uh, some of those, and I won't uh, rehearse them now, but some of those are, are set out in the Ministry of Justice's uh, call for evidence paper, which was published on Friday the 13th of February, in which they set out uh, five options uh, to uh, look at this failure to prevent uh, regime. Uh, I personally uh, favour uh, the failure to prevent model uh, as compared to the vicarious uh, liability model because it's, uh, as I say, already uh, set within our system, albeit that uh, by these new clauses we are not um, extending the principle, but we're merely extending the ambit of the offences, the criminal offences, uh, which come within or could come within the failure to prevent system. Uh, as I say, uh, it, it's, these provisions uh, are not going to be brought into this bill because I think it's highly unlikely that the government would accept uh, any of them, albeit that they may nod politely at them, at a time when the Ministry of Justice's call for evidence uh, process is still open. But I do hope that the government uh, will look carefully at the shape and the uh, design of our new clauses with a view to considering and considering very vigorously uh, whether what we have proposed as a matter of principle uh, is uh, worthy of uh, greater thought. Now, in New Clause 2, uh, I and my honourable friends and uh, other honourable members of this House uh, intend that we should create a corporate offence of failing to prevent economic crime defined by reference to the offences listed in Part 2 of Schedule 17 of the Crime and Courts Act 2013. Again, I'll do my best to be brief. But uh, that schedule of that Act uh, brought in uh, the Deferred Prosecution Agreement system of dealing with errant companies. I declare an interest with a capital I, and I declare an interest with a small I uh, in Deferred Prosecution Agreements in in that I've been instructed by the Serious Fraud Office in two of the three deferred prosecution agreements which have so far taken place. But also when I was uh, Solicitor General, I brought this uh, system into, into law, at least I began it before I got the sack. Uh, I, uh, there is a, a cloud in every silver lining, isn't there? Uh, yeah, very, uh, few in this very few. Very few. Very, very few. Very few. But anyhow, yeah, I'm, I'm diverting myself because I, I deliberately said cloud in every silver lining and not a silver lining in every cloud. Um, but the, sh the short point about this is that uh, there are a certain number of offences set out in, uh, in the schedule to the 2013 Act, about 50 or so uh, economic or financial criminal offences, which are available to be dealt with. Uh, by deferred prosecution agreements between either the Crime Prosecution Service or the Serious Fraud Office on the one hand and corporations, uh, uh, that's to say respondents or defendants who are not human beings, on the other. And, and those criminal offences, it seems to me, are perfectly uh, capable of being moved across into the failure to prevent regime. Uh, as I say, Section 7 of the Bribery, Bribery Act uh, makes it an offence to fail to prevent bribery. We're about to have uh, a, a failure to prevent a tax offence. Well, why not, I ask, uh, on this occasion rhetorically, uh, why not e extend the failure to prevent regime uh, across uh, to these other offences? New Clause 3 uh, does exactly the same, save that it limits uh, the uh, offences to those set out in Sub Clause 2. Uh, and uh, then one sees at new clause, new clause 4, and then in uh, New Clause 14 and 15, uh, provisions uh, put forward by the Honourable Lady for Newcastle, uh, which broadly uh, speak to the, the same issue that I am uh, uh, discussing in relation to the uh, new clauses that I, my name leads. Broadly, therefore, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, 
I'm not going to push these uh, new clauses or, or the lead new clause to a division. Uh, these are probing amendments. They are amendments designed to create a public discussion. Uh, and I hope they will inform the Ministry of Justice's um, discussion paper. But I hope also uh, they will encourage uh, the Home Office and uh, the Minister on the bench, with whom I've had some very useful discussions about this and other matters to do with this bill, uh, to consider very carefully and positively uh, the extension of the failure to prevent regime. I know that uh, the wheels of Whitehall move extremely slowly. Everyone has to be consulted nowadays, and nobody's allowed to have an idea of their own without it being beaten up and pushed through the roller by every other department who thinks it's got uh, an interest or half an interest in everything uh, uh, that uh, somebody else uh, wants to do. Uh, you should try uh, producing uh, a piece of uh, legislation as a law officer. Law officers aren't supposed to have any policies. They're simply supposed to sit in a cupboard, get cupboard doors open, they're asked what the answer is, and then the cupboard is shut with them inside. Uh, uh, well, fortunately, uh, I was able to bring forward uh, deferred prosecution agreements. Uh, I hope, as a very much ex-law officer, I will encourage this government uh, to take a, a positive view of these, uh, the principles behind these new clauses. Not just because I want to do it, but also because I think it's an efficient and effective way of uh, assisting the Serious Fraud Office, one of the most valuable and effective prosecution agencies uh, in the Western yeah, world, yeah, yeah. Uh, to do oh, its yeah. job in ensuring that not just bad people, but bad companies are brought to justice. So, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I hope to hear positive things from my honourable uh, friend, the Minister, uh, from whom I have never heard anything other than positive things in the past. <laughs> Failure to prevent an economic criminal offence. The question is that new clause to be read a second time. Roger Mullin. Uh, Madam yeah. Deputy <coughs> Speaker, I would uh, wish to start by thanking the Minister and thanking the Government to responding to a campaign which I have been involved in for about a year in relation to Scottish Limited Partnerships. And I think we are all very grateful that very recently the Government have now announced that they are going to conduct a review of them. Hence the regular amendment that I have been laying down for the last year in different uh, uh, bills is no longer necessary. However, I find myself having to move a different new clause. And I will explain why, and I will explain why it troubles me greatly that I am forced to do so in a moment. But first, for those members of the House that are unfamiliar, why have uh, myself and my colleagues been so concerned about these things called Scottish Limited Partnerships? They do remarkable reputational damage mm. to Scotland, mm. uh, uh, and I would argue probably to the United Kingdom's financial sector. Mm. They are a front for some of the worst international crime, money laundering, mm -hmm. hiding of criminal assets to be found. Without going into great detail of how to manage to do this, it might nonetheless interest the House to know just one or two of the mm. types of crimes that they have been used for. SLPs have been at the centre of the cases of Ukrainian arms deals mm. and kickbacks, at the centre of a major Moldovan mm. banks fraud. They have been at the heart of a major corruption scandal in Latvia involving the, the nephew of Uzbekistan's President Islam Karimov. They have been running international mail frauds, including, for example, a French psychic who has been targeting vulnerable early people, offering spiritual insights for significant amounts of cash. They have been involved and are involved centrally in a $1 billion copyright infringement case currently taking place in the United States. They have been involved with some of the criminal activities setting up paedophile sites and raising money through such horrible activities, and so on and so on. Billions of pounds of criminal money has been able to utilise SLPs and to some extent other limited partnerships as a way of hiding them. And very often this money, of course, does not necessarily come here. 
We find it in tax havens, where using, however, the legitimation mm. of an apparent UK limited partnership or a Scottish limited partnership as a means for them hiding who are the beneficiaries of such criminal activity. So for those reasons, I was particularly grateful that uh, the Security Minister uh, uh, has been willing to speak seriously about this, has been the Minister, I think, who has done more than any other in the Government to move the Government to respond to some of our concerns. Why then am I moving a new, no, new clause? I'm moving a new clause because SLPs and limited partnerships are based in a 1907 Act that few people are probably aware of, which amended the 1890 Companies Act, which even fewer people are aware of. I find just a few weeks ago, by some chance, I sit on the, the Regulatory Reform Select Committee of this House. It is such a popular committee that I, met, uh, I joined it in January of last year, and it had its second meeting in December. And why did we have a second meeting in December? Because we were told the Treasury were bringing forward wow. a legislative reform order. Wow. And what was this legislative reform order for? At the same time as the government have announced a much welcome review of limited partnerships, the Treasury are seeking to create a new form of limited partnership called private funds limited partnerships. Oh. Not by bringing it to the floor of this House, but by using a device which is supposed to be used <coughs> only for non-controversial matters oh, of legislative reform. Oh, I could hardly think in anything more controversial than a mechanism that has been used for international criminal assets and money laundering. But there are even greater concerns about this. When you look at the detail of what the Treasury are bringing forward, and I'm having to leave this debate in about an hour to attend this Regulatory Reform Committee meeting to take evidence on it, we find yeah, I, sorry, the cries from a sedentary position of jealous. Yes, well, I'm sure you're not. The, there are four areas that even SLPs have to be, uh, uh, comply with that these new private funds limited partnerships do not need to comply with. For example, the jurisdiction in which the general partners are registered no longer need to be divulged. No, really? Yep. The registration numbers of the general partners no longer need to be divulged. Why? The jurisdiction in which the limited partners are registered no longer need to be divulged. And the registration number of the limited partners, if they are corporations, no longer needs to be divulged. So not only are we creating a new form of limited partnerships, but it is with considerably less regulation than the existing ones which have been a front for international criminality. Hence, and since I have got such great faith in the Security Minister, that what our new clause asks is that the Home Office should be required to conduct a review yeah. before the Treasury brings forward any resolutions to create any new forms of limited partnership to ensure that they are not going to be subject to the type of criminal abuse and illegality that we have found with Scottish limited partnerships. I think there is a broader question here too to be answered, and that is why is this government using a device such as legislative reform orders to try and quickly get through the establishment of something in such a controversial area. Surely this is something that the floor of this House should be able to fully and properly debate. And that is why on the committee I am going to shortly, I will certainly not be agreeing to progress being made in that committee, doing my best to require that this is a matter 
that is brought back to the floor of this House to receive proper and urgent scrutiny. In the light of these arguments, Madam Deputy Speaker, I move Clause 10. Very good. Hydro Mills. To the new clauses uh, that my hon. Fellow Member for Harbour spoke, and also to new clause 6, which is a bit <laughs> premature since it has not been formally moved yet. Um, speaking to the um, first set of clauses that uh, my honourable friend tabled and then the, the ones that the honourable lady who co-chairs the APPG on anti-corruption also tabled on failure to prevent economic crime. I, I, I think the, the arguments were well made by the previous speaker who knows far more about these things than I do. I, I, I just want to perhaps reinforce the point that there is a, a strong feeling out there amongst the public that where we've seen very large companies uh, be part of some very, very serious criminal activity. And people are very confused as to why those companies and very senior people amongst them have not been prosecuted for those very serious offences that are being committed when they look across the Atlantic and see over there that they do manage to prosecute very senior bankers for those offences. And they think, well, you know, we see all our banks being fined in America for being guilty of rigging various markets. And yet, why is no senior directors of those companies being prosecuted here? Why are those banks not being prosecuted? And I, I, I think it exposes the fact that our law, as was explained, has become out of date. And it, it does seem rather horribly unfair that the serious full office find it much easier to prosecute directors and companies where they are very small companies. It's very clear who the controlling <coughs> minds are. But when you see far more serious offences being committed by or on behalf of or for the benefit of much larger companies, we actually can't quite find enough evidence to prosecute those companies themselves or the very senior directors of them because we can't quite... Well, Would you not also accept that in the, the US uh, context there's also a, often a political element, uh, um, despite the, uh, um, the division of power there, but a political element from a prosecutor uh, who often uh, will be looking to make a name for himself um, taking on a big bank, often it has to be said a big non-US bank, um, and it is a, a particular concern, that, uh, not just in the banking world, but beyond that, that uh, prosecutions tend to be uh, a fair game as far as uh, overseas companies are concerned. So it's actually a rather different regime which may not necessarily point to a desire and a need for a change in UK law. I'm grateful. I, I, I think I agree with his point that it's, it's certainly of interest um, the where the ownership of the large banks that they choose to prosecute in the States and other large companies seems to favour internationally owned ones rather than uh, US situations. And I think I'm, I'm sure the Foreign Office are very in, in touch with trying to work out whether that is actually an unfair anti-competitive move by the US. So I, I think he's right that we shouldn't try and read too much across from the US system into ours. I was trying to make the point that I think people out there are confused as to why people can be prosecuted over there but aren't prosecuted over here. And I, I, I think it just comes back to the point I was trying to make that it, it does seem unfair that we can prosecute directors of small businesses, but we can't do that when we see much more serious offences from large businesses. And so I, I, I think that's why I would support extending the model of the failure to prevent that we already have in place for bribery and we're adding for tax evasion to those other very serious economic crimes that we're talking about. And I, I, I think it's, it, it's hard to make a distinction, actually, for why we would rank some of those offences as being less important or less serious, and therefore we're not trying to take the power to prosecute failure <coughs> to prevent serious frauds, for example. And that's why I, I do welcome the government's consultation on these issues. I, I think it probably has to be right that now we're consulting, it will probably be somewhat premature to legislate before we, do the, before we get the outcome of the consultation. That might make a bit of a mockery of the idea of consulting. But I just think it's a bit of a a real pity that we have this bill, the ideal vehicle to make this change, but because of the timing we can't actually make the change that we think we ought to see, and then we're relying on there being another uh, relevant piece of legislation coming up later in this Parliament, hopefully, that can actually f uh, finally make that change. So perhaps it would be, as the member for Harbour said, hopefully the Minister could just make some encouraging noises about how serious the Government do take these matters and when we might expect, following the consultation, to actually see some progress if the Government were minded to proceed with these offences. But on a, it's a bit of a leap to get to new clause 6 from, from, from the same topic. It's an interesting a grouping that perhaps we have here. But I, I, I think um, I, I think probably should say by I, I think I've 
I thought I was supporting government policy uh, for quite a long while uh, by uh, supporting, uh, encouraging our overseas territories and crown dependencies to adopt the same level of transparency on beneficial ownership that we're in the process of putting in place here. And I think the previous Prime Minister was absolutely right in his efforts to get those territories and dependencies to agree to have those transparent registers. And, and yes, of course, I think we all welcome the fact that those territories have moved a, a fair way in agreeing to have the registers in the first place and to have reliable information who the beneficial owners are of companies that operate in their territories. And I think we all congratulate them on, on doing that and we look forward to those being in place. And we all recognise that will be a great step forward in various law enforcement authorities to be able to get that information on a relatively speedy basis to uh, help prosecutions here. But I think that just doesn't quite go far enough, and I think we recognise it doesn't go far enough by wanting to have a transparent register here. And the Minister in the first group we talked about today perhaps made the case quite strongly that um, he thought the attraction for coming to the UK to operate a business was the rule of law and a favourable tax regime. I, I suspect those are the main advantages all our overseas uh, uh, territories have that people go there and establish these various companies and trusts and whatever because they recognise those territories have strong rule of law based on our rule of law and they have the favourable tax treatment that they want. I think what we're trying to say with this amendment is actually those territories can quite rightly market themselves as being advantageous places to do business because they do have stable rule of law, they do have the right tax treatment. But what we don't want them to market themselves as, we don't want them to be used for, is ways of hiding a dirty money and being a way around the rules that perhaps we're putting in place and other countries around the world will have. And what we're trying to say is actually we want them to serve the same levels of transparency that we have. And when the, those territories come and lobby and say, yes, but we don't need to do that, and if we do that in advance of Delaware or Panama or wherever else, we'll just move all these people elsewhere and it'll make our business model inviable. What they always seem to say is, we don't want dirty money in our territory. We don't want corrupt money. We don't want criminal money. We take action if we spot that. To which I can never quite get the, uh, the reason why they're so opposed to having a transparent register. If these people aren't operating in those territories, if they're not using entities in those territories, why are they so concerned about having a transparent register which shows that they're not, so we can all see that they're not? Uh, and it just leaves that suspicion that they kind of might be getting a bit of money coming through there that perhaps ought not to be going there. I, I, I think it would be greatly to the advantage of the reputation of those territories and of the UK as a whole to have this transparency in place. And that's why I, I think the efforts that the Vital Member for for Barking has gone to in drafting new Clause 6 to try and get it in, into order. I mean, it, it clearly wouldn't be right for this House to legislate uh, for all those territories. I think those uh, days passed a few decades ago. But I, I think he's clearly right for us to send out a strong message which says there are many advantages to being one of our Crown dependencies or overseas territories. Uh, but, they, but those advantages come with some obligations. And one of those is we want them to be beacons for the right way of doing business, for the right way of investing, for attracting the right kind of money. And so we're saying that over this period of a couple more years, we want you to get to having those transparent registers. We don't want to destroy your business model. We don't want to destroy your national income, but we want it to be clear that what you're taking is clean, legitimate money. Uh, and there should be no reason for people who are doing that to want to hide. Indeed, if any of those territories are acting as a conduit to get money into the UK, we'll know who the beneficial owner is because we're going to be published here. So one of the main advantages that they have uh, is probably no argument against this. But the reason why I feel quite strongly on this is, is actually where there become stories about money being hidden in these territories, it actually affects us as well. I was in Tajikistan on a um, parliamentary visit, and one thing that's thrown at us there is there's been a very effective toll road built between the two main cities. The only problem is the revenue from the tolls on that road end up in a, a BVI company. Nobody quite knows who owns that company, but let's just say it's owned in a way that it's unlikely the Tajik authorities are going to be scrutinising it too hard. And people just say, well, it's you, it's the UK are allowing our toll money that we're paying to be stolen and siphoned off into one of these strange territories. Now, that may or may not be true. I will. Well, he's making a, a, a strong and powerful case, but does he not recognise there's also a distinction between privacy and uh, secrecy. No one wants to have an entirely secret element, but most people who indulge in banking, whether in uh, an overseas territory or indeed anywhere, 
do expect a certain amount of privacy. There is no question that we would expect law enforcement, um, that we would expect uh, the, the police, that we would expect the tax authorities to have access to these registers. But the notion, and I think he has been very fair in making a point, that ultimately a lot of these issues should be constitutional <coughs> issues for those uh, territories themselves and we should be imposed upon by the UK. But the notion uh, that, um, that, 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 because, that uh, beyond those t uh, 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 authorities having access, uh, which would apply, I think, to, this, to, to his Tajikistan example as well, um, that it should be just open for anyone necessarily to have access to that. Surely um, you could understand there is a reluctance, uh, particularly in the globalised financial world that we live in, for that to happen, particularly Elijah if it doesn't Mills. apply elsewhere. Thank you. I, 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 I accept the argument on privacy is, is made a lot, and I I'm sure the argument is made in the UK concept as well, but we have taken the decision that we want to see transparent registers so we know who the ultimate beneficial owner of, of these entities are. I, I, I think if you think through the scenarios when people have that right to privacy, I can perhaps see if there was a real issue with individual safety that there may, not, that, that, that there may be a good reason not to publish in that situation. But I, I, I struggle to find many other situations where there's a good argument for people being able to establish entities or other bodies in these overseas territories uh, and not have that become clear who the f ultimate owner is. Um, because, frankly, if you, if you own a company here, if you're a shareholder, y it has to be public who the shareholders are. If you're going to have any kind of entity here, that transparency will exist. So I'm, I'm not quite sure why, for our dependencies, there's somehow a different argument that, uh, that ought to apply. So I, I, I just think weighing up the, the balance of the right to privacy with the right to ensure we're not letting dirty, corrupt criminal money get into the system. I think we have to err on that side of the right. equation. That's it. Over. I'm grateful to my honourable friend, but just in reflection of his, the example that he has used about the toll road in Kazakhstan, I think it was Kazakhstan, um, because of where we are now with the commitment to central registers, uh, and automatic access of our law enforcement agencies to those registers in those countries, such as the BVI he uses. Uh, his example would be able to be now investigated. It would be able to be potentially tracked down and offend. And because of the offence in this bill about uh, if you are encouraging tax evasion even in another country, and I would guess that people siphoning off toll money aren't paying taxes in Kazakhstan, uh, then you could, uh, we could take some action against that if the BVI bank had a British nexus here. So we are a long way now about tackling that type of uh, crime because of this bill and because of where we've got to since David Cameron's summit. Grateful for, for those points, but I, uh, I, mean, I should be careful using one example. That may be a, there may be very good commercial reasons for that. It may just be a, a rumour from that country. So we, we should be careful on one example. But I, I think what that does highlight is is actually, are there sufficient resources in the various law enforcement bodies here or in other places to actually pursue inquiries through the whole labyrinth of corporate structures that tends to be involved in the most complex money laundering or corruption situations? Uh, and I think the advantage of having transparency, and uh, probably the, the reason why, one of the reasons why we've chosen to do it here, is it puts into the public domain the information for various NGOs or other bodies to go and do some of that initial investigation and try and put together the corporate chains, put together the links, break the corporate vows and work out actually where this money is coming from and where it's got to. And I'm just a little sceptical that we're ever going to have the resources in actual law enforcement bodies to actually start that process in the vast majority of those cases. But if we can get the information in the public domain and give people the chance to trace it all the way through and find it, then that information can come forward and then be used by the law enforcement bodies. And I think that's what we're trying to achieve here. We're trying to actually enable that to make it much harder to hide this money through a complex structure going through multiple territories and whatever, how many trusts and different entities that they, that they get to. And I, I just suspect that it, while it's entirely right and welcome that law enforcement bodies will actually have the access on a timely basis to information, I, so that, that won't be enough to do the full tackling of this scourge that we'd like to see. And that is why I, I do support the the efforts gone to in new clause six to find a way of us sending a very strong signal to our territories that we do want to see transparent registers happen. We think that's the right thing, that's the right direction for travel for these regimes. And we want to see our territories taking a lead and not actually waiting for 
uh, uh, do it first. Let's set an example. Let's move first and not wait for the herd. Caroline. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member for Amber Valley. Um, I almost feel like sitting down and not making my speech now, but I will, uh, because he made such excellent points about why uh, public registers of beneficial ownership in our overseas territories is so important. And uh, I, I look forward to working with him on this and public country-by-country country reporting, and along with the many other colleagues across the House from eight political parties who are supporting new Clause 6, and a number of Conservative MPs who, despite some government pressure, are supporting this clause today, in particular the former International Development Secretary, the Right Honourable Member for Sutton Coalfield, who I, hope, I understand hopes to catch your eye, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'd also like to pay tribute to the hard work of my friend, the Right Honourable Member for Barking, who has done such important work on this important amendment, and I'm really sorry, and she's really sorry. Uh, that she couldn't be here today to speak in this debate. And I hope, Madam Speaker, you will not mind me dubbing new Clause 6 as the Hodge Amendment on yeah, this occasion. Yeah. I do welcome the Government's Criminal Finances Bill. Its aims of tackling corruption, tax evasion and terrorist financing are really, really important and should be commended. However, the absence of any mention of those, the overseas territories I do find remarkable. As Christian Aid has said, the number one thing the government could do to tackle corruption, money laundering, tax evasion, would be to ensure transparency in its overseas territories. The secrecy that they trade in, unfortunately, facilitates the very corruption, the aggressive tax avoidance and tax evasion we're all trying to stamp out. The amendment is supported by the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Responsible Tax, the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Anti-Corruption, Christian Aid, as I've mentioned, Global Witness, Transparency International, Action Aid, Publish What You Pay UK, Save the Children, Oxfam and many others. And we all know from numerous polls that this is something the British public really cares about. Two-thirds of them want government to insist on public registers of beneficial ownership in the overseas territories. Yeah, yeah. Now, as the Honourable Member for Amber Valley mentioned, this amendment has responded to concerns raised earlier at different points of debate on this bill. We are focusing purely on the overseas territories where the constitutional issues are more clear-cut, and also we recognise that the overseas territories are making steps towards private registers of beneficial, beneficial ownership. So we have allowed, I believe, a generous timeline for them to move from this to make these registers publicly accessible. The overseas territories need to have these private registers in place by June of this year. Now, this amendment would give them another two and a half years after this to simply make these private registers public. That would be within the lifetime of this parliament and I think would be an, a major step forward. Yeah. Now, the amendment is important for us in the UK, but the reason why so many of the NGOs I mentioned are supporting New Clause 6 is because how important it is for developing countries. According to the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, developing countries lose at least hundred billion American dollars every year as a result of tax havens. Around to 8 to 15 per cent of the world's wealth is being held offshore in low tax jurisdictions, many of which come under our jurisdiction. A World Bank review of 213 big corruption cases found that over 70 per cent of them relied on secret company ownership. Now, company service providers in UK territories were second on the list in providing these companies. Oxfam has said recently that around one-third of rich Africans' wealth is currently sitting in offshore tax havens. Now, if all that wealth was held in Africa and taxed properly, we would be able to pay for enough teachers to educate every child in Africa. Yeah. It does damage, as the Honourable Member for Amber Valley also said, I think our reputation that the British Virgin Islands was the most mentioned tax haven in the Panama Papers. Mm -hmm. Now, we know future leaks are coming, so why can't we get ahead of the game and ensure transparency now? In a recent debate on the Commonwealth Development Corporation Bill, the DFID Minister, the Honourable Member for Penrith and the Border, said that the Commonwealth Development Corporation would never invest 
through Anguilla or the British Virgin Islands. Now, if a DFID minister and the Commonwealth <coughs> Development Corporation can say that, what does it say about our responsibility today to change the reputation that clearly British ministers are thinking of when they're thinking of not investing through those overseas territories and do something today to help them to become more transparent. Honourable friend, I give way to my honourable friend. Um, I thank my right honourable friend for giving way. She's making an incredibly strong point, and I too was pleased to add my name to uh, new clause six. And I'm sorry I haven't been able to join for much of the rest of the debate today. But would she agree with me that this is exactly the point? It's about consistency of approach. And when we're talking about, for example, trying to reduce um, the need for aid to certain countries, of course, one of the key ways to do that, which she agree, is to ensure that countries are able to generate their own revenues yeah. from actually having tax paid properly in their own jurisdictions. I absolutely agree with my honourable friend, and I thank him for his support, putting his name to new clause six as well. I mean, look, you know, aid is very important, but importantly is how do we create the self-sufficiency for more countries that are recipients of aid to stand on their own two feet. Now, I understand that transparency in terms of overseas territories, in terms of our own system, is important to that, as well as is good governance yep. in these countries Absolutely. as well, because unfortunately in some of the countries we supply aid to, they could do a hell of a lot more to help their own citizens too. But this is an area where we can have a direct impact and really start making excuse me, significant changes right now. Now, sadly, in recent weeks we have seen, Madam Deputy Speaker, a somewhat disappointing climb down from ministers. The government's new line is, is that public registers emerge as the global standard they would expect the overseas territories to follow suit. Now, our own UK government has made considerable progress on this agenda, which I applaud. If you look at the Financial Secrecy Index, the UK is 15th. But if you combine the UK with our overseas territories and Crown dependencies, we are top of the list for financial secrecy. We can't hide from this. And it is probably for this reason other countries use this as the excuse for not adopting public registers. And that's something I think we should be aware of. We are, we are bound, bound to these overseas territories and to our Crown dependencies as well in a way that other countries where we want to see progress can use as an excuse not to make steps forward on this important matter. Now, David Cameron, and I don't often say this, David Cameron does deserve praise for his leadership at the 2013 G8 summit. Yet we cannot claim global leadership on this area until we get our own houses in order. And why is it so important the registers are publicly available? First, because that is the only way that people in developing countries, I think, can access the information in a proper way. And second, because it does allow, beyond the law enforcement agencies that will have access as a result of progress that's been made, it will allow NGOs and civil society to interrogate the, to interrogate the data like they have with the Panama Papers. And transparency, I have to say, is far more efficient than endless systems of in information exchange between governments. I give way to my honourable friend. Um, I thank my honourable friend has been very generous in giving way. And does she agree with me there is, a, is a, again, a, a conflict here where, on the one hand, the UK government has actually been very sensible over different governments of both Labour and Conservative of supporting um, tax systems in country and tax authorities in many developing countries. But, of course, uh, not, if they don't have the information available, if they don't have that transparency of information of what companies and how they're incorporated and so on, um, even if we're giving support to them, they can't get to the bottom of where their taxes are actually going. If you haven't got the tools to make the difference, we're not going to see the change that I think across this House we all want to see happening. Without full access to transparent information, inv investigators will not know what information to request through these agreements, and that is fundamental to all of this. This is why public access to the data is important and why David Cameron was exactly right to demand it. Now, when the Minister responds to this amendment, I expect him to say that the overseas territories are making real progress on this agenda and that including them in this legislation is not necessary. So let's be clear about the progress that has been made since the former Prime Minister first asked the overseas territories to consider public registers of beneficial ownership back in October 2013. Over three years on, just one overseas territory, Montserrat, hooray for Montserrat, has committed to a public register. The rest have delayed at every step. Is the Minister satisfied with that outcome, and how does he account for why progress has been so slow? 
In April 2014, the then Prime Minister wrote to overseas territory leaders asking them to consult on public registers. Not all of them even did that. And in July 2015, the Right Honourable Member for South West Hertfordshire asked those overseas territories with financial centres to develop plans for central registers by November 2015. This deadline wasn't hit. Press reports last year said that the overseas territories were ignoring Foreign Office Minister's letters and meeting requests, and at the most recent meeting with overseas territories leaders in November 2016, public registers of beneficial ownership were not even mentioned in the final communique. Now, without, I will, without the exposure following the release of the Panama Papers, it has to beg the question whether we've made as much progress as we have at all if those Panama Papers had not been released. I give way to the Minister. Uh, I'm grateful to the right honourable lady. I think she's not been very charitable to point out that actually we've achieved an awful lot since David Cameron's summit. So while they aren't public, we have by this year will have achieved central register uh, of beneficial ownership in all of the overseas territories and the Crown dependencies. And where those Crown dependencies and overseas territories have needed help, we have given them help in getting there. Uh, and in answer to her point that uh, it wasn't even raised, the public register. I had a meeting with them two weeks ago, and I raised it then. Well, I thank the Minister for that information, because I did go and read the final communique from that uh, meeting in 2016, and whilst there was some mention around uh, beneficial ownership and private registers, nothing in that communi uh, communique actually mentioned any journey from private to public registers, and that was the point I made a little well, earlier. And I do welcome... Uh, the progress has been made. But I'm going to go on to suggest that unless we link the efforts being made on private registers to an end game of public registers, I feel we will still have some of the problems that so many across this House and outside have been worried about for some years. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I thank my Honourable Friend for giving way. Having just heard the Minister tell us that he did raise uh, the question of uh, making the register of ownership uh, public. Uh, if he was prepared to raise that two weeks ago, would it not be better for him if he's prepared to adopt that role of encouragement if in future in doing so he was supported by this Parliament through the very amendment that we're now debating? I thank the Honourable Gentleman for that intervention. Part of having this debate, part of us trying to look at ways in which we could rephrase the amendment from the original one that was put forward, is to strengthen the arm of the Government and the Ministers, to say, look, we welcome the efforts in terms of central registers, in terms of private registers, of automatic exchange of information, but we are on a journey here. This is not the end game. This is part of the journey to where we want to get to. And, and it would be very helpful to hear from the Minister in his remarks what was the reaction to discussion of public registers at the meeting that was held. And if I could, because I understand on the issue of uh, central registers, and this is very important, because whilst there might be private registers, information may be held in different places. Mm -hmm. Private central registers are very important to this because it helps to make it clearer, even in the private situation, to those who ask for information to be able to get at it. But also, if we do not have central registers, it's going to make it even harder if we do want to make that journey to public registers in the future. So I'd ask the uh, Minister how many of our overseas territories will provide central registers? Will the British Virgin Islands register be central? Because not all of them have indicated that this is the route they want to go down. Um, that is why ministers should be talking to the overseas territories about the journey to public registers now, because it's about a journey that we're on and the way in which these private registers are put together and how they're held and how easy it is to access them for those who are going to have to ask for access is pertinent to a future where there is public uh, registers available. Madam Deputy Speaker, when the Minister responds to this meant, I expect him to say how complicated this all is constitutionally. Now, none of us who have signed this amendment want the orders in Council to be used. They are there as a backstop if the Government is un unsuccessful in persuading the overseas territories to publish their registers. And the amendment gives the overseas territories, as I have said before, until the end of 2019 to act on their own. But the fact is, is that 
We can't remove the possibility of using orders in council if we want to see more progress on the transparency agenda. And on the overseas territories, the constitutional position is very, very clear. A 2012 government white paper said, as a matter of constitutional law, the UK Parliament has unlimited power to legislate for the overseas territories. There are multiple examples of the UK legislating for its overseas territories. In 2009, the UK imposed direct rule in the Turks and Caicos Islands following allegations of corruption. In 2000, the UK government decriminalised homosexual acts in the overseas territories using orders in council. In 1991, the UK government, by order in council, abolished capital punishment for the crime of murder in Anguilla, the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, Montserrat and the Turks and Caicos Islands. The exception was Bermuda, generally considered the most autonomous overseas territory, but the UK government threatened to impose change which had the desired effect of ensuring changes in domestic legislation. At second reading and in committee stage of this bill, the Minister was very clear that he wanted to see public registers in the overseas territories and was working to get them. So why has the Minister scaled back on his ambitions in recent weeks? Undoubtedly, the UK government needs to work closely with our overseas territories to help them to diversify their economies away from a unique selling point of secrecy, and that will require a great deal of support. So as we look ahead to a global post-Brexit Britain, let's seek to lead the world rather than just follow. Let's ensure that transparency is increased. Let's ensure a fair playing field for businesses and individuals across the world. Let's ensure that tax cheats, corrupt individuals, terrorists, organised criminals have nowhere to hide. For the benefit of UK taxpayers, people in the developing world, and for the UK's reputation and that of our overseas territories, let's not miss this opportunity. And for all these reasons, I urge the House to support New Clause 6. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Andrew Mitchell. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. This is uh, an important uh, probing amendment, and uh, I look forward very much to hearing uh, what the Minister says before I decide uh, whether or not to, uh, to uh, vote uh, for it, because I think one of the most important aspects of this, uh, this bill, tackling corruption, uh, standing up for openness and transparency, the Government deserves enormous praise for the work that it has done, uh, landmark work really, not only here but also in the G20, in trying to tackle uh, corruption, and that's what this clause is about. Uh, can, I, can I say to the Honourable Lady who moved uh, this clause so eloquently that we on this side of the House join her in saying how much we regret that the, Honourable Lady, the Right Honourable Lady for Barking cannot be here today, and hope that, uh, given the reason why she can't be here today, uh, the Right Honourable Lady will send her the House's best uh, wishes. Um, I should just correct one point which she made, where she said that she thought backbenchers signing this amendment might have been lent on by the Government, or were signing it in spite of being lent on. I'm happy to confirm to the House that no one has tried to lean on me in that respect. Um, and uh, also, I should like to make it clear that I think the Minister will have to do a little better than his response to my honourable friend for Amber Valley on his Tajikistan bridge example, because my honourable friend has it absolutely correct. Uh, the, it, is not, it is not the administration of Tajikistan, which may well be colluding with the owners of the bridge, uh, that is the point. It is to enable civil society, civic society, to hold the powerful to account. Um, and, and that is why uh, we support transparency. That is why, when I was, had the privilege of being the Secretary of State for International Development, we introduced the Transparency Initiative. We put everything we possibly could into the public domain. It's why we should all support a free press. It's why, although it may be rumbustious and unruly from time to time, nevertheless a free press is a bastion of our uh, liberties. Sunlight is the best disinfectant, and a lot of the stuff that is the subject of this particular uh, amendment today leaks out anyway in the back pages of Private Eye or whatever. Much better to put the whole thing on a formal setting and have it, uh, it, it made public. Now, um, the government, as I say, and in particular the uh, former Prime Minister and the former uh, Chancellor, and of course my right honourable friend for Brentwood and Onger, in his capacity as the anti corruption czar, have made huge uh, progress. And I would like to uh, ask the Minister, when he comes to respond, whether he could give us 
the flavour of the government's thinking in the difference between the overseas territories and the Crown dependencies, because there is a difference here, and I think it would be helpful for the House to understand the Minister's thinking on the uh, slightly differing treat treatment of both those two categories. Now, um, during the run-up to this amendment, Madam Deputy Speaker, I was visited by no less than five of the dependent territories uh, officials, uh, supported by the Falkland Islands as well, although I think that was a matter of solidarity rather than direct uh, interest. And the truth is they do make uh, some very important points, which I've no doubt we will hear from my uh, honourable friend from Norfolk, who I think chairs the BVI all-party group. Um, and first of all, if they have an open public register, they will suffer a competitive disadvantage. That, that is a point that they make, and it's true. And their answer to that is that if they're going to do it, and they don't have an objection in principle, then they think everyone else should do it uh, as well. And they point out the potential effect on their income could well push them back into dependency and reduce quite substantially the income of these dependent territories, uh, which again is a fair point. But the answer, in my view, Madam Deputy Speaker, from the Government should be to try and narrow the footprint at all times of those areas which are able to hide behind uh, secrecy. Certainly it is a step forward to have a register, albeit not a public one, um, but uh, we need to hear, I think, from the government their thinking on for how long they will allow this register to remain private and uh, whether they expect the dependent territories and indeed the Crown dependencies to make the register public in due course. And of course, if uh, the register remains private and not public, Although it may be accessible to law enforcement agencies, and that is obviously right, uh, they are nevertheless crime fighters are confronting crime and corruption with one hand behind their back. Because if they're able to see all the entries, uh, an argument that we completely accept in Britain and under British law, then it makes the fight against uh, crime uh, and against corruption that much uh, easier. And that is why in the UK we have a public. Uh, register. So I hope the Minister will uh, explain to the House uh, how he thinks progress will be made towards a public register, whether he's saying that the Crown Dependencies want more time, uh, a point that they made when they came to see me, um, uh, or whether uh, he takes a different view. Now finally, um, Madam Deputy Speaker, the African Progress Panel looked uh, recently at the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, the DRC, to see uh, the extent of the siphoning off of revenue from that country. Um, it is a rich irony, Madam Deputy Speaker, that in the DRC, some of the poorest people in the world live on top of some of the richest uh, real estate. And in the area the African Progress Panel looked at, they identified nearly £1.5 billion of lost revenue, more than the total health and education budgets of that country in the period in uh, question. Um, and there are credible studies by the World Bank which show that if you look at the extent per year uh, from Africa of tax not paid or funding uh, stolen, the, uh, the effect of the money that has been uh, concealed or stolen in that, that way dwarfs the totality of all the flows of international aid and development money. So the House today has the opportunity of going with the grain of this bill, of going with the grain of British leadership internationally on transparency and openness. Uh, in my view, uh, unless the Minister has got a very strong argument, and, and he's the sort of Minister who may well have, uh, then uh, the effect of us uh, saying that we will not impose the same standards on dependent territories with all the advantages they gain from that uh, status uh, will be to damage our credibility on these matters, not only here in Britain, but also internationally. Yeah. Robert Neil. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow my right honourable friend, the member for Sutton Coalfield, who speaks with great authority uh, and commitment uh, on these matters. I'm going to come to a point where I disagree with him uh, on uh, one practical matter, though not with the objective that he seeks to achieve, 
but I do want to endorse the thrust of this bill, as he has just done, uh, and also the observation that is worth repeating, uh, and all the more important uh, as we look to a world after we have left the European Union, that Britain is a world leader in terms of transparency, and is a world leader in terms of effectiveness of dealing with financial crime as things are at the moment. And my honourable and learned friend, uh, the member for Harborough, was right to stress in that connection the particular value of the work of the Serious Fraud Office, which is extremely yeah. successful, yeah. highly regarded the world over, and not least, and this is very important, because it is operationally independent of any investigating authority. And it would be quite wrong, many of us believe, to do anything uh, to change that arrangement. The SFO is currently constituted, works and works well, uh, and it has an interrupt international reputation as a leader precisely because of that independence which is very important. Can I then turn specifically uh, to Clause 6 uh, and I have much sympathy too with the Honourable uh, Right Honourable Lady and the Member for, for Don Valley in what she says but I do have to take issue in this regard I don't think as phrased that uh, new Clause 6 is appropriate or proportionate to achieve the objective uh, and let me say so uh, why and in doing so declare uh, 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 an interest I am the Secretary of the uh, All Parliamentary Party Group on Gibraltar, one of the British Overseas Territories. I am also a member uh, of the uh, All Parliamentary Party Group uh, of the Channel Islands, which is a crown, of course, a crown dependencies, not in New Clause 6, but in other uh, uh, New Clauses not yet moved. Uh, and my concern is this. The way the argument is put assumes that all the Overseas Territories should be lumped in together. I don't think that's fair. And I particularly want to address the position of Gibraltar because Gibraltar is in a different position, uh, per, for, firstly by the nature of its constitution, secondly because unlike uh, other overseas territories, and I don't criticise or make any comment on them, Gibraltar is part of the European Union effectively and therefore has had and has willingly complied uh, with international standards and EU standards in the same way uh, that the UK has. So it's important not uh, to lump Gibraltar in with other jurisdictions where there, are, there has been a controversy. And I say that specifically, and it's important this House has it on record, because there are people, I'm afraid, the other side of the land border with Gibraltar in Spain. There are some politicians, unscrupulously, who regularly seek to slander uh, Gibraltar and the arrangements of its uh, constitutional and uh, legal situation, wholly unfairly uh, to advance an unjustified claim against it. And I wouldn't want anything that's said in this House to be taken uh, as in a way which could give comfort to those people who are seeking to do down uh, a loyal and effective uh, British territory. So I do think we need to draw distinctions. <laughs> the point to be made about Gibraltar twofold is this. Although I accept the observations of the White Paper in 2010 and what can be done, I would uh, argue that it's certainly in Gibraltar's case undesirable to contemplate such a thing because to legislate, even by orders in council, would have the effect of abrogating the 2006 Gibraltar Constitution. Uh, which gives Gibraltar the uh, entire and the Gibraltar Parliament, a democratic elected Parliament, uh, entire home rule in matters relating to its economy uh, and uh, domestic legislation, save only those matters reserved to be exercised by the Governor on behalf of the British Crown. I give way, of course. I thank the Right Honourable. Not yet. Oh, right, okay. the Honourable Gentleman. <laughs> Apologies. You should be. Well, he should be, not you should be. Um, I absolutely um, uh, agree that it is, it is very welcome that Gibraltar has been complying with not only the EU initiative but the OECD as well. But I just would ask um, gently the Honourable Gentleman why it is that Gibraltar is not in favour of following the UK route of public uh, registers of beneficial ownership. I think the reason is very properly and sensibly set out by my right honourable friend, the member for Sutton Coalfield. There is a, a, a risk of a competitive disadvantage, and I do think you have to bear in mind the particular situation, as I said before, that Gibraltar finds itself in, uh, where uh, it would be inappropriate, I suggest, if they were at a position of competitive disadvantage compared with other Mediterranean jurisdictions, some of whom are not well disposed towards them. Now, Gibraltar has done a great deal to do that, and I think the continuing dialogue is a sensible way forward, but I don't think it would be appropriate to legislate particularly as undermining Gibraltar's constitution, even if legally, theoretically possible, I suspect it will be challenged in the courts, will be most undesirable politically uh, because our commitment to Gibraltar ought to be particularly clear uh, as we leave uh, the European Union. It is worth saying too that Gibraltar has taken very considerable uh, practical uh, steps. Uh, it's uh, been uh, recognised internationally uh, as having uh, done that. It's just worth saying uh, in, in very simple terms 
uh, that um, it has transposed all the necessary EU uh, directives uh, into their law, perfectly willingly, without any difficulty of their own volition. Uh, they have also uh, complied with all OECD initiatives in, in this regard, and they have gone beyond that. They've committed a, they, they have established a central many, uh, register uh, under the fourth, uh, terms of the fourth anti-money laundering uh, directive. Uh, trans transposition deadline for that is June of this year. They have entered into exchanges of notes to accelerate access to all UK uh, authorities for investigative uh, purposes. They have agreed to the E5 proposal for automatic exchange of um, uh, in beneficial ownership with participating countries. That includes all EU countries, including Spain. Uh, so they have been extremely um, willing to cooperate even with those who don't always behave well to them. So I think that needs to be uh, recognised. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, 5th of July 2016 EU proposal to amend the fourth anti-money laundering directive uh, by introducing uh, uh, the, uh, the register is being actively looked at by the Gibraltar government. It ought to be their decision. And Her Majesty's Government, I think the Minister will confirm, has worked very closely with Her Majesty's Government of Gibraltar on this. There is a constructive dialogue going forward and that's the right way to deal with it. And it's worth finally saying about Gibraltar, before I just move briefly on to Crown Dependencies, that Gibraltar's record of effectiveness in the exchange of information was recognised by the OECD in their 2014 phase two review when it was ranked as largely compliant and you think that's uh, good or bad it's actually a very high ranking because it puts Gibraltar being ranked as good in terms of compliance as the United Kingdom the United States and Germany so actually Gibraltar is doing the job and that really needs to be stressed so that other people as I say don't misuse um, uh, the linkage which is uh, not I think borne out on the evidence in Gibraltar's case they've got some 135 uh, tax information exchange mechanisms with some 80 countries. Uh, they've already uh, implemented uh, the FATC, the Financial Action uh, Task Force, uh, recommendations with the United States and the United Kingdom. They're implementing common reporting standards, the global standard, uh, uh, along with the UK and other countries. So I would just suggest that it will be heavy handed and inappropriate uh, to involve Gibraltar uh, in this particular approach when they're already doing much. In case they are moved, can I just touch upon the Crown Dependencies, as my right honourable friend, uh, the member for Sutton, uh, Coldfield, did? Uh, I think the constitutional position there is more difficult, frankly, uh, because, of course, uh, they uh, are not and never have been subject to the United Kingdom. Uh, their allegiance is purely to the British Crown uh, and not, uh, in fact, to the United Kingdom, in theory. So I think the difficulty of attempting to legislate for them uh, would be real and profound in constitutional terms. That's why, in relationship, uh, it falls under the Ministry of Justice, and their legislation is signed off by the Privy Council. And I think the new clauses that seek to bring them into the uh, position here are not well conceived legally in that regard. Uh, so that's, I think, the key issue there. And it's also worth observing, uh, since the Justice Select Committee recently visited all three Crown dependencies as part of one of uh, our inquiries, that they too uh, are uh, up to the highest standards uh, of, of, transparent, uh, of reporting uh, and making sure that information is readily available to the authorities. It's worth saying in relation to Jersey, but it applies to all of them, Moneyval, well established, an like, international reputed body, uh, Moneyval's report said Jersey's, Jersey's combination of a central register uh, of the uh, UBO uh, with a high level of vetting evaluation not found elsewhere uh, and regulation of, of trust company security providers, uh, a standard found in few other jurisdictions, has been widely recognised by international organisations and individual jurisdictions as placing Jersey in a leading position in meeting standards of beneficial ownership uh, transparency. Uh, and like provisions in different uh, legislative forms have been made in the two uh, other Crown dependencies as well. So again, I think it will be unfair uh, and inappropriate and disproportionate uh, to lump the Crown dependencies uh, in uh, to this issue. We all, have the, we all share the same objective. We want to make sure uh, that there is maximum transparency and that there is honest uh, money in our system. But for the reasons I've set out, I hope uh, those supporting both this amendment and the others that have not yet been moved will reflect and conclude that this is not the appropriate vehicle through its legislative means to achieve that objective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sir Henry Belly. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, I'd like to also say a few very quick words about new clause 6. To declare an interest, first of all, because I chair the BBI APPG, I'm the former Minister of the Overseas Territories, and I'm well aware, Madam Deputy Speaker, of the challenges there are in Africa. The Honourable Member for Southern Coalfield mentioned the Congo, and I think he and I will remember the time when Tullo Oil had the licenses expropriated by the Kabila government. 
and it transpired that uh, the interface company was a BVI registered shell in which Kabila had shares and also part of Zuma's family. It would have been very useful if we could have actually confirmed that at the time. And I think that looking to the future uh, and envisaging having public registers across the world makes a lot of sense. I entirely accept that. But what I'm very worried about, and it's the only point I'm going to make, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that if the new clause is passed and territories like the BVI lose their business model, first of all, there'll be a, a, a massive exodus from someone like the BVI in terms of legal services, accountancy firms, banks, etc. They would have to then rely on tourism. It could well be that they would then move back to dependency. The other problem is, is this going to solve the problem? No, because those companies that are registered in the BVI and, for example, the Cayman Islands or the Turks and Caicos <coughs> Islands, what they would simply do is register elsewhere in countries that don't have public registers. They'd go to Panama, to Colombia, and indeed I saw recently that the United States, Hong Kong and Singapore have said specifically that they will not bring in public registers until the rest of the world moves on. So my point is that this is well-intentioned, this new clause, but we should be very mindful of the unintended consequences. And the unintended consequence uh, above all else would be, apart from the BVI losing its business model, would be the fact that those excellent intelligence and exchange of information arrangements that are in place now, for example, the BVI have in place the Beneficial Ownership Secure Search System that enables our crime and fraud agencies to cooperate immediately on a confidential basis to get the information that's required. If these companies registered elsewhere in the world, we would lose that crime-busting uh, capability. So for those reasons, although well-intentioned, I hope the Minister will reject this amendment, but on the other hand, work with those colleagues and honourable right honourable colleagues who are very concerned about this whole issue uh, and, and make sure that we do, uh, in due course, persuade more and more countries around the world to work together so we can have a uniform approach in the future. Yeah. Nick Harbert. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I, uh, I rise to support new Clause 6, which uh, I added my uh, name to uh, in the full confidence that I was merely endorsing what I understood to be government <laughs> policy in relation uh, to ensuring uh, transparency in these matters uh, in the overseas territory. That policy had been announced by the previous Prime Minister. And I find myself uh, genuinely being puzzled as to why it is that uh, that apparently is no longer uh, government policy. And there are therefore a few issues that I wish to raise and questions that I uh, very much hope that the Minister may be able to answer uh, so as to uh, reassure uh, me and other honourable members who have supported this new clause in good faith that there are good reasons why uh, it should not uh, go forward. First of all, I thought that the argument about transparency uh, had been established. Uh, so my right honourable friend, the member for the City of Westminster, uh, suggested that transparency uh, would in itself be an undesirable thing uh, for the overseas territories to have to uh, undertake. Uh, and uh, that, it seems to me, to be uh, an argument that we might well have applied to the position in the UK. Uh, and if it was an argument that we accepted, then we would not have taken the action here uh, in the UK to require that there should be uh, transparency. Of course, I would. Fair enough that I have allowed to defend myself on that regard. I, all I was making the point was uh, I am very much in favour of transparency. Transparency towards the law enforcement, transparency towards the tax authorities, of which there is full transparency. What I did not uh, support, because I do support the idea of banking privacy, is that there should be an absolutely full and open and public register at this stage. Uh, well, I gr I'm grateful to my right honourable friend for, for clarifying um, uh, what, what he said. But I think my point still stands, which, which is that we have uh, taken that action in the UK to require that publication. So my question remains, why is it right for us to do it in the UK, but wrong in the overseas territories? That is the point that uh, I was uh, seeking to make. Perhaps the Minister uh, could help to explain that. Secondly, I understand that a series of constitutional objections have been raised uh, to this uh, amendment, and, uh, which, it, which are that it would be wrong for us um, to insist that the overseas territories take some action. If that is the case, why did we propose this uh, in the first place? 
so that uh, uh, honourable members such as myself uh, found myself uh, to be on the wrong side of the government's opinion on this when I thought that I was supporting a policy that I believe was in uh, our manifesto. If there was some uh, constitutional objection to this, uh, was it not surprising that the previous Prime Minister should announce this policy of transparency for the overseas uh, territories? And is it right, uh, in fact, that the uh, British government never imposes uh, policies on our overseas territories? Uh, in the year 2000, the government, by order in council, decriminalised homosexuality in the overseas territories. I doubt there are very many members of this House uh, that would oppose that policy. I suspect that it was opposed uh, in many of the overseas territories. Uh, do honourable members say that it was wrong uh, for the British government uh, to have done that? It might still be uh, a, 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 an offence uh, that is punishable uh, by a, a capital punishment uh, in relation to murder in some of the overseas territories, but for the fact that the government uh, insisted on the abolition of uh, such capital crimes uh, in 1991. So I think the principle is established uh, that the government uh, is constitutionally entitled and indeed in, has in practice where there is an overriding um, public policy justification for doing so has uh, legislated uh, in relation to the overseas uh, territories. The third argument that has been advanced against uh, this measure is that the overseas territories are doing it anyway. So we're told that it's not necessary to, uh, to, to, to back this uh, new Clause 6 because the overseas territories are well on their way uh, towards doing the right thing. But that, that goes back to the question of what it is that they are doing. So if it is the case that they are producing registers uh, then that is welcome. But my question still stands. Why is it that we thought that transparency was a good thing and now no longer believe uh, that transparency is a good thing? We have reset the bar. We are now saying that the overseas territories are on their way uh, to doing the right thing, but the right thing is now defined merely as the register. It is no longer transparency. And I think the reason why uh, this has happened uh, has been revealed by some of my uh, honourable friends for entirely honourable reasons, which is that some of these overseas territories, and therefore some of my honourable friends, fear that uh, there will be a competitive disadvantage uh, that arises for these overseas territories uh, if they are required uh, to publish, um, uh, uh, to produce a public register. Uh, in the way that this uh, amendment suggests they would eventually uh, be required to do and in the way that which at one point the government suggested uh, they should. And I simply want to say that if we are to accept an argument of competitive disadvantage as being an obstacle uh, to taking measures in relation to tax evasion or corruption, this House would do very little in relation to these issues because it can always be argued that this House may be putting at disadvantage our own banking arrangements in this country or indeed of others because we are taking steps that we deem to be in the public interest because they will uh, pr produce corruption. And to turn the argument around, if we are to accept the argument about competitive disadvantage, then there would be no reason why this House should not reverse all of the measures that have been taken in relation to banking transparency and uh, establish some kind of uh, regime that used to pertain in countries uh, like uh, Switzerland, where there would be wholesale banking secrecy, because that would be good for business, because actually we would place ourselves at a competitive advantage by comparison to other countries, uh, and that therefore that is something uh, that would be entirely acceptable to do. Well, clearly it would not, and we have taken an opposite view, that there is a reason uh, to demand transparency, that it is essential in order to tackle uh, corruption. And we are talking about measures that uh, are necessary not just to protect the UK taxpayer, but also the poorest countries in the world, which are disadvantaged and penalised because people are able to siphon off funds uh, unlawfully, immorally, and shelter them in regimes. Uh, and we are apparently saying that we are willing to accept that because if we take some action against it, some other uh, regime will perform that immoral task. Well, that seems to me to be a wrong position 
uh, for this House of Commons to take, and if it was, then we wouldn't have a bill like this or any transparency measures uh, uh, at all. I therefore hope that the government will reconsider uh, its position on this. It seems to me that the amendment is entirely reasonable. It gives a period of time for the overseas uh, territories uh, to comply with the requirement uh, of transparency, and I, for one, will uh, take a very great deal of convincing that something that was uh, held by uh, the government to be desirable, that we hold to be desirable and right in our own country, is wrong for the overseas territories. Mark Fields. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I've spent the last 16 years as the member for the cities of London and Westminster. I've spent six of those years as an advisor to uh, an international law firm with a substantial uh, Isle of Man presence, uh, Keynes. Um, and over the last two years, I've been the Vice Chairman for International Affairs for my party and therefore have had a, a lot of um, dealings and knowledge about uh, these sorts of issues. And where I would agree, fervently agree, with what the Right Honourable Lady for Don Valley and indeed my right honourable friend for Sutton Coldfield said is that uh, there has been a journey, uh, there has been a significant journey, a massive change actually in mentality about the whole issue about uh, 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 beneficial ownership and uh, getting registers together and having uh, a certain amount of openness about those registers. And it is a journey that is ongoing. Um, and the issue, in my view, realistically, um, and I think there were some powerful cases made by my honourable friends for Bromley and Chislehurst and uh, North West Norfolk, uh, is that there is a, r a real risk of competitive disadvantage uh, applying to a number of the overseas territories. I think my honourable friend for Bromley and Chislehurst rightly also made the point that it to the Crown dependencies, and I think it was recognised by the Right Honourable Lady opposite, um, that there, there was a different legal and constitutional position, that these are territories that are not part of the United Kingdom, they are territories that have their own um, uh, le uh, legitimate and democratic uh, government, uh, and it would be, I think, uh, quite wrong, whether in, in orders in council or, or through this bill, for the government to uh, run uh, rail uh, railroad themselves uh, across that. Um, my instinct is that these are issues that we will come to again. Uh, and I support the government. I don't think the time is ripe for um, having a clause like this at this stage. It would be wrong, however, to uh, assume that there isn't a huge amount of work that has been going on uh, quietly behind the scenes. I know from my own experience and I know from many others that over recent years there has been a sea change in attitude. Um, from a number of the overseas territories, not all, uh, but certainly from the Crown dependencies, many of which are actually ahead of the game as far as um, uh, elements of this transparency agenda are concerned. Uh, but I think there is a very real risk, and I think it was, a, it was a, um, very well uh, put by my honourable friend for North West Norfolk, that if um, we were to impose upon the uh, overseas territories in this way in a very short order, there is a risk of um, a huge amount of business leaving those shores. Now, some will argue, and with some legitimacy perhaps, they'll say, well, listen, we don't want to have this business here. Surely a better regime is that we work and continue the work that has happened in recent years and work towards the idea of having global protocols on this in such a way that there isn't that competitive disadvantage uh, put into play. I think it's quite wrong to look upon um, all of the, our overseas territories as being uh, terrible tax havens where uh, illicit work goes on. The, there is an astonishing amount of uh, technology of which I'm aware. I've seen it first hand. Uh, it applies to BBI, applies to Cayman Islands uh, and others um, to ensure that they are able to cooperate uh, on an instantaneous basis with law enforcement and tax authorities for any suspicious um, uh, transactions that are taking place. So I, I support the government in this. I hope that um, um, the, that, uh, the uh, proposals of new clause 6 will either withdraw or, if it goes to a vote, that uh, the government will win uh, on this issue. But I also hope that the, the Minister will give us some idea of where he sees uh, the, the future going on this, the ongoing conversations that we have in place to try and ensure that we have a global protocol of which we can all support. Richard Arthur. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's an honour to follow the gentleman from the uh, City of London and Westminster and just to say I have the utmost envy for his commute home on a Thursday evening. Um, <laughs> perhaps he would like my seven-hour journey that I do regularly up and down. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a very interesting speech and the, co the contributions from both sides of the House today have been very informed and very enlightening. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I don't want to take up too much time, but there are some new clause amendments that I wish to touch on very briefly before I hand over to the other front benches. Firstly, New Clause 2, 3, 14, 15 and 4, which are essentially about extending 
the principle of corporate economic crime, which has been discussed at length across both sides of the House today. The bill, as drafted, incorporates a failure to prevent economic crime, but only in relation to tax evasion, and has been mentioned. Um, it would appear sensible, given the current climate and given public mood, that we extend this so that the liability reaches the tops of organisations. Uh, and I've mentioned this on the floor of the House before, but as um, a lawyer who had some in-house experience working for a large retail bank, um, I can tell you with the utmost certainty that sticking your head above the parapet and telling the bank that they're wrong is not the most conducive course of action for your career. Um, I didn't fall foul of that particular pitfall, but I, was, I think I probably would have at some point in the future. Um, I think the public would demand that corporate economic crime is extended beyond tax evasion. I think they would be surprised to learn that the bank would not be held liable for LIBOR rigging, for instance. Of course, those individuals were prosecuted under different laws, but there was no corporate c criminal liability for the board of directors or the, for the banks themselves for what the public, I think, would expect them to be held liable for. Um, I don't think the public would thank us for having a corporate economic offence that extends to tax evasion. It's tax evasion, for goodness sake. I think the public would expect that the company, the bank, the large organisation would be held criminally liable for something as obvious as tax evasion. So I think it's um, a great shame that we haven't grasped the metal in this bill, um, unless the Minister, of course, has got something miraculous to say when he gets to his feet. But I suspect that we're not going to have an extension of corporate economic crime, which I think is a real shame. Um, even if it were to come to pass, the, I, I still have issues, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, about some of the provisions within the failure to prevent model, in that if a bank can show that it had reasonable processes and protocols in those circumstances, then it is an absolute defence. There's also a defence in here that if in the circumstances it's deemed that the bank ought not to have any reasonable processes in place. And I can tell you from bitter first-hand experience by suing and uh, um, commencing litigation against banks that in the eleventh hour, miraculously, they will pull together volumes and volumes of training manuals, protocols and processes that seem completely absent when the crime or the alleged um, offence was being committed, that somehow miraculously appear in courtrooms to convince the judge that they have taken all of the processes necessary. So even if the failure to prevent was extended along the lines of the incorporated new clauses, um, call me a cynic, but I still think there's an opportunity for a bank to put it in colloquial terms, wriggle out of that potential responsibility. Um, other new clauses, Madam Deputy Speaker, obviously new clause 6, which um, I, I don't have a great deal to add um, in relation to what's been, been said on both sides of the Chamber. We will support um, new clause 6. We are, we are pleased that the Crown dependencies are not part of new clause 6, um, given that I'm clearly an SNP MP. Um, it's part of my political definition that I don't want this place to legislate on places or jurisdictions where it doesn't have authority, so we're clearly reluctant for that to happen. Um, we understand there's more of a case for the, the British Virgin Islands, therefore we will, sorry, for the, for the Overseas Territory, but, and we will support the amendment on that basis. But I think my honourable friend, the Chair of the Justice Select Committee, member for Bromley and Chislehurst, was absolutely right to make the distinction between, for example, Gibraltar and the Overseas Territory. And throughout this process, I've become quite puzzled as to why Gibraltar is actually considered an Overseas Territory and not a Crown Dependency. I, I, I wonder if the, perhaps, probably not the Minister's remit, but it's something that's occurred to me over the last few months. Um, but I think, you know, it, transparency is key. If this government's policy is transparency, and we all agree that transparency would um, facilitate a more fair banking and financial system, then there, there ought to be no good reasons why, at the end of the day, those jurisdictions have public registers the same as we have. But I would corroborate other members' views, but that is the clear direction of travel. The direction of travel is in that way, and whether or not it's um, the right thing to do to legislate to compel jurisdictions that we perhaps don't have authority over to do something is another question. But on the basis of transparency, uh, and it, I think it reflects the public mood, then we will support new clause 6. Um, in relation to other new clauses, I mean, new clause 11, again, is one of those clauses that asks this government to go through a consultation process to persuade and cajole the Crown dependencies to adopt legislation which frankly ought to be determined by their own parliament and their own jurisdictions. Um, 
new clause six is, 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 more, is easier to deal with in the fact that it, it deals with transparency and things that we really want to get done. But new clause 11 seems to me to be a, a wish wash of let's have a chat with them and let's see if we can persuade them to do anything when really um, that ought to be up to them as it ought to be up to the Scottish Parliament as it ought to be up to the Welsh Parliament or whatever jurisdiction holds those powers. Um, so I, I, I would have constitutional jurisdictional problems with new clause 11 but again I, 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 I accept the, the basis behind it but I, will, I think you will find is that the overseas territories and the crown dependencies will be quite willing to have that conversation about the effectiveness of the registers as time goes on. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker we have tabled three new clauses that have been considered in this group. The first is in Scottish limited partnerships and I really have got nothing to add to my honourable colleague from Kirkcaldy and Cowdenbeath who is no longer in his place because he has to go to the aforementioned um, <laughs> second meeting of this rather uh, popular committee that he, he mentioned. Um, he articulated the case very well. Um, it would be our intention, um, if I could catch the ministers, it would be our intention to push new clause 10 to a vote this evening, but that will turn completely on what the Minister has to say when he comes to sum up. So no pressure, we look forward <laughs> to what the Minister has to say or we will without question push New Clause 10 to a vote. Um, new Clause 19, Madam Deputy Speaker, for me um, gets to the real heart of the issue surrounding criminal finances and that is what I would describe as a responsibility shedding banking sales driven culture that we have in the UK. Um, because the banks are the facilitators of criminal finance and they, they facilitate all the wrongdoing in the financial system. The, the reason we had the crash in 2007 to 2008 is because the pendulum had completely swung from banks being professional organisations looking after the clients' interests to being completely sales-driven, profit-seeking organisations. I think the pendulum has swung too far, and I think it's that swing of that pendulum that created the mess almost 10 years ago now, and I think unless we deal with that culture, then we won't be able to properly deal with the facilitating that, that big companies and banks can give to criminal financers. And it's a shame, again, that that opportunity hasn't been taken. And not long after I was elected to this place, I was quite dismayed to learn that the FCA had withdrew um, their promise to look into banking culture. I mean, why? It's, it's the most obvious thing that should be done to try and clean up the financial system. The public would demand it. I think business efficacy would demand it. And I just cannot understand why either the FCA or the government wouldn't bring forward a review into the very thing, in my view, which has facilitated the crash and could, again, facilitate another crash if we're not too very careful. Um, new Clause 18, Madam Deputy Speaker, is about um, protection for whistleblowers, and it is one that we have tabled. Um, given what I understand about the culture of banks, and given that I, I know it's very, very difficult for employees and banks to put their head above the parapet, um, I think people who work in these organisations that have information that law enforcement agencies could use to address and pursue criminality should have protection. Quite simply, if you raise your head above the parapet in a bank and you tell World and Sundry that that bank is about or has committed criminal acts or is facilitating criminal finance, your career is over, not only in that bank, but generally in the financial services sector. And I don't think the consequence for honesty and transparency should be for you to lose your job and your livelihood, and there should be some form of protection, and that is why we've tabled that particular amendment. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, that concludes my submissions on the new clauses that we have tabled. Um, other than to say, again, ad nauseum, that we support the principles of this bill. We don't think it goes far enough in certain sections, but we do applaud um, the direction of travel that this bill takes the UK economy in. Um, we hope we can go further, and we hope that the provisions in this bill are not caught up in red tape and bureaucracy, and they actually work so we can get at the bad guys' money, so the rest of us who play by the rules can have a fair crack at the whip. Yeah. Rupa Huck. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, this group of amendments contains a fair few of us, so I'll be a bit longer than I was last time. I want to speak in particular about new clause 6, 16 and 17, which in particular I rise to move to a vote. 
Um, so, Madam Deputy Speaker, tax evasion was big news in 2016, following the publication of the Panama Papers, which threw light on those opaque offshore companies. Following their leaking, there was something of an overwhelming sentiment that something should be done. And this bill is that something, or rather it introduces a set of somethings to deal with this problem. It introduces new corporate offences which are no longer reliant on the defunct guiding mind principle. It creates unexplained wealth orders, some other eye-catching stuff as well, the failure to prevent offences that come in, the category of a politically exposed person, and it's made necessary amendments to our pre-existing anti-terror legislation. And the Minister pointed out that it actually builds on a raft of Labour-initiated legislation, the 2002 Proceeds of Crime Act, the Bribery Act of 2010, the Terrorism Act of 2000 and, uh, 2006. So, I mean, all this, we, in, on the whole, we do support this bill and all this stuff is not to be sniffed at. We also mentioned the new additional monitoring that he announced on the spot just a bit earlier. Um, in relation to the human rights abuses uh, that were mentioned in the first grouping this afternoon. However, Madam Deputy Speaker, as the bill has progressed, it has become apparent that this bill does have chinks in the armoury of fighting money in laundering. So we welcome what's in it, but there are concerns, not just from my party, but from a range of charities and NGOs, people like Amnesty International, Christian Aid, Tradecraft, Transparency International, CAFOD, the One Campaign. There are, there are concerns about what it does not contain. And the major elephant in the room is the issue of beneficial ownership and the UK's inaction over tackling the fi financially secretive companies and practices which lie at the heart of the economies of many of our, we keep saying it, overseas <coughs> territories and crown dependencies. This is entirely not present. It's conspicuous by its absence here. In other words, I'm talking about our tax havens, in inverted columns. And this, uh, commas, this silence seems bizarre, given that we're talking about money laundering, tax evasion, terrorist financing. So, I mean, this, this does have to be addressed, whether the government likes it or not. This issue falls within the remit of this bill, because these territories are facilitating, they're aiding and abetting financial crime. Um, I, mean, I remember saying last time I was at this dispatch book speaking on this bill that the UK, along with its overseas territories and crown dependencies, is the biggest secretive financial jurisdiction in the world. And we have a special responsibility to act and lead on this agenda, not just be slightly less bad than everyone else. The UK is facilitating some of the largest and most well-known tax havens in the world. So we should be leading here, not following. Madam Deputy Speaker, when the government has been told it needs to get real, not just by me in the Bill Committee, but by the Court of Public Opinion after those scandalous events of last year, that it needs to get a grip, and t get a grip on and toughen up on overseas and territories and crown dependencies, because they, elicit, because they facilitate illicit financial activity on a global scale. We often have these same, we've heard them trotted out today, excuses that follow, that the UK doesn't have the constitutional legitimacy to legislate for the overseas territories and crown dependencies, that these territories are supposedly adhering to international standards anyway, so making them adopt public registers of beneficial ownership is to coerce them to do something which is not necessary. We're also told that the government does in fact want these territories and dependencies to adopt such registers and they're working towards this, and in light of the progress that's been made, the threat of an order in council to achieve this is unnecessary. The government states that when the rest of the world follows, uh, when the rest of the world follows the lead of the UK and territories, that is when the time will be right that the government will set a global benchmark for financial territory. In fact, the minister himself, at the sixth sitting of the Public Bill Committee, told us when the time is right, when there is an international standard for public registers of beneficial ownership, only then would it be imperative for our overseas territories and crown dependencies to follow suit? He actually claimed that. Um, the Crown dependencies and overseas territories with financial centres are already way ahead of most jurisdictions, including most G20 nation states on tax, tax, tax transparency. So they were told they're doing enough, and now is not the time to upset the apple cart with public registers, especially when they've agreed to adopt centralised registers. And I've got a quote here. The minister might recognise his own words. 
uh, from Bill Committee. I had an amendment pretty much identical to the new clause 6 before us today, and he said, I certainly think these places, that is the overseas territories and crown dependencies, have come 90% of the way. We all have the intention of adopting public registers, and the United Kingdom is leading by example. The, news cl the new clause, because we were threatening, the order, uh, uh, threatening an order in council, he said the new clause is a very strong measure. We should not impose our will on the overseas territories and crown dependencies when they've come so far. And this is the bit that's interesting. He said it's important to recognise we've got where we have through cajoling, working together, peer group pressure, pressure which makes a real difference. And already this kind of seems a bit contradictory, because on the one hand we're saying that we cannot legislate for these dependencies. In fact, I remember the Minister calling me a neo-imperialist, uh, Madam no, Deputy Speaker, no, no. someone whose own parents <laughs> suffered the worst successes of British Empire. Me, a neo It was the first time I was ever called a neo-colonial, whatever it was. <laughs> But look, at the same time, we clearly do have the ability to do this. We do have the option to stop turning a blind eye, to turn inactivity into activity, because, because the minister himself was insisting that, you know, it's a bit of a strong measure, wasn't he? And it's less preferable to his own formula of cajoling and, uh, you know, behind-the-scenes pressuring. And he also said... Um, oh, I will give way. Will she not just once recognise that through cajoling peer group pressure, we have got to a stage where they, by this year they will all have central registers of beneficial ownership or similar, uh, which is ahead of many G20 countries who don't even have central registers. So actually we've come a long way and a lot further than when she was in government. I will listen carefully to what the Minister said. He also said something similar in response to my right honourable friend, the member for Don Valley. I will literally eat my hat, not that I'm wearing one, if that does happen. Because also, these registers have to be in a format that they're easily convertible to public registers. We're not there yet. I mean, I, I strongly refute, and also the 90%, I just wonder, as, a, as someone that conducted empirical social science research, where that 90% figure came from. Because, you know, I know these things are often said in, in, across the dispatch box, this was in a bill committee, in the, on the hoof, in the heat of the moment. And I wouldn't want to label him as a purveyor of fake news, but 90% of the way, really? Does anyone, I mean, and even, even if um, people on the other side were saying, we don't normally do this, there's always a time when, if needed, we can step in, and we would argue that that time is now. I mean, the, the, furthermore, I mean, rather worryingly, the government had a recent reply to the International Development Committee's report tackling corruption overseas, where they emphatically rejected the claim that it needed to do more to ensure the overseas territories and Crown dependencies adopt these public centralised uh, registers. So rather different to the rhetoric that we're hearing today. And there is evidence that behind the scenes, I'm afraid, I'm, I'm sorry to say, Madam Deputy Speaker, the government really has not, in the words of the Minister, really cajoled those governments of Crown dependencies. And I'm talking about Crown dependencies here. Or he hasn't been cajoling hard enough, because if they really had, then I wouldn't have to quote the following statement from the Chief Minister for Jersey in their Hansard in an answer to a question from one of their, I think they're called state senators, they're not MPs, uh, or they're called deputies or something. This uh, deputy was asking the chief minister, when will these uh, public registers of beneficial interest become reality? And the answer he was given, I quote verbatim, the UK government accepts and has accepted in conversations with us that our approach meets the policy aims that they are trying to meet and international bodies, standard setters and reviewers. They have acknowledged that our approach is a leading approach and is superior to some other approaches taken. So, I mean, surely it's hard to see how you can cajole someone to do something when you're simultaneously telling them they don't need to do it. It just speaks for itself. I mean, it just seems that the government is a bit confused as to whether it does or does not want to play its part in creating a fair, ethical and transparent finance system. So, as for, the, as, for the, um, as for the suggestion that the UK lacks the constitutional powers to legislate for the Crown dependencies, we've had examples from both sides here of when these powers have been used. The previous coalition's government's... I think the specific 
Do you have the problems about uh, legislation of the overseas territories rather than Crown Dependency? I think it's understood across the board that Crown Dependency doesn't apply. But given the debate that we've had here today, and it has been a, I think we, we all recognise there's been significant progress made in, in recent <coughs> years on, on this regard. Will she give the pledge at this juncture not to put new clause 6 and let's uh, see the further progress uh, in the months and years to come that hopefully will ensure that we go towards a global protocol which will keep everyone happy? I would like to finish what I'm trying to say first of all. So I was coming to the Crown Dependencies and Overseas Territories. I realise there are two things. I would like to also hear what the Minister says back because at earlier stages he was conciliatory and we did sort of back down over some things. But I'd like to finish what I'm saying first. And it's not just new clause 6. New clause 17, we're looking at both um, overseas territories and crown dependencies because internationally the UK is only going to be able to lecture and persuade others to adopt transparent finance practices if both its overseas territories and crown dependencies stop engaging in I'm going to carry on um, for the moment because I want to make some progress. I'm not able to get a sentence out at the moment. I I will be um, happy to. In fact, uh, the Honourable Gentleman is referenced later on in my speech. We served together so well under his excellent stewardship in the Justice Committee. So he he is in there. Um, The previous coalition government's foreign office, I think it's already been quoted by my right honourable friend for Don Valley, that white paper on overseas territories talks about how, as a matter of constitutional law, the UK Parliament has unlimited power to legislate for the territories. So that's pretty clear, unlimited power. Um, But coming to the Crown Dependencies, which the Honourable Member raised, it does appear that both the Government and also the the SNP, given the remarks of the uh, member who was also on that same Justice Committee at the same time as me, the Honourable Member for Dumfries and Galloway. It does seem that both uh, these two sides have um, accepted or been cowed into believing that the Crown dependencies are somehow untouchable. Um, And it's the report of the... um, of the Honourable Member for Bromley and Chislehurst, I want to quote next, 2010, when they, the Justice Committee did a report into the Crown Dependencies specifically, and that one said the restrictive formulation of the power of the UK Government to intervene in insular affairs on the ground of good governments is accepted by both the UK and Crown Dependency Governments, and a list of examples was given. He probably knows it better than I did because he wrote it. Oh, I'm- all right, go on, if you must. I think it's not unreasonable for her to note that I was not chair, and, uh, chair of the Justice Select Committee at that time. Secondly, can she give me any example where the United Kingdom has specifically legislated as opposed to acting under the prerogative power through the Lieutenant Government, which indeed itself has not been done in many years? It's not the same as the Crown Dependencies legally. I would honestly urge her to reflect on that, because she's genuinely on shaky legal ground. I mean, as I said, there, doesn't, there seems to be a lack of will of, of these. I mean, he, mentioned, he talked at length about Gibraltar. But uh, as I say, the, um, if you'll listen to what I'm saying back, it might be useful as well. Um, but uh, there is a lack of will to do these. These people have been lobbying all of us. He's probably had as well. Uh, and I think rather than the examples, the fact that we have the power to do it is what's more significant. And if needed, it can be done. And our new clause 16 doesn't coerce anyone to do anything, but it puts some steps in the way to facilitate things when they come. Thank you for taking intervention. Given the, uh, the principle of parliamentary sovereignty in this place, it is of course open for this place to legislate on Scotland. Is he suggesting that you would legislate on matters that are devolved to the Scottish Parliament? No, I did not say that. And I think if you'd listened, you'd have heard I did not mention Scotland at all. I would like to make some progress. I'm not going to take any more interventions because I'm at the very beginning of this and the whips are telling me they want me to conclude. So I would like to make some progress. Well done. Um, OK. <laughs> Where were we? Um, so, yeah, look, the question here is not can we do this, but is it right to do so? And the answer you'll find, as the, uh, the um, Madam Deputy Speaker, you will find, no, comes as no surprise that I think the answer is yes. Yeah. The government white paper made it clear that when the law is not working or when there's been a breakdown in order, corruption was actually mentioned, that the UK does have the power to act. So even if it's been mentioned, the British Virgin Islands and the Cayman Islands are prolific offenders who are the most named, I think my uh, right honourable friend, the member for Don Valley, I have said before that I'm not giving way anymore. 
I, I, no, well, it would help. Well, it would help if it would help if members were listening to me. I've given away. How many times have I given away? Numerous times, more than anyone else in any of this debate, which has been here for many hours now. So I would like to make some progress. Um, so even if the British Virgin Islands and Cayman Islands are prolific offenders, I think the British Virgin Islands are the, are the, the worst, are the, the occur the most number of times in the Panama Papers. It doesn't completely absolve the activities of the Crown dependencies. Uh, and I think several members did sort of try and entangle what are the difference between the two. The Isle of Man managed to rack up 8,000 entries in the Panama Papers, and it's currently being singled out by the Canadian Revenue Authorities for investigation. And let's not also forget that in October 2015, the HMRC defeated the Isle of Man on, ta on a tax avoidance scheme worth £200 million in tax, a scheme which took place from 2001 and 2008, which, to, which has left a hole in our finances of £200 million. I mean, that's a not insignificant sum. How many hospitals could we have built for that? That's money going from our exchequer. How many schools could we have built for that? I don't know the precise answer. It's a rhetorical question <laughs> of sorts. But um, in 2007, the tax havens of Guernsey and Jersey were investigated by our serious fraud office for one of the biggest corruption investigations in, in history. So, I mean, in African history, sorry, these things often join up that this sort of money moves around. So the point is clear that the very structure of laws pertaining to finance in these countries, coupled with their deliberate adoption of complex and opaque institutional structures, is crying out for reform. And globally, these dependencies are at the heart of undermining the rule of law, something that we hold so dear to us in other countries due to the corruption they facilitate. Therefore, their laws clearly need to be changed, and there's undeniable scope for us to do so. And as my right honourable friend, who's sadly absent today, the member for Barking, has said on this issue, there is a moral case for us to act. So, I mean, even if there may not be an identical incident in which we have, there is a moral case. Um, and my right honourable friend for Don Valley referred to the polling that shows there's enormous public support for this. I think 80% of people in a recent poll, 8 out of 10. And we were told in Bill Committee that public registers are not an international norm and our Crown dependencies and overseas territories are somehow exemplars in that they've adopted closed registers of beneficial ownership. And lamentably, you know, this might look like a bit of an alternative fact, dare I say it. Because I have here a piece of paper. In fact, it's more than one. It's several stapled together because it's, a, it's 46, 46 jurisdictions on this list. It goes over to three sheets of paper. The following countries, all are dependencies of G20 nation states. So they're in a similar constitutional position to our overseas uh, uh, territories and crown dependencies, they've all got centralised registers of beneficial ownership. Shall I read out all 46 or do you want just a smashing? The Ashmore and Cartier Islands, Christmas Island, the Cocos Keeling Islands, the Coral Sea Islands, the Cook... Okay. Not going to read out all 46, is she? No, we don't... We don't, we don't do, I, I, if I may say so, she has made her point most eloquently and there's no need for all 46 and, it, and we, don't, we don't in this chamber read long lists, but the, the House has got the point that she's making. Rupa Huck. Well, to Madam Deputy Speaker for that clarification. I mean, some of those are the dom -toms, the département outre-mer and the territoire outre -mer. So there are a long list of them. I mean, we, we, Guadeloupe, Martinique. Anyway, I move on. Because um, for the party opposite to claim that the overseas territories and crown dependencies are leading the world in financial transparency due to the creation of these central registers is a bit of a nonsense if there are 46 other countries that are doing it already without being... Uh, are overseas territories or crown dependencies. So not only have some been incredibly slow to catch up with the aforementioned countries, but some of our crown dependencies and overseas territories are some of the worst offenders, and they've not adopted centralised registers, let alone making them public. What they have adopted are platforms, more accurately, and the government's asking us to believe that the British Virgin Islands or the Cayman Islands will be able to police their own financial business by relying on those businesses which facilitate crime 
it's asking them to be to mark their own homework, to be judge and jury. I mean, call me a cynic, but I must admit, I'm doubtful that that's a workable solution. Do we really believe that anonymous countries in the British Virgin Islands, which, for example, allowed the wife of a former Taiwanese president to illicitly purchase $1.6 million worth of property in Manhattan, would be capable of policing itself? I mean, there are several examples of these. Alcoa, the world's, the world's third largest producer of aluminium, would it really be capable of, producing, of policing itself when it used an anonymous company in the British Virgin Islands to transfer millions of dollars in bribes to Bahraini officials? Then there's the anonymous British Virgin Islands-based company used by Tedarin Obang, the son of the president of Equatorial Guinea. Would they really be capable of policing themselves when it allowed him to squirrel away $38 million of state money to buy private jet? It was, in fact, the US Justice Department, which has been referred to earlier, that thanks to them that he was caught. So the government's protesta protestation that working with the territories and dependencies and that we're 90% of the way there is at best highly questionable. Because, oh, sorry. OK. Um, no, there is more. <laughs> Look. Our government should be, the main point I want to make, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that our government should be at the forefront of the push to cast off the cloak of secrecy under which terrorists have previously been able to fund their attacks and by which gangsters store their ill-gotten gains. It, we shouldn't be dragging our feet on this. And again, sometimes it's behind the shield, the fig leaf of the consultation that some of these jurisdictions have hidden, the British Virgin Islands and the Cayman Islands. So... So it's, it's um, new clause 17, really, that I think we're moving to a vote today. I, I will dispense with what I was going to say about... New clause 17. Oh. Is that right? Six. Six. Well, actually, yeah. New clause 17 is the one that we would like to move to a vote today. Because... Um, well, this is largely what I was talking about. As I say, if anyone had listened, it was largely about the overseas... Um, about the Crown dependencies. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, to conclude, we could have gone all the way to become the gold standard for other governments to follow, and we could have satisfied that public disquiet about perceived levels of tax evasion, which the former Prime Minister, to his credit, wanted to see. But now this massive oversight undermines not only those claims made earlier by the now departed former Right Honourable Member for Whitney, but also citizens in some of the poorest developing countries of the world at the end of these complex supply chains of criminality who are the main losers. And the last thing I want to say is that the Home Office, in its press release accompanying the publication of this bill, said that the new offences are aimed at... I quote, sending out a clear message that anyone doing business in and with the UK must have the highest possible compliance standards. This bill, whilst um, largely in scope we agree with, falls short. But, if, but to vote with Her Majesty's loyal opposition right now on the new clause that we're supporting, 17, yes. will go some way to rectifying that. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Minister, Mr Ben Wallace. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member for Ealing Central and Acton and gives me the chance to respond to the many points raised in this debate. It is a regret that the Right Honourable Member for Barking is not here, but for fully understandable reasons, and I want to pay tribute to the work she has done in campaigning for tax transparency uh, and these issues, and uh, I wish her, uh, I send her my best wishes uh, at this time. So uh, I think we should should really come to the main thrust of this, that what's dominated this has really been the question of whether our British overseas territories and crown tendencies should have public registers of beneficial ownership. Now, I'm a supporter of transparency, Madam Deputy Speaker. I was the first member of this House to publish my expenses long before they were acquired. Not a popular thing to do, I have to say at the time, but I was a great believer in transparency. And I learnt that from my time in the Scottish Parliament because I'm also a great believer in respecting devolution and respecting constitutional arrangements. And that is where I think we have to make some point. To my right honourable friend, the member for Oundle, we haven't changed our ambition. Our ambition is still to have 
public register of beneficial ownership in countries, including uh, overseas territories and crown dependencies. And I repeated that to the leaders of the overseas territories and crown dependencies just two weeks ago. But how we get there is where him and I differ, Madam Deputy Speaker. Because I think what we have to recognise is ever since David Cameron held that anti-corruption summit, we have gone a long way. 90%, 89%, 85%, I, I don't know, not technically, I didn't do the same course as the member for Ealing and Acton when it came to deciding, but we now have a commitment to either central registers or linked registers, because technically, uh, as the right honourable member for Amber uh, Valley maybe uh, uh, needs to recognise, is that you can link registers and interrogate them centrally. It's perfectly possible to do that, uh, but we will have that commitment uh, to be fulfilled in 2017. We, we aim to be uh, there in June, uh, and we have also uh, a commitment to allow automatic access for our law enforcement agencies to those registers. And we already do in some of those territories with, with uh, requests coming back within hours. So, from my point of view, as a Home Office Minister, a minister charged with making sure that we see off organised crime, tackle corruption, tackle money laundering, I'm here because I believe that those arrangements at present are able to allow us to deal with potential crime and tax evasion. If I didn't think that, I wouldn't be here making the point that now is not the time to impose that on our overseas territories and crown dependencies. Because I have faith that at the moment the capabilities of our law enforcement agencies will be able to interrogate those systems and we will be able to follow up and prosecute those people, not only encouraging evasion tax in this country, but evading tax in other countries as well, which is what this bill gives us in an extraterritorial reach that many other countries don't have. Can you give us the House categorical assurance that none of the money made from ill-gotten gains of criminal activity through fuel fraud in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland isn't illicitly put into those countries? Well, what I can say is that we find criminals using the banking systems all over the world to hide their money, whether it is in Northern Ireland, in London, uh, in the Republic of Ireland, uh, in Crown Dependencies or elsewhere. And that's why they have agreed to work with us to allow our law enforcement agencies and their law enforcement agencies access to our databases in order to follow it up. But we should also talk about the leadership role the United Kingdom uh, is taking. And I, I think the Honourable Member for Ealing and Acton underplays uh, the success the United Kingdom has got with its leadership without imposing on democratically elected governments in those countries, without imposing our will in some sort of post in colonial way, <laughs> we have achieved linked registers, access to registers for our law enforcement agencies across many of those Crown dependencies uh, and overseas territories. And if we would like to compare our nearest neighbours, the major economies, and I don't mean the Christmas islands, with all due respect to the Christmas islands, uh, the major economies such as Germany and European neighbours such as Spain, we are the ones with a public register. We are the ones ready to have a unified uh, a central register, not those. And perhaps we should start with the major economies rather than sailing out to impose in a gunboat our will over some of these overseas territories who have done an awful lot so far uh, in getting to a position where I am confident our law enforcement agencies can bring people to justice. And that's the real fundamental point of this principle for me. Uh, we haven't abandoned our ambition. We have decided that the way to do it is not to impose uh, that. And, and the Labour Party's amendment, I think, is probably constitutionally bankrupt corrupt, if I can use that phrase. It certainly would cause all sorts of problems if it was actually to be imposed. I'm not sure that's actually how you can impose on a Crown dependency uh, your will. It sort of suddenly leaves out overseas territories. So all, all the good words uh, by the member for uh, Ealing and Act seem to have disappeared because it only applies to Crown dependencies. If you think it's right for Crown dependencies, why not right for overseas territories? I don't see why you have uh, left that uh, off. Uh, the amendment, and I suspect that's because I uh, don't actually know what you're talking about when it really comes to it in the Labour Party. Because I think, well, because I, I think if the Labour Party had been successful at it, they might have done it in their 13 years in government. Uh, well, I, I, you know, I, I think I think what I would say is, 
I respect devolution and I respect constitutional arrangements, and I think it is very important at this stage that we uh, actually uh, do that. And I think, crucially, I believe that if we do it in partnership, we will get there. I think when we see people being uh, prosecuted, uh, when we see the system of uh, information exchange between our law enforcement agencies working, I think that is where uh, we will get to a successful uh, point. Uh, and I am confident we're going to get there. I do not shy away from telling the overseas dependencies and the, the overseas territories of Crown dependencies it is our ambition for transparency. Uh, but I think, first and foremost, our ambition is for a central registered, easily interrogated by our law enforcement uh, agencies. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, if I were to move on to the other areas in the corporate failure to prevent economic Wait, crime. I am very grateful to my honourable friend for, for giving way just before he moves on. And I welcome his uh, restatement that the government remains committed to um, uh, transparency. Can, could he give some kind of indication of the timetable that he expects the overseas territories will be able to move to full transparency uh, once his uh, policy of, of registers is fully in place? Well, the, the, the first commitment is for the central register to be by June of this year. Where uh, overseas territories have trouble fulfilling that, e.g. they just didn't have the capacity to do it, we have offered help to allow them to do that. Uh, and, and hopefully that means we will keep... Uh, on target. Uh, as for an actual setting a date uh, for public register, I think the first thing is we have to complete our own and get that up and running. And I think once we know our own challenges in, in doing it and seeing how that works, then I think we can have a grown-up discussion with, with our G20 partners about when they are going to do that. And I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, just focus on, on the overseas territories and crown dependencies. Very major economies, including our own, are guilty of, be, of allowing people to hide uh, illicit funds, which is why we're bringing this bill before us. And I suspect uh, that where we will find many funds laundered are not in those small overseas territories, but will be in some of those major economies in the G20. Uh, and I think that's important. Can I ask the Minister to help to clarify for the House a number of his honourable friends in arguing against new Clause 6 use the argument of competitive disadvantage, not an argument that he himself has specifically addressed at the dispatch box. Can the Minister assure us that when it comes to when the time might be right in the future, that he is not saying that so long as any of these territories cite concerns about competitive disadvantage, the British Government would just back off? I think what we do have to recognise is the difference between secrecy and privacy, and, and we, have to, look, we have to respect that and understand when privacy is an advantage uh, and, and when it is being used uh, uh, secretly as a disadvantage or, or to avoid detection. So I, I think there is a difference between privacy and secrecy. It, it's not as straightforward uh, as the saying that we all deserve in our lives some element of privacy. Private companies, those shareholdings, for example, and some very major private companies, they're not listed publicly. You, can, you, can't, you, can't, you have to declare that, and that's been established for many years. It's just to clarify the point that some of his honourable friends were saying that the ground, their grounds for not supporting new Clause 6 was they felt these territories would be put at a competitive disadvantage if they had to go with public registers. Is the Minister saying that is the Government's case, or is he making it clear that that's an argument from his honourable friends but not from the dispatch box? The United Kingdom government doesn't think it's a competitive uh, disadvantage because that is why we're progressing with a public uh, register of ourselves. But I think you know, we'll lead by example and we'll lead by peer group pressure. We won't lead by imposition. And I think that is fundamentally uh, the difference between me uh, and the government and other members of this House. It, it, it's how we're going to get there. No, I'm going to have to, to, to press on. Uh, I, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not going to... Uh, the damage caused by economic crime perpetuated on behalf in the name of companies to individuals, businesses, the wider economy and the reputation of the United Kingdom as a place to do business is a very serious matter. And this is in the area of corporate failure to prevent economic crime, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Government has already taken action in respect of bribery committed in pursuit of corporate business objectives, and this Bill will introduce similar offences in relation to tax evasion. But both these offences followed lengthy public consultations, as is appropriate for matters like this, which involve complex legal and policy issues. 
That is why I confirmed in the committee that the government would be launching a public call for evidence on corporate criminal liability for economic crime. Yeah, yeah. That call for evidence was published on the 3rd of January, 13th of January and has opened until the 24th of March. The call for evidence will form part of a potentially two-part consultation process. It openly requests and examines evidence for and against, against the case for reform and seeks views on a number of possible options such as the failure to prevent model. Should the responses we receive justify the change in the law, the Government would then consult on firm proposal. It would be wrong to rush into legislation in this area, but I hope honourable members will recognise that the Government is looking closely at this issue and I encourage them to contribute to the consultation process. Moving to limited partnerships, which was raised by honourable members for Kirkcaldy and Cowden Beath and indeed uh, gener more generally by the Scottish National Party. And I'm grateful for the work they have done alongside the Glasgow Herald in highlighting the abuse of the Scottish Limited Partnership by criminals, both internationally and domestically, uh, and I think it is important that we address uh, that issue. And because we take these allegations very seriously, and the... the door.
的。The eyes to the right, 188. The nose to the left, 301. Thank you. The eyes to the right, 188. The nose to the left, 301. So the nose have it. The nose have it. Unlock. Order, Mr. Richard Arkless, to move new clause 19 formally. Thank you. The question is that new clause 19 be read a second time. As many as other opinions say, aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. no. Division. Clear the lobby. Order. The question is that new clause 19 be read a second time. As many as other opinions say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. No. Tell us for the ayes, Mrs. Marion Fellows, Mr. Owen Thompson. Tell us for the noes, Heather Wheeler and Steve Brine.
Ross! Order! Order! The eyes to the right, 241. The nose to the left, 300. The eyes to the right, 241. The nose to the left, 300. So the nose have it. The no's have it. Unlock. Order. With the leave of the House, we will take all the Government amendments and the Government motion to transfer Clause 12, Subsection 3, together to move these formally. I call the Minister. Formally move. Thank you. The question is that Government amendments 2 to 19 be made 
that the motion to transfer clause 12 subsection 3 be agreed to and that government amendments 20 to 72 be made. As many as have that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Point of order, Sue Heyman. Uh, Mr Speaker, I wonder if you could advise me. Um, I have been down to Downing Street today, along with a constituent who travelled all the way from West Cumbria, to hand in a petition. Unfortunately, we were turned away at the gates. I was told that I would not be allowed to go down to Downing Street to hand in this petition that was properly booked in through the proper procedures. We were offered a time to hand in a petition about health services. They understood what the petition was about. Um, when I asked the security officer from number 10 Downing Street why I was not allowed to, to hand the petition in as agreed, he told me that today was not a good day. What? When I pressed him on this, he told me I could hand it in after Thursday. Oh. I am concerned that I have been prevented from handing in a petition that was properly booked in through the procedures because of a by-election and that this has been politicised. Can the Ed Speaker advise me what my best course of action is? Well, I'm very grateful to the Honourable Lady for her point of order and for just now giving me a moment's advance notice of it. She is clearly concerned and aggrieved. My initial response is to say to her that it's not a point of order for the Chair or indeed, for that matter, a subject for the House <coughs> authorities. I do understand her concern, not least in terms of personal inconvenience, and I trust that it's been heard on the Treasury bench. It is very much a matter for Ministers with whom it has now been registered, but I repeat that it is not a matter for the Chair. Thank you. We'll leave it there. Consideration completed. Yes. Consideration completed. Third reading. Now. Whip says now. <laughs> Thank you. The Minister to move the third reading. Minister Ben Wallace. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I beg to move that the bill now be read a third time. Mr Speaker, financial profit is at the heart of almost all forms of serious and organised crime, which directly affects the most vulnerable in society. The Criminal Finance Bill will significantly improve our ability to tackle money laundering, corruption, tax evasion and terrorist financing. It is a key part of this Government's critical work to reduce the flow of dirty money into the city and to cut off the funding streams to the fraudsters, money launderers and kleptocrats. This country is the largest centre for cross-border banking. The UK is and will remain a good place to do business. And yet, the National Crime Agency estimates that up to £90 billion may be laundered here each year. I have been clear, and so has my right honourable friend the Prime Minister and indeed her predecessor, that we need to make the UK a hostile environment for those seeking to move, hide and use the proceeds of crime and corruption. In an increasingly competitive international marketplace, the UK simply cannot afford to be seen as a haven for dirty money. We must not turn a blind eye to the money of corrupt officials that flows through businesses, banks and property, and that is why this Criminal Finance Bill, in my view, is so important. I want to thank the Right Honourable Lady, the Shadow Home Secretary, and the Honourable Member, the Member for Ealing Central and Acton, as well as the Honourable Members for Dumfries and Galloway and Kirkcaldy and Cowden Beath, for their input throughout this Bill's consideration by this House. Other honourable members have also brought considerable knowledge and expertise uh, to, such, to the proceedings. We have been, and I have been determined as a minister, to be open to an input to all parties, and I am pleased that we have made in some way some concessions towards addressing the issues raised. I know it is not all of the concerns that have been raised, but I have certainly made sure that hopefully the bill leaving this place is a bill better than when it was introduced, and it has taken on the points raised by both the Labour Party and the Scottish National Party, and indeed my right honourable friends uh, from the back benches. Mr Speaker, we have had further detailed debate of the Bill at the report stage today, with many well-informed contributions from all parts of the House. The debate has covered the scope of the unexplained wealth orders and other powers in Part 1 of the Bill, as well as covering the corporate offences regarding the failure to prevent the facilitation of tax evasion. 
Of course, much of today's debate has focused on issues that were not part of the Bill itself, most notably the amendment in the name of my honourable friend, the Member for Isha and Walton, and the Right Honourable Lady, the Member for Barking and others, which sought to impose sanctions on those involved in gross human rights abuse or violations overseas. The strength of feeling on this issue is clear, and the treatment of Sergei Maninsky was undeniably deplorable. <coughs> this Government is committed to promoting and strengthening universal human rights globally. Our approach focuses on, on holding to account those states responsible for the worst violations of human rights and working with those states determined to strengthen protections against abuse. But we have listened to the House, and our amendment will allow for the recovery of property connected with torture or cruel, inhumane and degrading treatment overseas. This sends out a strong message <coughs> that those seeking to profit from torture and other serious abuses will not be able to do so in the United Kingdom. Mr Speaker, the House also debated the commitments made by the overseas territories to tackling corruption and money laundering in their financial systems. The UK is at the forefront of the global approach to increasing corporate transparency and tackling tax evasion and corruption. That work started under David Cameron and it continues today. I share the desire for the Crown dependencies and overseas territories to take further steps towards transparency. That is why this Government continues to work closely with them towards that goal. <coughs> but we must recognise the significant progress they have already made, putting them well ahead of some others in other jurisdictions. <coughs> the Criminal Finance Bill and the wider package of measures which it is part of will give agencies the powers they need to ensure that crime does not pay in a Britain that works for everyone. It is important that these powers are available to all parts of the United Kingdom. But as our honourable friend said out earlier today, we will still await the outcome of elections in Northern Ireland before we can commence the provisions there. We need for the, the need for the legislation is significant and particularly timely, and we negotiate our future relationship with the European Union. Now more than ever, we must showcase the UK as one of the best places in the world to do business, as we form new ties with international friends and partners. Serious and organised crime costs the United Kingdom at least £24 billion annually and deprives people of their security and their prosperity. We task our law enforcement agencies with combating the evolving threat from both criminals and terrorists, and I pay credit to all the work they do on our behalf. But without the necessary powers to pursue and prevent these illicit activities, they fight a losing battle. This Government has done a lot and more to tackle money laundering and terrorist financing. But the scale of the threat is clear and we must do more. This Bill sends a clear message that we will not stand for money laundering or the funding of terrorism through the United Kingdom, and I commend it to the House. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the question is that the Bill be now read the third time. Diane Abbott. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, on this side of the House we broadly support the thrust of this legislation. And we have noted that the Minister has proved to be a listening Minister, which is something that we have welcomed. And I just wanted to say that tax avoidance and money laundering are the opposite of victimless crimes. In the first instance, you have inflated asset prices in the territories where the money is laundered. And there is no bigger example of that than the housing market in this country, and in particular the housing market in London. You can walk down streets in some of the most expensive parts of London, and most of those houses are completely empty. Some may be because it's the wrong time of year for their owner. Some may be because they've been bought as an investment. But increasing numbers of those properties are being used to launder money. And if this legislation um, is able to bear down on this, it will be of value not least to people who are victims of the, the wildly inflated London housing market. Tax avoidance and money laundering mean a loss of tax to some of the poorest communities in the world. I was in Ghana last year looking at tax avoidance and tax evasion, and I was struck by the fact that you can, you can pay proportionately less tax as a woman selling drinks by the side of the road than some of the biggest drinks manufacturers in the world. These are distorted systems of taxation, and again, if this legislation can bear down on that type of tax avoidance, it is to be welcomed. And I was 
pleased to hear the Minister say that we're beginning to return money to some of these territories, notably to Macau, and I believe that we've signed an accord with Nigeria. And this legislation, perhaps above all, is very important in suppressing corruption. So it's not just a law enforcement measure. Indirectly, it's an anti-corruption measure. I would remind the House that the background, the background and genesis for this bill was the Panama Papers. They showed extremely widespread and highly lucrative avoidance of tax on an industrial scale. There were 11 million leaked files. And Britain was the second most prominent country where the law firm's middlemen operated. It was second only to Hong Kong. And one British overseas territory, the British Virgin Islands, was by far the most popular tax haven state used by the firms in the document. The, the Minister has said that we're at the forefront in action on tax avoidance and money laundering, so we should be. The UK has sovereignty over a third of tax havens internationally. We welcome Government's new Clause 7, which, uh, which deals with the issue of um, bearing down on money recycled as a consequence of human rights abuses elsewhere. We still believe that there is insufficient scope for civil recovery of assets and the enforcement powers and civil re recovery provisions could be improved. And there are particularly important omissions regarding the penalties for offences relating to the facilitation of tax avoidance, the middlemen, lawyers' accountants and straightforward spits, such as which were identified in the Panama Papers. On the question of disclosure of beneficial ownership, we feel this is a major problem as lack of disclosure can help facilitate money laundering and corruption. And to just take one example, in a business innovation and skills department consulta consultation paper in March 2016, the government itself said that between 2004 and 2014, over £180 million worth of property in the UK was being investigated by UK law enforcement as it was suspected to be funded by the proceeds of corruption. Moreover, over 75% of these properties use offshore corporate ownership. This is believed to be the tip of the iceberg in terms of the scale and proceeds of corruption invested in UK property through offshore companies. But on the question of the overseas territories and crown dependencies, I understand the technical argument, which you can't, it says you can't apply the same regime to crown dependencies as overseas territories. But the substantial moral issue is the same. And let me just say something about overseas territories. Some members of this House speak as if the population of the overseas territories as a whole benefit from financial services. That is not the case. It's only in recent years that the financial services industry has been willing and open to employing people born and bred on those islands in advisory, legal and management positions. So let's not, just because political elites in those countries will argue for light touch regulation. Let us not delude ourselves as a house as saying financial services is helping those territories as a whole. And we believe on this side that the argument we cannot impose proper standards on these territories is false. UK jurisdiction applies in all matters of defence and security. The House has a right and a duty to see how best to impose those laws. We believe on this side that the people that are benefiting from the secrecy and lack of regulation are the tax evaders and avoiders, money launderers, major criminal enterprises and terrorist networks. And we would urge the government to move forward on these issues. If legislation is required for onshore activity here in the UK, most reasonable people would argue it's even more pressing to include overseas territories and crown dependencies. We on this side are calling for a wide ranging review of, UK, of the UK tax gap, including an assessment of the lack of income tax, the loss of income tax due to tax evasion. And as a number of members on both sides of the House have said, this legislation, if it simply rests on the statute book and does not result 
in commensurate prosecutions will be legislation that is a dead letter. We note the Minister has listened thus far and we hope the Government and the appropriate Government departments are listening when I urge the Government to make sure this legislation is more than just good intentions. This legislation is actively used to bear down on tax evasion, on money laundering and corruption. Yeah. 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 Nobody else wishes to speak on third reading. The question is that the bill be now read the third time. As many as other opinions say aye. 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 Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. This debate has been concluded with notable speed. We come now to the next motions, and with the leave of the House, we will debate motions three and four on Social Security and pensions together. To move the first motion, I call the Minister. Caroline Noakes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I beg to move that the draft Social Security Benefits Uprating Order 2017, which was laid before this House on the 16th of January, be approved. With the leave of the House, and as you have indicated, Mr Speaker, my remarks will cover both items 3 and 4 on the order paper. In my view, the provisions in both these orders are compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights. I would like first to deal with what is an entirely technical matter that we attend to in this place each year, and not one which I imagine we will need to dwell on today. The Guaranteed Minimum Pensions Increase Order 2017 provides for contracted out benefit schemes to increase the mem- so, apologies. To increase the members' guaranteed minimum pensions that accrued between 1988 and 1997 by 1%. Mr. Speaker, I should now like to turn to the Social Security Benefits Uprating Order 2017. This statutory instrument reflects the Government's continuing commitment to increase the basic and new state pension with the triple lock by 2.5% to increase the pension credit standard minimum guarantee in line with earnings, and to increase benefits to meet additional disability needs and carers' benefits in line with prices. The Chancellor reaffirmed this Government's commitment to the triple lock for the length of this Parliament in his autumn statement on 23 November last year. This ensures that the basic state pension will continue to be uprated by the highest of earnings, prices, or 2.5%. This year, the increase in average earnings and the increase in prices were less than the baseline of 2.5%, which means the basic state pension will increase by 2.5%. From April 2017, the rate of the basic state pension for a single person will increase by £3 to £122.30 a week. As a result, from April 2017, the basic state pension will be over £1,200 a year higher compared to April 2010. We estimate that the basic state pension will be around 18.5% of average earnings, one of its highest levels relative to earnings for over two decades. Last year, the Government introduced the new state pension for people reaching their state pension age from 5 April 2016 onwards. This made the system clearer, providing a sustainable foundation for private saving. The Government has previously announced that the triple lock will apply to the full rate of the new state pension for the length of this Parliament. This is the first year that the new state pension will be uprated, and as a result, this year the full rate of the new state pension will also increase by 2.5%, which means from April 2017 the full rate of the new state pension will increase by £3.90 to £159.55 a week. This will be around 20. Occupational pension scheme providers will continue to revalue any guaranteed minimum pensions that people have built up. For people retire, retiring after the 6th of April 2016, the Government will no longer take account of inflation increases to guaranteed minimum pensions when operating people's new state pension. The changes mean any guaranteed minimum pensions that people have accrued between 1978 and 1988 will not be uprated, and the scheme provider will only uprate guaranteed minimum pensions built up between 1988 and 1997 to a maximum of 3% each year. The National Audit Office was contacted by people approaching retirement age who had concerns that these new arrangements for a single tier 
uh, state pension would leave them worse off than they would be under the guaranteed minimum pension. And they all also raised concerns regarding the lack of notice that they had received. And where have we heard that before, Mr Speaker? The NAO investigated this and concluded that, some, uh, that there would be some winners and some uh, losers under the new arrangements. The lo those losing out depend uh, on the amount of time that they were contracted in the scheme. And the NAO also commenta uh, commented that, again, there had been a dearth of, of information for these new retirees. The, uh, the NAO suggested those who lose under the new rules may be able to build up additional entitlements to state pensions. Uh, and the report concluded uh, and recommended that the government, via the Department for Work and Pensions, should improve its evidence and analysis of the impact of these reforms and pro provide much clearer targeted information to the public about how they will be affected. So I'd be very grateful if the Minister, in her uh, remarks, could update us on how, these, uh, how her department is responding to the findings of the NAO report. Moving on to the Social Security's Uprating Order for 2017, this provides for the annual uprating of Social Security entitlements excluded from the Government's freeze to levels of Social Security enacted in the 2016 Welfare Reform and Work Act. This year, the Secretary of State has decided to uprate Social Security entitlements by a CPI inflation of 1%. And as the Minister has already explained that this, this covers attendance allowance, uh, carers allowance, disability living allowance, personal independence payment, industrial injuries benefit, bereavement benefits, incapacity benefit and severe disablement allowance, um, to name uh, but a few. The Secretary of State has also decided to upgrade the new state pension in accordance with the triple lock and pension credit in line with earnings at 2.4%. Mr Speaker, we would not stand in the way of measures to increase the adequacy of the social security net as, it, as uh, applied by those uh, benefits, but, but you know, this is especially after seven years where the system has been under considerable attack. We will therefore be supporting um, the operating measures put forward in this order, but I must take an opportunity uh, to expand on my real concerns not just um, in the inadequate uprating uh, of this, this order, but this seen in the context of the freezing of many social security payments from last year's uh, Welfare Reform and Work Act and real cuts uh, to certain social security support, for example, ESA, RAG, the UC work allowances, and as we were discussing yesterday, the widow pensions allowance, again to name just a, a few. This is a, the erosion of the adequacy of social protection for often the most vulnerable yeah, yeah, in society. Yeah, yeah. Would the Shadow Minister give way? I will. I Shadow but, Shadow but surely the Shadow Minister would recognise that our support for those with long-term health conditions and disabilities had increased to a record amount and has increased by £3 billion a year, showing we are directing money to the most vulnerable in society, and rightly so. Yeah. I'm grateful to the, the former uh, Minister Pensions, uh, sorry, beg your pardon, disabled uh, <coughs> Minister. Um, in, in actual effect, we know that uh, the level of Social Security um, support is actually declining by 2020. And again, if we look at the level of spending, and that's, that's the government, the uh, former Minister is shaking his head, but these are the government's own figures. Uh, and if we look at the level of spending, for example, in relation to Europe as a percentage of GDP, we are in the same way that we're below average around health spending, we are also below the EU average for social security spending. So let's let, uh, start uh, first with rising costs, Mr Speaker. Traditionally, the link of social security to inflation has ensured that some of the most vulnerable households in our country are not made worse off on, year on year by inflation in the cost of basic goods and services. The adequacy of Social Security has, hev has been heavily eroded over the last seven years. Research by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation demonstrates that the prices of essentials has written, risen three times faster than wages over the last ten years. Combined with the Coalition's initial 1% freeze on operating uh, that was introduced into the 2012 Reform Act, 
and then the complete social security uh, freeze in last year's uh, act, low-income households have, been, have, have seen a significant deterioration in the adequacy of, uh, inadequacy of social security support since 2010. <clears throat> Clearly, the historic drop in oil prices and subsequent low slowdown in the inflation of household goods provided some respite to low-income households, but we know the impacts of the EU referendum, for example, on food on fuel prices is only just starting. People on low income spend a large, much larger proportion of their household budgets on essential goods and services that have been so f uh, uh, prone to inflation and therefore likely to have felt the effects of spiralling prices long after they have slowed down. It's now the case that the cost of basic household items are again beginning to rise, with last month's official figures showing inflation at a two-year high of 1.8%. And I understand, Mr Speaker, if the actual costs uh, and increases in, in, in food prices are approximately 20%, but have only just started to see that, bit, uh, that uh, rise being passed on to consumers. It, it is going to get worse. So this put real, pre uh, real pressure upon households trying to provide for their basic needs. Indeed, last week's uh, JRF publication uh, showed that 19 million people are now struggling to make ends meet and get the basics needed for socially acceptable sta a socially accepted standard of living. So in this context, the 1% up rating to some social security entitlements is unlikely to do much for those that are struggling to get by. And if the Prime Minister is really serious about helping those groups, I would urge uh, some reconsideration there. As a matter of principle, Mr Speaker, it, is, it seems only fair that Social Security should rise in line with inflation and should apply to all entitlements, not just the ones that the government has cherry-picked. While the economic arguments for, for a freeze may once have been founded on the slowdown in the prices of the basics that every household needs, now that prices are predicted to rise by 10% by 2020, even this weak economic justification no longer stands up. This is even before we get to the social arguments for protecting the incomes of the poorest people in our society, whom this government has set out to punish over the last seven years. In, last year, in, the last years, in the last year's or party uh, inquiry into the impacts of the Welfare Reform Act on child poverty and child health, the freeze on social security support payments was singled out as the most damaging. And if I could remind uh, members of the estimated increase in child poverty that the Institute of Fiscal Studies has come up of an increase of about a million directly as a result of Social Security and tax changes, the, and the fact that this will impact on their health and their future. So I would like to make a really impassioned plea to the government, to the Minister. We are now approaching um, April when a number of other disability benefits will be um, cut, and I would urge the government to reconsider. Mr Speaker, uh, I won't keep the House um, much longer, but I, I would urge the government to review the cap uh, before price inflation begins to pick up again. If they really cared about those struggling to make ends meet, that's exactly what they would be doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the meantime, although we regret the limit of groups who will benefit from that, this uprating, we will be supporting this order. Dr Ailey Whiteford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm glad we're able to debate both these items uh, simultaneously together this evening. Obviously, we won't be opposing the Social Security uprating order and certainly welcome the pensions <laughs> uprating order before us tonight. However, I think it is an opportunity to put on record once again our deep concern about the ongoing impact the freeze in working age benefits is having on low income households, particularly tax credits which are mostly paid to working families with children and employment support allowance paid to those who are not currently fit for work but are in the work related activity group. Any of us who regularly push a trolley around a supermarket are in no doubt at all that the price of basic foods and household essentials is rising and rising sharply. 
The depreciation in the value of the pound last year has taken some time to filter through to retail prices, but increases in the price of imported food and other goods is now very visible. And the Bank of England has made it clear that it expects inflation to remain well above the 2% target for a number of years. So I do hope that ahead of the budget and looking forward, the government will look again at the benefit freeze and recognise that those on low and middle incomes spend a much larger proportion of their income on essentials than wealthier households and are disproportionately affected by rising food and fuel prices. In this context, a 1% rise in those benefits that are included in the order is unlikely to keep pace with the increases in prices we expect to see over the coming months. The hon. Member for Oldham and Saddleworth has already alluded to the Joseph Browntree Foundation assessment of the rising costs of essentials, which should give us all pause to thought, but for thought. But I think one other simple example is that many of the severely sick and disabled people who will receive a 1% up rating, those, for example, who receive ESA as part of the support group, have limited mobility and are likely to spend a lot of time at home. Inevitably, they incur high heating costs during the winter months. Yet the cost of energy is rising. Some of the big energy companies have already made announcements of uh, price increases, and others have said they are set to follow. Of those benefits that will be uprated by 1%, including most disability and carer benefits, uh, including ESA, disability carers and pensioners, pre pensioners premiums, statutory maternity and paternity pay, statutory sick pay, all these are paid to people likely to be disproportionately affected by rising energy costs, all of them uh, paid to people unable to work or limited in their ability to work. Financial hardship is an increasing reality for households affected by sickness and disability, and as prices rise, that is only going to get worse. Even with increases to the minimum wage and personal allowances, large numbers of working parents and disabled people are significantly worse off in real terms and finding it harder than ever to make ends meet. Mr Speaker, when even the Financial Times is highlighting, as they did earlier this month, the strains on household finances that are already apparent and is warning that a combination of falling living standards and rising inequality would be extremely dangerous in today's febrile politics, I think we really should heed those warnings. I want to turn now to the pensions issues in this, these orders and highlight the proposed increase in the single-tier pension. This has actually been the first full year that the new single-tier pension has been in effect, but I still get the very strong impression that it is poorly understood among the general public. Although I welcome the 2.5 per cent increase in the single-tier pension, I am not at all clear how many pensioners will actually receive the full benefit of this. We know that there are both winners and losers in this transition process, and that most new pensioners will not receive the full uh, single-tier pension. Prior to its introduction, the estimates were that only around 22 per cent of women and around half of men reaching pension age would be entitled to the full single-tier pension. So perhaps the Minister today can give us a, a clarification on what's actually happened in practice, whether those uh, assessments were right and what proportion of male and female pensioners have actually received the full whack. And what ongoing impact assessment has the Department been undertaking? Perhaps the Minister will also be able to give the House an update on the pensions dashboard. I certainly get the sense that there are real gaps in most people's knowledge of the new system and that a lot of people coming up to retirement are in for a nasty shock when they realise they won't be eligible for as much as they think. In this context, Mr Speaker, it would be very wrong not to mention the WASPy women, many of whom got insufficient and wholly inadequate notice of the shift in their pension age and who, as a consequence, will lose enormous sums of money over the course of their retirement. I had a letter from a constituent this week who is one of the WASPy women affected who did not get proper information about the changes and has had no time to plan for them. She is facing an uncertain future in more ways than one in that she is currently undergoing treatment for cancer and says that she does not know if she will ever receive her pension. She is hopeful that she will make a good recovery. Certainly, I send my good wishes to her. But she makes the sobering point that none of us know what is round the corner. And there's a basic injustice here. And that's why, even though she's ill, she's determined to fight for a fairer settlement. We can and we must do better by these thousands of women who are losing out. And while we're on the subject of women and gender equality in pensions, I'm sorry also that in the last year, the government's removed savings credits for new pensioners. Around 80% of those who previously benefited from savings credit were women, most of whom will have spent their working lives in low-paid jobs and are unlikely to have had access to an occupational pension scheme. 
Nevertheless, these are people who manage to save against the odds despite the limited opportunities. There is little enough incentive for people in low-paid jobs to save, and reducing savings credit and abolishing it for new pensioners erodes that incentive even further. Mr Speaker, pensions uprating is a wistful dream for some pensioners. Those who have so-called frozen pensions re remain uh, left out of pensions uprating. That is still a very live issue, and it is one that is likely to be more acute in the months ahead. Those entitled to a UK state pension by virtue, for having by virtue of having worked for it and paid their contributions, but for them, for whatever reason, have spent their retirement domiciled abroad, face very different circumstances depending on whether or not their country of residence is a reciprocal agreement with the UK for the purposes of uprating state pensions. Those in countries that do not have a reciprocal arrangement with the UK see their pensions frozen at their initial retirement level, so in real terms they see the value of their pension fall every single year. There are thought to be more than half a million people with frozen pensions, mostly in Commonwealth countries like Australia, Canada, New Zealand and South Africa, but also India, Pakistan and parts of Caribbean and Africa, countries with strong family and historic links to the UK. It is an issue that is only going to become more acute in the months ahead as the UK leaves the EU and the EEA. At the moment, UK pensioners who retire to sunnier parts of the continent, and there are currently thought to be around 400,000 of them, uh, get their pensions uprated uh, throughout the European economic area as normal. But when we leave the EU, there is going to be a need for those reciprocal arrangements to be put in place if these pensioners are not to find themselves in the same difficult situation as those living in Canada and Australia. I hope the Minister will be able to share the Government's thinking on that issue and what steps they are taking to protect UK pensioners who live in other parts of Europe. We also need to deal with the fact that many of those approaching pension age who have lived through an era of globalisation will have worked in several EU countries and may have accrued pension rights in several parts of, uh, of Europe, wee bits of pension in several systems. That is true for many people who have worked in global industries or for multinational corporations. It is a bit of a minefield and it would be immensely helpful if the Minister could offer reassurances to those UK pensioners that these issues are on their radar and will be addressed. Mr Speaker, I hope the Minister will take the opportunity to address all these issues as she closes the debate this evening. Minister Caroline Noakes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I would like to begin by thanking both the uh, honourable ladies on the front benches opposite for their contributions today. Uh, there were some specific points raised which I will attempt to address in full. Uh, the Government did respond to the National Audit Office report outlining the, uh, the online Check Your State Pension Service, which now delivers personalised information to people many years in advance. The report also acknowledged that uh, the aggregate impacts of the reforms need to be taken into account. Taking all elements of the reform, around 75 per cent of people will receive more from the new state pension by 2030 than under the previous systems. There is no statutory requirement for formally contracted out pension schemes to increase uh, for those accrued between 1978 and 88. The Government does not intend to induce, introduce legislation requiring those schemes to index pre-1988 GMP rights. This needs to be set in context with the changes to the overall pension landscape. There are other aspects of pension reform which may offset the loss of indexation. For example, by maintaining the triple lock in this Parliament, and since 2011, the basic state pension has risen by £570 a year more than it had it been uprated by earnings. We do know that work, not welfare, is the best and most sustainable route out of poverty, which is why our tax and welfare reforms are designed to ensure that work pays and increased earnings are rewarded rather than penalised. However, we remain committed to supporting people who cannot work and those with additional needs, which is why these orders provide for an additional £2.5 billion in 2017-18 to increase benefits for pensioners, for carers and for the additional costs of disability. We have had to make difficult decisions on spending. And to protect those with additional needs, we are increasing the ESA support group component in line with CPI and will also be increasing the enhanced disability, severe disability, carer and pensioner premiums as well. This Government is committed to building a country that works for everyone, which is why the forthcoming Green Paper will identify and address the root causes of child poverty, building on the new statutory indicators of parental worklessness and children's educational attainment, which was set out in the Welfare Reform and Worked out of, Work Act of 2016. 
The hon. Member from Banff and Buckham will be aware that the current policy regarding overseas pensions is a long-standing one of successive governments that has been in place for almost 70 years. Many Commonwealth countries, including Australia, Canada and New Zealand, have pension systems that take account of overseas pensions as part of their means test. This means that a significant proportion of any increases in the UK state pension would go to the respective treasuries of those countries. She is, of course, right to point out uh, the issue of British overseas pensioners in other EU member states, and let me reassure her that their rights are part of the negotiation process, and this Government is committed to getting the best deal for those pensioners. This Government will be spending an extra £2.5 billion in 2017-18 on uprating benefit and pension rates. We will be spending over £2.1 billion more on state pensions and pension credit, nearly £0.3 billion more on disabled people and their carers, and £100 million more on people who are unable to work because of sickness or unemployment. To conclude, Mr Speaker, this Government is continuing its commitment to the triple lock for both basic and new state pension for the length of this Parliament. We are increasing the pension credit standard minimum guarantee by earnings and increasing benefits to meet additional disability needs and carer benefits by prices. I commend this order to the House. Yeah. Order. The question is motion number three, as on the order paper. As many as have that opinion say aye. 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 The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Motion number four on pensions. The Minister to move formally. Thank you. The question is motion number four, as on the order paper. As many as have that opinion say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Motion number five on the estimates. I beg to move. Whip to move. Thank you. The question is as on the order paper. As many as have that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We come now to motion number six on town and country planning. The whip to move formally. To move. Thank you. The question is as on the order paper. As many as have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. 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 Division! Clear the lobby. We now come to motion number one. The question is as on the order paper. As many of that opinion say aye. 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 The contrary, no. No. Tell us for the ayes are Steve Bryan and Graeme Stewart, and for the noes, Thangham Debonair and Vicky Foxcroft. Thanks,
We've gone missing them.
waiting Tom to run down there and give us the signal. <laughs> Order. Order. The eyes to the right, 273. The nose to the left, 107. Of those honourable members representing constituencies in England, the eyes to the right, 260. The nose to the left, 84. The eyes to the right, 273. The nose to the left, 107. Of, the, of those honourable members representing constituencies in England, the eyes to the right, 260. The nose to the left, 84. The eyes have it. The eyes have it. A lock. We now come to the following motions. Motion number seven. Not moved. Not moved. We now come to motion eight. Uh, not moved. We now come to motion nine. I beg to move. The question is as on the order paper, as many of that opinion say aye. 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 The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now come to petitions. Dale Zeitner to move. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I, I rise to present a petition on the future of our state-run nursery schools, a petition of the many parents and supporters of schools like the Fields Children's Centre in Cambridge, schools that do brilliant work that is now threatened by funding changes. And the petition reads, the petition of residents of Cambridge declares that nursery schools have very good outcomes with regard to closing the achievement gap, as well as supporting children with complex educational or medical needs, Further, that the petitioners are concerned by the government's proposals for early years funding that would mean that local authorities would pass on 95% of early years funding from central government directly to early years providers. Further, that should the proposals be accepted, all nursery schools in Cambridgeshire will find themselves in dire financial difficulties. And further, that the proposals would lead to a loss of early years provision as well as job losses for nursery staff. The petitioners therefore request that the House of Commons urges the government to drop their proposal that would require local authorities to pass on 95% of early years funding from central government directly to early year providers. <coughs> Petition the future of nursery schools. We now come to the next petition, Mr. Ranil Jawadina. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Banks are more than a utility; they provide a service to communities up and down the land. And today, banks are changing definitions and moving the goalposts so that they can close more branches, including in my constituency. Now, this has been done by all branches, uh, all banks, at a time that they are seeking to rebuild trust. So, the people of Odium want to make clear to this House. Uh, and they have done so well into their four figures uh, that they want their local bank to remain. And the petition reads, The humble petition of the people of North East Hampshire showeth that Lloyds Bank have proposals to close the Odium High Street branch on the 8th of March 2017, that this High Street branch is particularly highly valued, especially by older residents and small business owners who often pop in to manage their finances and that if accounts are moved to fleet this becomes a four hour return journey by public transport which is clearly not in the best interests of our community wherefore your petitioners pray that your honourable house urges her majesty's government to take all possible steps to urge lloyds bank to reconsider this decision and to make sure that the banking industry considers the social implications of their actions. And your petitioners, as in duty bound, will ever pray, etc. Petition Closure of Bank in Odium. I think we'd better get a new bank for you. There's that many. <laughs> <laughs> I beg to move this House do now adjourn. The question is, this House do now adjourn. Dr Andrew Morrison. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, a hundred years ago today, 
just before five o'clock in the morning, the troop ship Mendy, on its way from Plymouth to Le Havre, in the company of HMS Brisk, was rammed by the freighter SS Darrow in thick fog off the Isle of Wight and sank within just a very few minutes. More than 600 mainly black South African Native Labour Corps volunteers were killed in what remains one of the biggest maritime disasters in our waters in our history. Throughout the Great War, around about 6,000 men on average each day were killed, which possibly explains why the death of 600 in one incident, dreadful though that is, went unremarked in the House at the time. If you do a Hansard search, you'll find no contemporaneous reference to it. I'm very pleased to be able to rectify that this evening. It is said that as the Mendy slipped below the waves, the 65-year-old Reverend Isaac Diobia steadied the men with these words as they conducted the death dance on the sloping deck of the Mendy. Be quiet and calm, my countrymen, for what is taking place is exactly what you came to do. You were going to die, but that is what you came here to do. Brothers, we are drilling the death drill. I, a causa, say you are my brothers, Zulus, Swazis, Pondos, Basutus and all the others. Let us die like warriors. We are the sons of Africa. Raise your war cries, my brothers, for though they made us leave our Asigis back in the kraals, our voices are left within our bodies. Now, that's probably apocryphal, but it became an iconic moment in South Africa, a rallying point for black consciousness in the years that followed. Post-apartheid, the Mendy has become a staple in the South African national story. Monumentalised, used to name warships and used to name this day, South Africa's Armed Forces Day. It is the inspiration for South Africa's principal civil award for courage, the Order of Mendy. Still deeply and uncomfortably controversial in South Africa, we will probably never know the full details of what exactly happened that cold, fo cold foggy night, but the fortitude and dignity of the Labour Corps volunteers is beyond doubt. War is never glorious, but those that serve in it often are, as this episode so clearly demonstrates. John Gribble and Graham Scott, in their excellent account of the sinking published this month by Historic England, describes what happens after the collision. There was, of course, a Board of Trade inquiry conducted over five days in London. But the penalty that was handed down to the Daro's master seems unduly lenient, given that he was going much too fast in thick fog and failed to observe the rules for the prevention of collision at sea. Where stood the worst possible thing that a mariner can do was standing off as men drowned giving rise to a much circulated story that he was simply disinterested in rescuing men of colour, an allegation that it has to be said is unsubstantiated. The wreck was rediscovered in 1945 by the Navy, by the hydrographer, and was explored by the Isle of Wight diver Martin Woodward in 1968. My, of course I will. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend, the member for Westbury, uh, for commemorating the centenary of SS Mendy's sinking. Um, is my honourable friend aware that the SS Mendy was positively identified by one of my constituents, Mr Martin Woodward? Mr Woodward has a museum in Areton where the bridge telegraph from SS Mendy is exhibited, and that's a very great memory. Mm. Indeed, I think um, we have to be very grateful uh, to Mr Woodward, who was a self-taught diver, I believe, diving in an old hard hat uh, rig. In, in those days, off the Isle of Wight, that was quite something in the 1960s. It would have been difficult work. And I've yet to visit his museum in Areton, but I certainly will make it my business to do so when I'm next on the island. In 2009, uh, the Mendy was designate, designated as a war grave by the Ministry of Defence, and in 2012, English Heritage commissioned the very excellent Wessex archaeology, which is based uh, near my constituency, 
to research the wreck, wreck and produce a report. Uh, of course I will. Thank him for giving way and, and, and commend him for bringing this forward. Would the member agree that it is only right and proper that the memory of those who sailed off to fight in a war which could be argued was not theirs by matter of fact, but by principle was theirs for the reasons of, of freedom and democracy? And it is fitting that we play a part in this House by the commemoration tonight of souls lost on that very fateful night. Yes, the honourable gentleman is absolutely correct. These volunteers, and they were all volunteers, could have seen this as somebody else's war across the other side of the world, but they didn't. And for whatever reason, a uh, mixture of reasons and motives, I suspect, uh, came 6,000 miles to serve in the conflict on the Western Front, of course, and others served in other theatres of the Great War. And we have to be extremely grateful to them for their work and, in many cases, for their sacrifice. The uh, Wessex Archaeology Report, produced in 2012, and the Board of Inquiry Report uh, serve as the authoritative primary sources of this tragedy. And it's, I think, uh, good to note that from today, from the 100th anniversary, uh, the Mendy qualifies under the UNESCO 2001 Convention on the Protection of the Underwater cultural heritage. Today's centenary is occasion first and foremost for us to commemorate brave men who lost their lives in Britain's icy waters. It also gives us an opportunity to reflect on the world as well as the war, since the war to end all wars drew many thousands from around the globe to its killing fields. The historiography and remembrance of the Great War has for a hundred years been overwhelmingly that of the white war fought by white men in Europe. But the jigsaw has some missing pieces. The centenary is an opportunity to find them and to fit them. From India, China, the Caribbean, Egypt, and across Africa, as well as from the UK, the labor corps are an essential part of the Great War story. Neglected for too long, they must now be heard. 100,000 men served in the Chinese Labour Corps, uh, 40,000 in the French equivalent under arrangements with the Chinese government. Seen as cheap labour, dismissed as coolies, the UK tri trade unions of the time uh, resisted their employment in the British Isles. In 1917, there was a reluctance to allow black men to raise a hand against whites, even against the enemy on the Western Front. They might, after all, develop a portable taste for it, an alarming prospect for the Union Government of Louis Bouta. The South African Native National Congress, the predecessor of the ANC, sensing an opportunity to advance the prestige of black people and further its political ambitions, offered to raise combatant troops, but was rebuffed by Pretoria. So although non-whites did fight in theatres where the enemy too was likely to be non-white, they served on the Western Front as unarmed labourers. In France and Flanders, they were treated as very much second class and were penned up in compounds like prisoners of war. When they returned home, the government in Pretoria failed to live up to earlier promises, denying them campaign medals, bearing the relief of a monarch in whose name they had been prepared to sacrifice all. One veteran said he felt just like a stone which, after killing a bird, nobody bothers about, nobody cares to see where it falls. However, South African Native Labour Corps members returned to their homeland utterly changed, with perspectives, horizons and ambitions that would not suit their rulers. One white officer told his men, when you people get back to South Africa, don't start thinking you are whites just because this place has spoiled you. You are black and you will stay black. Some will say this is inconvenient history, that we must not judge yesterday by the standards of today and that we have no business raking it all up. But I would argue that the Great War Centenary is the last opportunity to shine a light on the unremembered. The story is incomplete and partial for as long as they remain in the shadows. 
The experience of the Great Wall Centenary so far has been that the candid and respectful exploration of shared history, however uncomfortable, has not driven people apart or reignited hurt and grievance, but brought them together. We saw that so well last year in the island of Ireland in the commemoration surrounding the centenary of the Easter Rising and the Somme Offensive. To my mind, the Mendy tragedy is primarily a heart-rending story of stoicism and bravery in the face of adversity, but inevitably it also prompts difficult questions about attitude to race in the early 20th century, the progress made over 100 years, and where we are today. The story of the SS Mendy, like the Battle of Delville Wood during the Somme Offensive of 1916, has, of course, particular resonance in South Africa. But we must commemorate it too in the United Kingdom, because there is a date. Order, order. I beg to move this House to now adjourn. The question is, this House to now adjourn. Dr. Andrew Morrison. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we must commemorate it too in the United Kingdom, because there is a danger that some communities in modern Britain may get the impression that they have little equity in what we, as a nation, are commemorating during this four-year centenary, uh, that it has nothing to do with them. On Friday, in the presence of the South African High Commissioner, I had the very great privilege of launching an engagement project funded by the Department for Communities and Local Government called Unremembered World War I's Army of Workers. Created by the Big Ideas Community Interest Company, it ensures that communities across the UK will remember the 616 brave men of the South African Native Labour Corps and 30 crew members who lost their lives on the 21st of February 1917. The project will, over the coming months, explore men from across the globe, as well as from the UK, who went to theatres of war not to fight but to dig trenches and latrines, build hospitals and roads, and carry food, water and the wounded. Unremembered will encourage and support communities to explore the role of labour corps during the Great War and after it in the great clean-up operation that set about restoring normality to the battlefield and reburying the dead under the supervision of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. Of course, I give way. And giving way, he's making a very, very powerful point, and I pay tribute to him. Is he aware of the... Uh, the Hollybrook Memorial in Southampton, which is uh, dedicated to those that uh, died on the SS Monday. And perhaps it might be an idea for the Royal British Legion and local schools perhaps to remember this date on future years so that those that did die on that day 100 years ago will never be forgotten. I'm grateful to my honourable friend. Uh, he's absolutely right. And yesterday a commemoration was held in Southampton uh, to mark those who had been lost on the Mendy and every year a service is held, this year of course being particularly special uh, given the fact that it is the 100th anniversary. Mr Deputy Speaker, Unremembered uh, will reach out to Britain's diverse communities. It will bring to mind the world as well as the war and it will remind everyone that the events of 100 years ago are very much to do with them today. The Basutu, Pondo, Swazi, Corsa and Zulu volunteers of 1917, some of them high-born and educated, most of them far more modest men, believed that what they were going to 6,000 miles from home had everything to do with them, despite the political ambivalence at home of many in the already fractious Union of South Africa despite the complex motives of some in relation to the nascent struggle for political and constitutional change, and despite the second-class status labourers were given by those they came here to help. Denied the respect and recognition due to them in their time, we must honour them today. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. And uh, can I begin by congratulating my honourable friend, the member for South West Wiltshire, for securing today's debate on the centenary of the sinking of the SS Mendy. I should also like to commend him for the really substantial role he has played in ensuring the success 
of the government's first World War centenary programme yeah, yeah, yeah. so far. The centenary programme provides an opportunity for us all to come together to honour the sacrifices made a hundred years ago, and I'm delighted to have taken over ministerial responsibilities for the programme. I look forward to the national commemorative events planned to mark the centenary of Passchendaele, the Third Battle of Heap, in Belgium this July, as well as the centenary of the Armistice in 2018. I'm also grateful for the interventions that other honourable members have made during the debate tonight, which have highlighted how important this House takes this subject. Every member will have had many families in their constituency who have lost loved ones in that war. As my honourable friend said, the sinking of the SS Mendy was one of the worst maritime disasters in British waters, but it was also among the darkest moments of South Africa's war. Over 600 men lost their lives, making this second only to the casualties suffered by the 1st South African Brigade at Delville Wood during the Battle of Somme in 1916. The Mendy was carrying men of the South African Native Labour Corps bound for the Western Front. This centenary therefore provides an opportunity to honour those who lost their, their lives that day and to recognise the significant contribution of the various Labour Corps to the wider war effort. Numbering over 20,000 men, the South African Native Labour Corps was one of the most significant of these groups that served. The Labour Corps were drawn from the UK, from around the world, from South Africa, Egypt, India, Canada, China and elsewhere. At the beginning of the war, tasks such as moving stores, repairing roads, building defences were carried out by soldiers withdrawn from the front lines for rest. But by early 1917, the need for labour on the Western Front had become absolutely critical as a result of the unprecedented scale of casualties suffered. I think my honourable friend said around 6,000 a day during the war. This then was the catalyst for the creation of the Labour Corps. Maintaining the vast military infrastructure of camps, transport routes, stores and supply dumps and communications networks was a massive undertaking. Without the efforts of the Labour Corps, the Army and other fighting forces simply could not have functioned. It is right that the events of a hundred years ago should not be forgotten. And I'm pleased that the Minister with Responsibility for Africa, my honourable friend, the member for Bournemouth East, was able to represent Her Majesty's Government at the Commonwealth War Graves Commission Ho Hollybrook Cemetery in Southampton yesterday. In the presence of Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal, these brave men were honoured with the respect and recognition they fully deserve on the 100th anniversary of their deaths. I agree with my honourable friend that it is important we do not forget the discrimination faced by many serving in the Labour Corps. This anniversary is a real opportunity for us to recognise our nation's past and to strengthen our ties with those nations who supported us and fought beside us. The Government is commemorating this centenary as well as the wider role of the Labour Corps in a number of ways. The CWGC cares for the graves and memorials for the 1,300 members of the South African Native Labour Corps who lost their lives in the First World War. We know the majority of those who died aboard Mendy were never found, but nearly 600 are commemorated by the name on the Hollybrook Memorial in Southampton. As is the case with all of the Commission cemeteries and memorials, every one of those named uh, Hollybrook is commemorated in the same way. In life, they had a very different set of experiences, but in death, they are honoured with equal respect. The remains of 19 who died aboard Mendy were recovered and buried in cemeteries and local churchyards. Today, their graves can be found along the coastlines on either side of the English Channel, including at Milton Cemetery in Portsmouth, where a commemorative event took place on Friday, but also in France and the Netherlands. In addition to this, and as my honourable friend mentioned, government is funding a community engagement project called the Unremembered World War I's Army of Workers to recognise the contribution of the tens of thousands of labourers who served in the First World War. 
I would encourage schools and communities up and down the country to join in with this important project which will focus on the role of the other labour corps, including the South African native and the Chinese labour corps, and will provide educational resources to enable schools and communities to learn more about them. It aims, to f it aims to further understanding of the impact of the First World War to achieve positive community impact and to raise awareness of local heritage sites, in particular the Labour Corps' war graves and memorials that can be found in the UK. I would also like to remind organisations that the Heritage Lottery Fund has funding available to explore, conserve and share local First World War heritage. Thousands of young people and communities throughout the UK have already been involved in activities marking the centenary, and I would encourage local communities to apply to this fund. The centenary programme aims to commemorate all those who served in the First World War and were impacted by it, and to provide opportunities for the public to rediscover our shared history. I would therefore like to conclude today by paying tribute to all those who lost their lives in 1917 at the sinking of the SS Mendy and all those who were affected by it. Together, we will ensure that they have not been forgotten. Thank you. The question is this host to now adjourn. As many of the other opinions say, aye. 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 The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order. Order. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.